Hey everybody, this is Daryl Cooper, and you're listening to the Martyr Made Podcast. You're about to hear episode 5 of Fear and Loathing in the New Jerusalem, a six-part series on the early history of Zionism and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If you enjoy this series, please do consider subscribing to my Substack page, where I post supplemental writings and exclusive podcast episodes, including interviews, available to subscribers only for just $5 a month or $50 a year. To all of you who are already contributing, I very much appreciate it. You are what allows me you are what what allows me to continue doing this. Substack can be found at martyrmade.substack.com. I hope you guys like this one. Here we go. I'm content to die for my beliefs. So cut off my head and make me a martyr. The people will always remember it. No. They will forget. Hell does exist. God is a thought. God is an idea. It is a place. It is somewhere. Hell does exist. But its reference is to something that transcends all things. Why we must tear ourselves apart for this small question of religion. One thing you may have picked up on through the first few episodes is that I'm not real big on blame. I mean, I want to blame... It's natural when you see or hear about something unpleasant to imagine that it must have been the result of an independent human agency and to want to see the source of that agency exposed and brought to justice. But I got this problem where every time I want to get myself worked up to blame or hate somebody, the closer I look at their situation, the harder it gets for me to hang on to that hatred. And I'm not some bleeding heart that you're going to find out on a street corner trying to get some child murderer off death row. Believe me, that is not me. But if I start letting my mind wander back through a person's history, that all that hatred, even if I try to hold on to it, it just starts to melt away until all that's left is pity. It's as if, like, I don't know, it's it's like the further back you go, into anyone's story. You push it back through the history of their life, through the worst hidden decisions and the most awful moments of his or her life. And if you keep pushing back through that back wall, what you find at the back of all of it, at the root of everything, is pain. And before that, it's just innocence. The innocence of a of a three-year-old Uday Hussein sitting there playing with his toys, completely clueless, no clue, no clue at all what's waiting for him in this world, except for maybe this vague, nameless anxiety of a small child deprived of basic emotional care. But that's it. Other than that, he's clueless. He has no idea what kind of world he's been born into. He's just a little boy who didn't ask to have Saddam Hussein as a father, didn't ask to be born to the head of a ruling minority that's been holding down a disenfranchised and oppressed majority that hates him the moment he's born. Didn't ask for that. Didn't ask to be made to watch grisly torture sessions and executions regularly from the time he was six years old when most of us are learning how to play dodgeball. He didn't ask for that. And you try to think back and and try to see him before everything took him away, and it gets real cloudy because it's tough. It's hard It's hard for me. It goes against everything natural to even try to do it. But if you push, it, it, when I push at least, I start to get this feeling that maybe we're just, all of us are, are just sort of, you know, we're floating along in our early lives, until that day that we receive that first scar from fear or from loss or humiliation or physical suffering, whatever it is, you get that first scar and then 
your reaction to that scar and, and the contortions you go through to try to protect yourself in the future, that becomes the first outline of what we eventually call your personality. You know, maybe you suffer and maybe you've been given the tools and the resources to use that experience to expand your compassion for other people who are suffering. Maybe. Or maybe you become fearful of new experiences and, and, and you become withdrawn and introverted. Maybe. Or else maybe you seek the comfort of always trying to be surrounded by other people instead. Or maybe the pain just rolls right over you with such overwhelming ferocity when you're a six-year-old Uday Hussein watching a girl from your class being gang-raped in front of her suspected dissident father, maybe then you find that your own six-year-old resources are just completely inadequate to help you deal with what you're seeing. And that the only options available that are, that are psychologically possible to your six-year-old mind are to either just adopt the values of the world that you're being confronted with, or just go insane. And so, and so you react, all of us, we, we react out of pain. And, and, and you react to protect yourself, or maybe to take revenge on the world. And, and everything you do seems to create the conditions for more confrontation and more pain, and then that's it. Now you're caught up in it. You're caught up in it, and that's it. Now it's rolling. You're on that wheel of samsara again, living out the karma, that first scar, that long cause and effect chain we call our lives. And, and never again, unless you maybe reach that state they call rock bottom or unconditional surrender, where you just don't really have any more attachments to the early moments of your history. You've hit that point where there, there's nothing to look back on and now you can start over. Unless you reach that point, never again. Do you feel like you can stop to catch your breath and get your head above water to, to stop reacting and to look back and see clearly all the chain reactions that brought you to this present moment and then to be able to turn back around toward the future and say, okay, okay, now that that's done, let's move forward. We, we just don't get an opportunity to do that most of the time. And, and sometimes I think that who we are, both individuals and societies, in, in a very real sense, that who we are is just that collection of habits and reactions and feelings and ideas that we've cobbled together to try to keep our heads above water since that first trauma. And always, always, as we're trying to get some air, always we're telling ourselves, right, that, that after we do this next thing, or make this next dollar, or, or meet this next person, then, then we'll be able to stop and get ahead of things, and, and we'll be able to get back to what we always intended and, and imagined ourselves to be. To being that person we kept pretending we were, even in the face of decades of contradictory evidence. The person we were, that we believed ourselves to be underneath the compromised moral mediocrity that we'd allowed ourselves to become. And I know I'm talking like everybody does this. It's probably just me, but I'm going to keep saying we because it makes me feel better. Like, no matter, no matter how we behave day in, day out, no matter what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how it looks from the outside, we know that we're doing the best we can, right? Most people feel that way all the time, no matter what. And, and we know that our mistakes are just that. They're mistakes. They're not representative of who we really are. Those are, those are the aberrations. There's who we really are, and we, we make mistakes sometimes. It's as if we picture ourselves as a, as a clean, white, pristine statue. And, and that pure, clean statue, it occasionally gets some dirt caked on it, but, but you can wipe that off. You just take a wet towel, wipe it off, and then there. Now, now you can still see the nice, true statue underneath. But what do we do very often when it's somebody else? Usually we're not quite as understanding. You know, you meet somebody and they seem really nice, but you're watching, looking closely, waiting, waiting. And, and overall, they seem pretty cool. But, but then at some point, of course, inevitably, they do something that hurts us or upsets us. And we seize on that thing like, aha, 
I knew it. I always knew that the real you was hiding underneath all those fake smiles. I knew that eventually you'd slip up and show me your true colors. It's like we're the pristine statue that occasionally gets some mud on it, and everyone else is a cheap, ugly statue that just happens to have a thin veneer of clean white paint over it, covering over that ugliness. Well, everything I just said about individuals, I think, can be said about movements or about societies. The way we look at our own as opposed to others. Our people are basically good, as evidenced by all these great things we've done. And yeah, we occasionally make some mistakes that don't measure up to who we are. But those other people? Those other people are basically corrupt or basically violent or evil. And all those good things that they've done, those apparently good things, those are just attempts to cover up their true nature. The bad things we do, those are mistakes that don't measure up to our values. When they do the bad things, that shows who they really are. I know that's a little dramatic and literal and on the nose, but on, on some level, we do this all the time. I mean, it's election season right now in the United States. It's 2016. Go turn on a TV if you don't believe me. Listen to a Republican talk about a Democrat and vice versa. And you see it all day when you study and discuss the Arab-Israeli conflict. You try to point out, you know, some of the really terrible things that have happened over the years uh, that that have been done by Zionist and Israeli forces. You point that out to a Zionist and they'll start pulling out quotes from prominent Zionists at the time that it happened denouncing the actions, and they'll sort of give you some version of, you know, well, first of all, we were provoked, but I'll admit, things got a little out of hand, but we all recognized that, okay? we That's what's different about us. We recognize that that was wrong. Those events, those those things that were done, that's not what we're all about. They were committed by a tiny minority of people on our side, but with whom I have nothing to do with. And they kind of do that, Pontius Pilate hand-washing gesture, and, and that's it. And, and I don't want to pick on the Zionists. You go over to the other side, and you say to a Palestinian activist, hey, I get that you're angry. People on your side, though, are, are suicide bombing buses full of women and children. What are you guys doing? And I can already tell you what you're going to hear, because I've heard it a thousand times from a thousand people. You're going to hear about how the person you're speaking to does not condone terrorism, But it is hardly surprising if a few, very few, of the people living under such awful conditions would occasionally lash out in the only manner available to them. But now flip it around and try asking your average Zionist to understand how the desperation under which the people in a place like Gaza might lead to violence, or ask the Palestinian activist to understand that today's Israelis did not create this situation. They inherited it. They were born into a world where whichever of our grandparents' fault this whole thing was, the reality is that they were, today's Israelis, found themselves born into a world surrounded by people who hated them. I've tried both of these conversations many, many times, trust me, and if you try it, you're not likely to get that same kind of understanding for the other side. Now, I know I tend to repeat myself a lot in this podcast. That's something I'm working on. But I'm going to do it on purpose again right here. The things that I've probably repeated most of all have been been two. The first is that the most ruthless and extreme elements in any given conflict, but especially ones that are not mediated by institutions on both sides, that that the most ruthless and extreme elements are almost always able to dictate to everyone else the stakes and the terms of the fight. Even if they're just 1% of each side, it's like it's just something in group psychology. This is is why we have things like the Geneva Conventions, right? On, On some level, we know that without hard rules and confidence that the other side is going to follow those rules, Every conflict eventually devolves into a series of atrocities and payback for atrocities and payback for the payback and on and on, with more people on each side becoming radicalized the further it goes. You know, one psycho on this side rapes a woman on that side. Someone from that side rapes five women from this side in return. 
someone kills a child, the other side kills a family, and then the other side goes further than that. There, there, there are only two ways to short out this process, as far as I can tell. You've either got strong institutions, or else you've got strong, unified leadership that can keep control of things on both sides. And both of these conditions are conspicuously absent as we pick up our story in Palestine. And the second thing I keep repeating is to ask you to please imagine what you would do in someone else's situation. Not in theory, but in reality. When you're not expecting to have to make this decision and all of a sudden it's the middle of the night and it's here now and you've got to decide what to do with your three kids and your wife and, and you've got to make a decision right now. Now, I always tell myself that if I find myself unable to understand, even vaguely, how somebody or some group could behave in a given manner, then that just means that I haven't done enough work. Okay? We're talking about human beings here. Not monsters, not aliens. And so if I write off someone else's actions as simply evil or incomprehensible, that's a failure of, of both imagination and empathy on my part. It means I'm not doing my job. And we ended the last episode with the riots that erupted across Palestine in August 1929, when Arab peasants poured into the cities after the cry went out that the Zionists were trying to seize the hill in Jerusalem that, was, that still is sacred to both Muslims and Jews. Now, these riots were a real tipping point in relations between the two groups. Partly it was because it was such a massive and sudden escalation in the level of savagery, but more than just the shock of violence, the events of 1929 were a watershed because of how they fit into each side's understanding of what was happening. We've already given a fair amount of context for how these events might have been experienced by the Zionists, but there are still a few points I want to spend some time on. It's really important to understand even Israeli politics today. The first is to emphasize the extent to which pride became an overwhelmingly important factor. It was always a big part of the Zionist mix, but the 1929 attacks crystallized this sense of offended honor that in, in a way that it would become one of the defining characteristics of Zionism right up to the present day. And so to understand why, I want to take a moment to just go back a little bit. The age of nationalism began in Western Europe before it arrived in Eastern Europe in the Russian Empire. And when the nationalist era arrived, both Jews and the Europeans surrounding them had some difficult problems to solve. You know, when you're living as a minority in a multi-ethnic empire, say, the Austro-Hungarian or Russian Empire, or the Ottoman Empire, you, you don't have the same privileges as the ruling elite, but at the same time, you're just one minority amongst many minorities. There's no real pressure to assimilate into the general life of the empire to the extent that, the, that such a general life exists at all. Similarly, when you're a minority community living in a traditional feudal realm, like the Europe that the Jews moved into in the Middle Ages before the modern era, you're inhabiting a very stratified society where every single group fits somewhere into the hierarchy in some very specific way. Everyone has special, exclusive functions. The aristocracy rules and fights in war, the priests administer the religion, the serfs or peasants do the work, and, and so forth. Living as a minority under a regime like that, this was very familiar to Jewish communities for a long, long time, and it held certain benefits that they got used to, relative benefits. If every group has a specific niche to fill, then the Jews could just be another group with another role specific to what they could offer and what the settled population needed from them. The fact that they were apart, it wasn't as much of a factor because everybody was kind of in their own little situation. For most of the last thousand years of European history, Jewish communities were basically left to run their own affairs. 
they would face violence sometimes and in crisis moments things would happen but on a day-to-day basis they were left to themselves for the most part they existed as separate corporate communities with their own legal codes with the right to administer social events like weddings and births and funerals according to their own customs and to arbitrate their own disputes according to their own rules and traditions and and we take all that kind of stuff for granted today and we would think of anything other than that maybe to be you know, a, a discriminatory or something, but you got to remember, this is happening at a time in Europe when pagans and even heterodox Christians are being exterminated. And so the Jews, you know, being permitted to live according to their own religious traditions, it was a bit exceptional at the time. And so the centuries start to creep on a little bit, and the absolutist state in Western Europe gives birth to the early nation state. And Jewish communities and their newly nationalist neighbors, now they're facing some very difficult questions about where the Jews are going to fit into this new type of society. There's a great Jewish novelist and short story writer named Joseph Roth, and in one of his short stories, uh, he's got this quote where he, he captures how strange this new nationalist world was to, to some of the people at the time. He says, quote, It had been discovered in the course of the 19th century that every individual had to be a member of a particular race or nation if he wanted to be a fully rounded bourgeois individual, end quote. And the author put these words into the mouth of a count, a man who uh, lived in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was a count and and he loved the Austro-Hungarian Empire specifically because it was transnational and included many, many peoples. And he was horrified that the little constituent groups within the empire had suddenly decided to divide themselves up along ethnic and cultural lines. This was a terrible thing to him. He says in another passage, quote, My former home was a large house with many doors and many rooms for many different kinds of people. This house has been divided, broken up, ruined. I have no business with what is there now. I'm used to living in a house, not in cabins, end quote. And he's referring to a ship's cabin where each person has his own little room off by himself. And if people all over Europe are suddenly dividing themselves up into Poles and Lithuanians and Serbs and Germans and so forth, where did that leave the Jews? Who inhabited every country but didn't rule any of them. Who, who weren't a majority in any of them. During the French Revolution, a member of the French General Assembly in 1791, he laid out the answer to that question, and the answer that he, that he gives is the one that most new nationalists would end up adopting with regard to the Jews. Quote, The Jews should be denied everything as a nation, but granted everything as individuals. They must be citizens. It is claimed that they do not want to be citizens, but there cannot be one nation within another nation. It is intolerable that the Jews should become a separate political formation or class in the country. Every one of them must individually become a citizen, end quote. And that's it in a nutshell. That's, that's the response of the nationalists basically summed up right at the beginning of the nationalist era. This French assemblyman's point, it, it's, it makes enough sense. It's a fair enough point on its face. You know, he's saying, look, It was one thing when we had a king who ruled the various disconnected communities of his realm, but there is no king, and there's no realm any longer. We're a nation now, and the Jews are welcome to become a part of our nation, but they cannot and must not exist as a separate nation within our nation. The universalism of the French revolutionaries was especially hostile to the idea of having a separate group within the country which operated according to you know completely different principles uh, it's really not too different from the debates taking place in many western countries today over whether muslim immigrants should be allowed to follow and enforce sharia law in their new countries most people say no way even if it's voluntary and even if everyone in the immigrant community wants to do it and agrees with it we can't have groups running around completely isolated from one another and operating according to different legal codes and and human rights regimes. You can't have that. 
But now, just as most Muslims who immigrate to the West have no desire to live under strict Sharia law, most Jews, at the beginning of the nationalist era, most Jews eagerly took up the French assemblyman on his offer to come out of the ghettos and start to work their way toward integrating into their respective nations. But again, political development throughout Europe happened unevenly, within states and between states. And when the era of full-blooded nationalism was already rolling in Western and Central Europe, Eastern Europe and Russia were lagging far behind. And so as a result, the history of Western and Eastern European Jewry, which had a fair amount of uniformity before this period, now, now their histories begin to diverge. As the Jews in the West began the process of what would come to be called Jewish emancipation, the Ostjud and the Eastern Jews could just, they could only stand by and hear about it from, from afar. By the time we get up to the period of Zionism's emergence, it's driven, early Zionism is driven by Eastern European and Russian Jews who are fleeing a much more traditional Jewish life, one in which Jews had hardly even begun the process of assimilation. We've remarked a couple times already about the difference in attitude and approach between the Eastern and Western Jews once they got to Palestine, and how, for example, it created a certain incomprehension and, and even occasional hostility between a sophisticated modern British Jew like Chaim Weizmann and, and some of the more aggressive Russian Jews living in Palestine. Well, it was these Eastern Jews in Palestine who experienced the horror of 1929 who didn't hear about it or read about it, but who were there. It was these Eastern Jews who experienced it, and so it was their prior experience that informed the Yeshua's response to it. And so again, their life in the East was a much more traditional diaspora Jewish life. They were geographically and occupationally restricted um, to the peasants around them. They were not just different. They were experienced quite literally as a foreign presence. And so, while the Western Jews had begun to feel a little more comfortable in their skin when moving among their Gentile neighbors, the Russian Jews still interacted with their neighbors with the same distrust and hostility that had colored the relationship of each to the other for centuries. You know, when you live in diaspora for 2,500 years, and you actually manage to survive that way, both physically and culturally, that does not happen by accident. The Hebrew Bible, remember, begins with Adam and Eve being exiled from the Garden of Eden and being forced to wander the earth working for their meals. That's the first book, the book of Genesis, right at the beginning. And before the first book is finished, it tells the story of Abraham making his way to the land that would eventually become Israel, only for his descendants to flee to Egypt in order to be saved from a famine. Centuries go by, and the descendants of these Israelite immigrants to Egypt almost completely forget who they were. They, they forget their covenant with God. They forget that they even had a homeland off somewhere to the northeast. And God seems mostly to have forgotten about them. Some time goes by, and at a certain point, and we're in the second book now, the book of Exodus, we're told that God remembered his people and his promises to them. And so he charged Moses and his brother Aaron to go wake his people up and lead them out of the land of Egypt to a land which he would show them. A bunch of frogs, a bunch of blood, some boils, and a whole bunch of dead Egyptian children in a miraculously parted Red Sea later. They escape Egypt, but then it occurs to God that this mass of people he just led to freedom, this is not a nation yet. This is just a big group of people. They have no common identity, no shared customs or laws or traditions. Uh, they're probably going to arrive in the promised land, start intermarrying with the locals, worshiping their gods, living how they live. And what was the point of leading these chosen people out of exile if they're just going to melt into the surrounding populations who actually, have a, who actually have a stronger, more rooted identity? And so God decides they're going to have to hang on for a while. But before they get to their new home... They're made to wander around the Sinai Desert for 40 years, just wandering around. Enough time for the young to be indoctrinated according to their new traditions, 
and enough time for those that are too old to change to die off. And while, while they're out there, they receive the revelation of the law, and, and, and almost all of it has to do with two things. Maintaining internal cohesion in the community by, for example, pro by providing guidelines for how to resolve disputes without having them escalate into blood feuds and so forth. We talked about that in the Shop Talk episode. And, and number two, marking them off as separate from everyone around them. And to this latter end, they were threatened with death and often were killed for worshipping the gods of their neighbors, for marrying outside the tribe, for taking up foreign customs, or, or for failing to follow the idiosyncratic ritual or dietary laws whose, whose primary function was to serve kind of as a secret decoder ring that would tell us in an age before laminated ID cards who is us and who is them. You know, the Hebrew Bible didn't take its final form until the period during and, and just after the Babylonian exile of the 6th century, when the entire leadership class of the remaining Jewish community was shuffled off to live in Babylon, under the theory behind the whole Tower of Babel story. Remember that one? Everybody in the world is coming to live as one community in the shadow of the great Tower to Heaven, and so God pushes the Tower over, and everybody just immediately forgets why they're there and what they're doing. They find that they, they can't communicate with one another, and then they just all go their separate ways. The ancient Near Eastern empires employed a similar strategy when they wanted to destroy their neighbors defeated in war. You didn't always want to kill everybody if you don't have to, because the way the ruling class made its wealth back then was by taxing peasants and other commoners, and if you could keep them alive, that was better. And so sometimes, rather than killing everyone, People would either be dispersed and just sprinkled around all over the empire with the hope that they would simply be absorbed into whatever populations they now lived among, or else they'd be transplanted as whole communities, like the Jews were to Babylon, with the hope that uprooting them would break that sense of historical and, and cultural continuity that, that gave them the motivation and the organization to resist. And so the Bible didn't take its final form until after the experience of the Babylonian exile. And it's actually a very interesting and useful exercise to read the Hebrew Bible as a manual for how to, how to, how to survive in diaspora, how to survive in exile. You know, in, in the Bible, the reason they got into Egypt and were, were allowed to stay and, and, and avoid the famine, for example, was because one of their brothers had been sold into slavery in Egypt sometime before, but he had proven himself so useful to the Pharaoh that he ended up rising to be a prominent administrator, was able to get his people in. When Abraham was traveling with his wife to Egypt, he had to pull a few tricks out of his headscarf to make sure that they were kept safe and treated well. And the laws, again, the laws are mostly about making sure there are plenty of unique markers and social rituals that nobody else would ever think of just randomly picking up on their own, and, and that anyone who was thinking they might want to become a part of your tribe, they would have to be real committed if they were going to be willing to slice off their foreskin or stop picking up sticks on Saturdays and all the rest of the stuff. The first thing, the very first thing any organism needs if it's going to survive and not just melt away into its surrounding environment is a membrane to separate it separate the inside from the outside, and to mediate between those two realms. The body of ritual law that most of us today just find completely incomprehensible and irrational, it was like a socio-cultural membrane. Now, by the 18th, 19th centuries, Jews had been living in diaspora for a long time, 2,500 years for the most part. When the Babylonians were destroyed by the Achaemenid Persians and the Persians offered to let the Jews go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple in their country, the majority of Jews in Babylon said, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. The exile had only been 70 years, but that still meant that the Jews living in Babylon had mostly been born there, and those who hadn't been born there were raised there. And they weren't slaves or prisoners in Babylon, they just weren't allowed to live in their home country of Judea. So when the Persians came to see who wanted to leave the bright lights of big city Babylon and go kick rocks back in Palestine, uh, 
the majority said, no, thank you. We want to stay in Babylon. A couple hardliners went back, started to rebuild, and they had some very interesting history. And when the Romans came along and finally destroyed Jerusalem and exiled the last Jews from Palestine, when they did that, there were about 8 million Jews living in the Roman Empire, and 6 million of them lived outside of Palestine. 6 million out of the 8 million Jews already lived outside of Palestine. In cities like Alexandria in Egypt, at the time of the Roman-Jewish wars, had a larger Jewish population than Jerusalem did. And so, by the time we get up to the early modern era, the Jews have been living in diaspora, in countries where other people always had a monopoly on violence, where they owned no land, and so they didn't grow their own food, or mine their own minerals, or do any of those base level any of the base level work we associate with a complex, settled society. They didn't do any of that themselves. And they managed to survive like that for 2,500 years, keeping their religious traditions, their cultural identity, their sense of collective historical continuity intact. And I'll say it again, that does not just happen by accident. There, there are strategies that groups like this use. And the Jews are not the only group like this. They're called middleman minorities, or sometimes service nomads by anthropologists, and they include groups like the Roma and Sinti, the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia and Indonesia and the Philippines, the Indians in East Africa, the, the Lebanese in West Africa and Latin America, many, many others. And the strategies that they employ to survive and the ways that they're treated and spoken of by their hosts and the way that they relate to and, and speak of their hosts are very similar across the board. For example, diaspora Chinese communities in Indonesia and the Philippines and other countries, they had become a financial and commercial elite class and, and they were spoken of in almost the exact same language most people in the West today associate exclusively with anti-Semitism. They're always crafty, they're sneaky, they're clever, they're greedy, they're obsessed with money. It's all right down the line, very similar. They faced similar resentment and envy and mistrust. And when the post-colonial nationalist era came to Asia, they faced the similar discrimination and hostility and then pogroms and, and massacres dwarfing anything that the Jews experienced in the Russian Empire. And, and it's a very similar dynamic. In the 1970s, you might remember, the Ugandan dictator Idi Amin Dada expelled 70,000 Indians who were living in his country. Back when the British ran Uganda in the 1890s, they had imported thousands of laborers from their co colony in India, and the ones that stayed in Uganda eventually moved into commerce and the service industries and became a prosperous class in that undeveloped Ugandan economy. So Britain leaves and when Uganda, Uganda's economy starts flagging under Idi Amin's just disastrous regime, he blames the greedy, sneaky, shifty Indians and throws them out. Incidentally, back in the 1890s, Palestine was still under the control of the Ottoman Empire, and the British actually offered part of Uganda to the Zionists. And Theodore Herzl, the father of modern political Zionism, he wanted to take them up on it. The Palestine Party obviously won that debate within Zionism, but if they hadn't, we probably would have been talking about thousands of Jews being expelled by Idi Amin in the 70s. So everywhere you find these communities, whether they're Chinese, Indian, Gypsy, Jewish, whatever, they all eventually learn a few things. And one of them is that you keep your head down. You do everything you can to keep the people around you calm, don't give them a reason. It's not enough to not give them a good reason. You can't even give them an excuse to take their day out on you. Because they're already going to distrust you as an outsider, as someone of another religion or culture, or for being part of a group that always seems to be a little more clever, a little more urbane, a little wealthier than the peasants. And so you keep your head down. Don't give offense if someone gives offense to you, you turn the other cheek, you smile, and you let it go. Not as a matter of principle, 
as a matter of survival. If someone spits in your face, you wipe it off and say thank you. If someone spits in your wife's face, you wipe it off and you say thank you. Because nobody is going to care about your honor or think that you're some kind of hero when you retaliate like a big man and then the locals form up a posse and come burn down your entire village. You keep your head down. Now this remained very important in the East, even as it became less important in the West where Jews were beginning to assimilate. By the time Jewish emancipation begins to reach the Russian Empire, young Jews have had it with what they saw as the stagnant traditions and social life and just the life of the culture of exile that they were experiencing in their urban ghettos and, and rural villages. They'd had enough. And so as opportunities began to open up to them, they just embraced it with both hands. They flooded the secular schools and universities. They were throwing off Yiddish, the language of exile, and, and learning Russian. Instead of study groups pouring over pedantic commentary on the Torah, they were applying that same tradition of deep reading and study and discussion to Pushkin and Tolstoy, to scientific ideas and socialist and democratic political theory. A huge generational gap starts to open up between the traditional parents and the enthusiastic young adopters of Russian nationalism. Now, the Jews were still restricted within the Russian Empire as far as where they could live and the activities that they were permitted to engage in, but the restrictions were not a whole lot more onerous than those faced by other minorities in the empire, except insofar as Jewish quotas in universities and occupations were always full because they were so successful at anything they did. They were geographically restricted, but restricted to a massive area, stretching from the Black Sea in the south to the Baltic Sea in the north and encompassing some or all of the modern countries of what of Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, a big, big area called the Jewish Pale of Settlement on the western frontier of the Russian Empire. Now, the Russian national project eventually faced the same problem spoken of by that French assemblyman, only on a scale that that Frenchman could not have possibly imagined. During the 19th century, the Jewish population in the Russian Empire increased from 3 million to 7 million. The empire made the decision that the Jews would eventually be fully emancipated and integrated into the empire with everyone else, but remember, the, in the East, the Jews had not begun to assimilate yet. They, they'd been living by themselves for centuries according to completely different principles, and so the empire decided that they would be emancipated eventually, but they were going to have to remain quarantined until they went through a process of Russification. And again, this was a process, just as in Western Europe, that many young Jews just jumped right onto. They faced resistance from both their traditional parents and from the resentful and superstitious and envious local peasants and townspeople around them, but the trend was obviously moving in one direction. At least that's what they thought. That's what they thought until 1881. In 1881, the Russian Tsar Alexander II was assassinated by a group of revolutionaries, and many people in the Russian Empire blamed the Jews. It was true that many Jews had been becoming involved in revolutionary politics, but in this instance, the Tsar's killers were a group which included only one Jewish assassin. This was not a Jewish plot, this was not a Jewish assassination. But the previous year, another Jewish assassin had made an attempt on the Tsar's life, and I guess people, some people were anti-Semitic and they took advantage of this, for sure. But the fact that people bought into it as easily as they did probably just has a lot to do with, they, they just didn't go too far beyond that connection of the previous assassin. And they just went berserk. You remember I opened up the first episode talking about the hundreds and hundreds of pogroms and attacks that took place all over the Russian Empire. This is the period we were talking about. And this outbreak of violence hit the Jewish community like a ton of bricks, especially, especially the young Jews who had been pouring so much of themselves into becoming a part of the Russian culture. For the entire 19th century, Jews had been energetically doing everything they could to 
to become a part of Russian society. They were, they were learning the language. They were becoming writers and poets in their own right. They were building up the Russian economy. Everything they could do, only to find out, to their shock and horror, that they hadn't even begun to be accepted at all. That the progress they thought they had been making all this time was just an illusion. And this had an incredibly traumatic effect on the Jewish population of the Russian Empire. An effect, honestly, far out of proportion to the actual scale of the violence. I mean, in the worst of the pogroms, we're usually looking at a few dozen killed and wounded. The Kishinev pogrom, which is one of the most infamous, we spoke of that one in the first episode, killed 118 people. That's horrible, but we compare this to what, with hindsight, we know was coming down the tracks of the 20th century, whether we're talking about the 7,000 killed by the Bosnian Serbs in 1995 in Srebrenica, or the 850,000 to a million killed in Rwanda a year before that, or, or the millions and millions killed in revolutionary terror in the decades before that, all the pogroms together would barely register in comparison. And yet, this did have an incredibly traumatic effect. And across the Jewish Pale of Settlement, there arose very quickly a consensus that this could not go on any longer. They, they could no longer continue to live under these conditions. They thought that their situation had been improving. Clearly, it had not. They had to leave. And the only question was where they were going to go. And Jews, especially younger Jews, they came up with three answers to that question. And the first answer was to go to the United States, or as a second choice, Western Europe. And so from 1881 to 1914, two and a half million Jews would leave the Russian Empire. And a full million and a half of those went to the United States. And this... You know, I hate to say it, but thank you for that. I, 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 as an American citizen, I can't thank Europe enough for being so mean to its Jews because it's been hugely beneficial to my country. If you guys have any more Nobel Prize winning physicists you want to send us, just you know, send them our way. That's fine. I, I probably shouldn't make light, but it, several hundred thousand others emigrated to Western Europe or Britain or sometimes to other destinations like Argentina and Brazil and so forth, but, but most of them went to the United States. And the second answer they came up with was to just stay put, but to move out of their isolated communities and into Russia's big cities to join revolutionary parties en masse. At first, revolution meant utopian socialism to most Jews. They, they were idealizing the humble, hardy peasant, this was in the period where they were still trying to become nationalists. But after being attacked by peasants in the pogroms of the early 1880s, Jewish revolutionaries turned on the peasants and then turned on utopian socialism and began to take up the banner of Marxism instead, shifting their allegiance from the peasantry to the urban working classes. Yuri Sleskin He's a Russian Jewish professor of Russian history at UC Berkeley. He's got a great book called The Jewish Century. And in writing about this period, he says that virtually every village and ghetto in the Jewish Pale of Settlement, it was full of the very young and the very old, but that virtually every young adult and adult Jew who had not left for America or someplace else had bolted for the big cities of the Russian Empire, taken over with enthusiasm for this idea of overcoming their separateness and, and their exile by, by joining in with the brotherhood of revolution. And these two, these two migrations, which represented on the one hand a simple desire to get the hell out of here, just escape, and on the other hand an intention to overturn the system under which they'd been oppressed, that encompassed the vast majority of all Jewish emigrants from the Russian Empire. This was the, ma the vast majority of the response to those pogroms of the early 1880s and then right after the turn of the century. But there was another answer. And finally, a few tens of thousands of those Eastern European and Russian Jews chose a different path, inspired by a feeling perhaps experienced by many who had gone to the United States or into Russia's revolutionary parties, but which became the driving force behind the Zionist movement. 
And it's really what sets it apart to me, to be honest with you. And I think it's probably the reason that Zionism came to really become identified with the world's Jewish community in general today. A moment ago, I was talking about the need for these diaspora communities to keep their heads down, right? Degrade yourself. Act dishonorably if you have to, but you will back down. If your whole community gets a reputation for being a bunch of cowards, yep, sure, that's great, we're cowards. Nothing to worry about from us, just a bunch of cowards, nothing to worry about. Because again, what, what's the best case scenario? Somebody insults you or, or, or you know, does something to you and you humiliate him and, and beat him up in front of everybody and prove that you were right and he was wrong. And then the local peasant community gets together and burns down your whole village. No. Okay, no. You back down. Whatever you have to do, you back down. It's not cowardice, it's just the only reasonable strategy. But after a 19th century in which so many young Jews had spent so much energy trying to become what the Russians said they wanted them to become, only to experience what felt to them like betrayal in those pogroms of the early 1880s, many young Jews had just had enough of all that. They were tired of backing down. Someone attempted to capture the feeling, and, and I think it really did a great job of it. There's a poem by a Zionist Jew named Chaim Neam Bialik. He's a Jew from the Russian Empire who had come to be considered by many one of the, one of the fathers of modern Hebrew literature. And, and listen to the anguish and the rage that the young Bialik feels over the fact that so many Jews had allowed themselves to be victimized without so much as lifting a finger in their own defense. He wrote this after the, the pogroms. Quote, Arise and go now to the city of slaughter. Into its courtyard wind thy way. There, with thine own hand touch, and with the eyes of thine head, behold on tree, on stone, on fence, on mural clay, the spattered blood and dried brains of the dead. Note also, do not fail to note, in that dark corner, and behind that cask, crouched husbands, bridegrooms, brothers, peering from the cracks. They saw it all. They did not stir or move. They did not pluck their eyes out. They beat not their brains against the wall. Come now, and I will bring thee to thy, their lairs, the privies, jakes, and pig pens, where the heirs of the Hasmoneans lay with trembling knees, concealed and cowering, the sons of the Maccabees, the seed of saints, the scions of lions, who crammed by scores in all the sanctuaries of their shame, so sanctified my name. It was the flight of mice they fled, the scurrying of roaches was their flight. They died like dogs, and they were dead. End quote. This was a poem of a man who would not move to America. He would not migrate to a Russian city to join a Marxist reading circle, but who would become a Zionist and move to Palestine in 1924. Jews like Bialik, few as they were in those early years, adopted the nationalism of their attackers. The answer was not to flee to another land, to live under a somewhat safer, hopefully safer set of circumstances among a new set of strangers. They've been doing that for too long. The answer wasn't to join revolutionaries in destroying not only the Jewish, but every other national identity in the name of somebody else's class war. It was to become a nation of their own and learn to defend themselves. To Bialik, the fault was not with the pogromists, at least not solely with, the, with them. They, at least, were acting out of strength and, and asserting their own national prerogative in their own land. He felt less anger at the pogromists than he felt disgust and shame over their cowering victims, his parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and the whole line of his Jewish ancestors who had allowed themselves to de degenerate into a people who, the way he saw it, so broken and so cowardly that men would hide while their wives and daughters were being murdered in the next room. 
And again, this is not a fair assessment of what was going on, but you can't think of it in terms of historical accuracy. You have to imagine, again, try, imagine that you're a strong 15-year-old Jewish kid who just ran away along with your father because he told you to, only to find out that your mother and sister hadn't run fast enough and they'd been raped and killed by drunk, slobbering mob of Russian peasants. And to watch over the ensuing years as your father, now a broken man, degenerated into a depressed alcoholic, constantly telling you stories about how really he had no choice, and maybe he didn't, but you know now you're not 15 anymore, now you're 25. And now you're really strong. You're a man. And you spent, you spent the last 10 years fighting and then nursing and then fully embracing your outrage of your father's cowardice and promising to yourself that you will never, ever, ever allow yourself to be the weak and helpless one again. A Jewish American friend of mine uh, told me how his family happened to have arrived in the United States. His great-grandfather had lived in the Pale of Settlement with his family, and after coming of age, he robbed his family's life savings to move to Palestine and join the early pre-World War I militia movement there. After contracting malaria, though, he, he ended up moving to New York. That's a pretty typical story. It was something that had been growing throughout the Jewish Enlightenment period, but after 1881, that generation of young Jews broke away very definitively from their parents' traditions. The Zionists who began arriving in Palestine had had enough of running and hiding, enough of keeping their heads down and avoiding trouble, enough, enough of Judaism and the whole Jewish tradition for that matter. And so from the first, as we described in an earlier episode, the first wave of Jewish immigration before... Theodore Herzl put out his call around the turn of the century, the Zionists arriving in Palestine exhibited a certain we're not going to take it anymore kind of belligerence. And when the post-war nationalist riots in 1920 and 21 landed on their fledgling communities in Jerusalem and Jaffa, the Yeshuv, the Jewish community in Palestine, they didn't have the strength for doing much beyond being outraged about it. Throughout the 1920s, under David Ben-Gurion and the labor movement's policy of quiet, off-the-radar evolutionary Zionism, the Yeshuv adopted something like the old diaspora strategic meekness. Keep your heads down. But this was guaranteed to be unacceptable to many of the Zionists who had come to Palestine specifically to throw off the humiliation of exile. These more militant Zionists were first personified by Zev Jabotinsky and, and his revisionist party, but later the mantle is going to be picked up by many others, and, and it's carried forward almost intact into present-day Israeli politics. The Berkeley professor I mentioned a moment ago, Yuri Sleskin, he wrote about this in his book as well. He said, quote, Spurred by the pogroms of 1903 to 1906, Zionism succeeded in creating a radical youth culture comparable to the Russian one in its cohesion, asceticism, messianism, commitment to violence, and self-sacrificial fervor. Still, it attracted far fewer Jews, and the emigration to Palestine remained tiny compared to the exodus for America, characterized by low levels of income and secular education, and the big cities of the Russian Empire, shaped by government regulations and the high culture hierarchy to favor the wealthier and more educated. Zionism appealed to the young and the radical, but most of the young and radical seemed to prefer the, quote, no distinction between Jew and Gentile in the spirit of true equality and brotherhood offered by the leftist revolutionaries. And then Sleskin quotes a young Chaim Weizmann writing to Theodore Herzl in 1903. In his letter, he says, quote, In Western Europe, it is generally believed that the large majority of Jewish youth in Russia is in the Zionist camp. Unfortunately, the opposite is true. The larger part of the contemporary younger generation is anti-Zionist, not from a desire to assimilate, as in Western Europe, but through revolutionary conviction. It is impossible to calculate the number of victims or describe their character that are annually, indeed daily, sacrificed because of their identification with Jewish social democracy in Russia. Hundreds of thousands of very young boys and girls are held in Russian prisons or are being spiritually and physically destroyed in Siberia. 
More than 5,000 are now under police surveillance, which means the deprivation of their freedom. Almost all those now being victimized in the entire social democratic movement are Jews, and their number grows every day. They're not necessarily young people of proletarian origin. They also come from well-to-do families, and incidentally, not infrequently, from Zionist families. Almost all students belong to the revolutionary camp. Hardly any of them escape its ultimate fate. We cannot enter here into the many factors, political, social, and economic, that continuously nourish the Jewish revolutionary movement. Suffice to say that the movement has already captured masses of young people who can only be described as children. Thus, during my stay in Minsk, they arrested 200 Jewish social democrats, not one of whom was more than 17 years old. It's a fearful spectacle, and one that obviously escapes the West European Zionists to observe the major part of our youth, and no one would describe them as the worst part, offering themselves for sacrifice as though seized by a fever. We refrain from touching on the terrible effect of this mass sacrifice, the effect that it has upon the families and communities concerned, and upon the state of Jewish political affairs in general. Saddest and most lamentable is the fact that although this movement consumes much Jewish energy and heroism and is located within the Jewish fold, the attitude it evidences toward Jewish nationalism is one of antipathy, swelling at times to fanatical hatred. Children are in open revolt against their parents. End quote. And finally, Professor Sleskin concludes, quote, not all of those victimized in the entire social democratic movement were Jews, of course, but it is true that Jewish participation in the Russian mass sacrifice was very substantial in absolute terms and much larger than the Jewish share of the country's population. The Jews did not start the revolutionary movement, did not inaugurate student messianism, and had very little to do with the conceptual formulation of Russian socialism from Herzen to Mikhailovsky. But when they did join the ranks, they did so with tremendous intensity and in ever-growing numbers. No history of Russian radicalism is conceivable without the story of the Jewish children's open revolt against their parents, end quote. I've mentioned a few times in previous episodes, it's crucial to understanding what happens in Palestine that we remember the Jewish community there was not just a random cross-section of European Jewish society. They were mostly young, mostly male, and they had come in large part because they were tired of taking shit from the rest of the world. After the 1929 riots over the fate of the holy places on the Temple Mount or Noble Sanctuary, take your pick, the Jews of Palestine, they faced a dilemma similar to the one they had faced in the Russian Empire in 1881 when the pogroms hit. They had thought throughout the 1920s that they were making progress, and it was now clear that they had not been making nearly as much progress as they had thought. The labor Zionists and liberal Zionists like Chaim Weizmann, as well as the British government itself, had always maintained that the Arabs, lacking any real sense of European nationalism, would eventually realize that the economic benefits brought to the country by Jewish colonization outweighed any half-baked feelings of nascent national feeling they might have entertained, and that they would accept that they were better off under Jewish leadership. Well, this was naivety coming from far-off Zionists like Chaim Weizmann, and probably disingenuousness coming from labor Zionists in the country, because while the Arab notables and the urban merchants certainly filled their pockets with the benefits of Jewish migration into the country, the Arab peasants that is, the vast majority of the Arabs in the country, were devastated by Zionism. But still, nevertheless, this was the prevailing narrative, though, throughout the 1920s. And even if it doesn't make any sense, unless you're confronted with the consequences on a daily basis, it's easy to maintain narratives that don't make any sense. We do it all the time. And now that that narrative had been thrown out the window, they needed to reconsider their position because it had also been thrown out the window by the British, who responded to the riots by placing limits on Jewish immigration into Palestine, such that new immigration would have to be tied not only to the Jewish unemployment rate, but to the overall unemployment rate in the whole country. And of course, we mentioned before, this didn't last very long after several wealthy and influential Zionists from all over Europe uh, 
threatened and bribed and cajoled the British, British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald into changing his mind, but the Zionists now knew, they, they'd been put on notice that the British government was beginning to waver. That means the clock is ticking. And just as in 1881, when their grand hopes were dashed by indigenous violence, the Zionists, again, had some decisions to make about their future. There were, there were a very few who tried to make the case that this had been a predictable outburst of anti-colonial nationalist violence from a local population which was being displaced and marginalized in its own country, and that the Zionists needed to change their approach, but those voices were few and far between. They were quickly silenced. And they were few and far between, again, because that's just not who the Zionists were. That is not why they had come to Palestine. They had come to Palestine out of a sense of outrage at having always been pushed around, at having people attack them and them having to respond by, by, by changing their ways, at always being the weaker party who has to defer to the stronger in order to survive. And, and out of a, they, they'd come out of a conviction that they would never again allow this to be the case. And so the, the Zionists decided to see this as just another pogrom, no different in kind or in motivation from any of the pogroms or persecutions that Jews had faced since the days of Babylonia. And so instead of compromising with the Arabs, the Zionists began to prepare for war. And they wouldn't have to wait very long until it came to their doorstep. And so what about the Arabs? How were the events of August 1929 experienced by the attackers, by the Palestinian Arab population. And I can already tell you, I feel bad because I'm not going to be able to spend as much time on their perspective here because I ran so long on the Jewish portion, but I'll probably cover it more deeply when we do a question and answer episode in the next few weeks. And if anybody has questions about it, we will cover it. Um, but I'm going to spend some time on it now because it's just as important and, and even lesser known or understood. As fond as, as many people are of dividing history into clearly demarcated eras, I, I definitely do that all the time. Uh, in reality, of course, one age always blends into another, and it becomes more difficult the closer you look to determine where one period ends and another begins, but we're still forced to make distinctions sometimes. If we ever hope to keep if we hope to keep every story from just growing into a full history of the world. So I'm going to make an arbitrary decision here and start this history at 1799. In 1799, Napoleon had just conquered Egypt the year before in the name of revolutionary France, and now he was moving up northeast into Palestine, through the Sinai Desert, through El Arish into Gaza, and from there on to Ramleh. And as he's going, he's taking thousands of Ottoman prisoners along the way. Now, many of these prisoners, most of these prisoners, are not patriotic Ottoman Turkish volunteers. They're just peasants who have been, they're Arab peasants from the area who have been pressed into the Ottoman army on, on pain of death. And so, as the French army's making their way north, they get to Jaffa, and the French besiege the city for four days. And when Jaffa falls, Napoleon's troops just loot the city, slaughter tons of its inhabitants just wrecked the place. And two days later, the French lead 3,000 prisoners southward to the outskirts of the city. And once they're clear of city limits, they divide up the prisoners into groups and execute them all. The killing lasted for hours. And again, these prisoners are mostly Arab peasants who have been forced on threat of death into the Ottoman army. And the killing goes on for hours. Certain units ran out of ammunition before they had finished with their quota, and rather than stopping and going to resupply on ammunition, they just stabbed their prisoners to death with bayonets, one by one by one, up and down the line. Groups of prisoners bound at the wrists and ankles, put on their knees or on their bellies, waiting their turn as French troops moved down the line, sprang their brains into the sand, or, or shoving their blades into the guts and organs of these helpless prisoners. And you can't stab a prisoner once and be done with it, not unless you want to listen to him scream for the next half hour as he bleeds out. So you stab and stab and stab until he stops moving. 
which doesn't happen right away. At first, they all have that natural involuntary bodily response that you would expect when a 12-inch serrated blade is shoved into your torso. They squirmed, they pulled away, they writhed in agony and terror, and they screamed. And the French soldiers, trying to end the racket, stabbed and stabbed, punching holes in the chest and stomach and groin, stabbing the face, stabbing the throat as the prisoners jerked and writhed and screamed. 3,000 people. In his book, Napoleon, his army and his generals, um, the French author Jean-Charles Dominique de Lacoutel wrote that the piles of bodies after this massacre were left to rot and eventually they became pyramids of bleached bones standing as monuments to the beginning of the modern cultural interaction between Europe and Palestine's Arabs. The last cultural memory shared by everyone in the region before Napoleon had been the Crusades. That, that, that was the last shared cultural memory of interaction with Christian society. And the return of the Christians to their country had only confirmed the worst fears and stereotypes that had lingered since that period. It can sometimes be difficult, or it's always difficult, to get an idea of how an event like this affected people at the time. You know, it's, it's, it, again, it's important to remember, this is the first real interaction any of these people have ever had with Europeans. And it can be so easy to sanitize events like this because, because of the lack of any real drama. I a mean, hundred people are killed in an urban riot. That leaves behind dozens of just grist for newspaper stories you know these harrowing tales they they chase that woman down the street over there and then they beat her with rods and they stabbed that man with knives as his children screamed i was so scared i didn't know what to do compared to an event like the execution of these prisoners where it's just you know they shot the first man and then they shot the second man and stabbed the third and they shot the fourth and on and on and on three thousand times and no one survived and that was that joseph stalin famously perhaps apocryphally, said that one death is a tragedy and a million is just a statistic. And, and there's a bit of that at play here. A riot that kills a hundred people can seem infinitely more horrifying than the brutal murder of 3,000 that lacks the drama and from which no one survives. For centuries, the Arabs of Palestine had lived in peace with the Christians and the Jews in their midst. Neither of the two minorities, Christians or Jews, enjoyed equality with the Muslim majority, of course. Um, I, I mentioned in the first episode that the Ottoman Empire, as far as places in the world went at the time, was a decent place for a Jew to be. And I, I got some flack for that from people who wanted to point out, well, there was this type of discrimination. There was that. I get all that. I'm not saying there was equality, but you have to speak in relative terms. It was a different world. No place in the world conferred equality on minorities until very, very recently in world history. And many would say that this really hasn't even been accomplished across the board in any country on earth today. On the whole, though, the Ottoman Empire in general, and Palestine in particular, was the easiest place on the planet to be a Jew. So take this quote, for example. This is a quote from, honestly, one of the better studies that I've found on on the Jewish experience in Ottoman Palestine. It's called Letters from the Land of Israel by a, a great writer and scholar named Avraham Yari. He writes that the authors of the letters that he surveyed, thousands of letters over hundreds of years, that the authors of these letters invariably emphasize, quote, that the regime does not discriminate against the Jews and that the Arab inhabitants harbor no special hatred of the Jews as Jews. The writers stress in particular that there was no contempt for the Jew and his faith the kind of contempt that had become etched in their souls during their time living in Christian lands. They declare in astonishment that the Arabs honor Jewish holy sites and the tombs of Jewish saints. Rabbi Yitzhak Latif writes in his letter from the last quarter of the 15th century, quote, The Arabs are at peace with us. They will never strike us and never pillage, end quote. At about the same time, Rabbi Yosef de Montagna declared in his letter from Jerusalem, quote, on the way, we were sometimes in the field among many Ishmaelites, and I never heard a man open his mouth to speak evil, end quote. 
A few years later, in 1488, Rabbi Ovidiah of Bartanur wrote in his first letter from Jerusalem, quote, The Jews feel no sense of repression at all from the Ishmaelites in this place. I have traveled the length and breadth of the country, and no one opens his mouth or jeers, end quote. A student of this same Rabbi Ovidiah of Bartanur describes in a letter the punishments imposed by the authorities, remarking that, quote, As a rule, there is a single law for the Jews and the uncircumcised, the Christians, and the Ishmaelites. But they do not hate Jews and castigate and abuse them as in your country, Italy. End quote. In the mid-18th century, Rabbi Avraham Gershon of Kitav wrote from Hebron, quote, The Gentiles here very much love the Jews. When there is a Brit Milah, circumcision ceremony that I probably butchered, or any other celebration, their most important men come at night and rejoice with the Jews and clap hands and dance with the Jews just like the Jews, end quote. And so this book, uh, it, it goes on to describe the close relations and business interactions between Arabs and Jews, uh, close social relationships, and although tensions began to rise during the first wave of Jewish immigration, of Zionist immigration, it wasn't widespread enough to affect most of the country. And just before the outbreak of the First World War, in 1913, I remember reading about a band that would play together in Jerusalem, and the band consisted of three Muslims, two Jews, and a Christian. And this was not strange to anybody. But let's go back to the 19th century. After Napoleon's forces reintroduced Europe to Palestine's Arabs. You know, although relations would not really go off the cliff until the post-war Zionists drove it off the cliff, things did slowly begin to change after the French atrocities, not least because some groups of Christians and Jews saw an opportunity in the French conquest and collaborated with them. It hadn't occurred to the Arabs before this that the Jews and Christians in their midst might have identified more with these Europeans than they did with their neighbors, and most of them didn't, but the collaboration of a few was enough to make the Muslim majority suddenly more aware of the difference between themselves and their Christian and Jewish neighbors. Suddenly it became necessary to remember that, hey, Christians have been trying to conquer the Holy Land for a thousand years. And the Jews still spoke of returning to their homeland in Palestine. When the Ottoman Empire was strong, they could afford to imagine that both of those groups would be happy just living in Palestine. But as the Ottoman Empire was eclipsed by Christian Europe in power, the Arabs realized that they had to actually worry about being conquered. Suddenly, the Christian and Jewish minorities around them began to look a lot more dangerous. And this is happening over the course of the 19th century. The Ottoman Empire begins instituting changes which are roiling traditional village life in Palestine. There, there, there were over a thousand villages in Palestine in the mid-19th century, and most of them operated along very similar traditional lines. A typical village would consist of four or five clans. Each of those clans would be led by an elder, and the village itself was led by one of these elders, empowered by consensus as the village sheikh. Villages were autarkic. That means they were economically self-sustaining and independent. They produced the food and materials that they needed to survive, but then they would produce cotton and lemons and olives and other products that they could export or trade for goods the village couldn't produce on its own. Probably the most well-known export are the famous Jaffa oranges. You might have eaten those. They're the big, they're real big giant oranges with real thick skin. So they were perfect for exporting to places like Europe. So you had a developing market in, in Palestine in the 19th century. It was starting to become integrated with the rest of the world. So, okay, so now in, in Palestine in the first half of the 19th century up until 1858, the vast majority of the land is owned by the Ottoman government. But custom allowed the peasants to keep the produce and pass down the right to use the land to their children as long as they continued to pay their taxes and didn't displease the authorities and all that. Practical land rights, though, like that was the official Ottoman policy, but practical land rights were managed collectively at the village level. Typically, each family would receive allocations of land to grow crops, 
and this land would be reallocated and passed around to different families every two years or so, so that each family could take advantage of the different opportunities that each plot of land offered. Meanwhile, grazing lands, woodlands, water sources, and, and those kind of things, they, those were all held collectively by the village, and no one family could claim exclusivity over those commons. Well, the whole world was changing in the 19th century, and the Ottoman Empire was no exception. Driven by what economic historians call the integration and peripheralization process, the Ottoman Empire and its constituent peoples could no longer insulate themselves from what was happening everywhere else in the world. This process of integration and peripheralization began in the 16th century, and it was accelerating by the time we get to the beginning of the 19th century, and it could be basically roughly summed up as follows. The world economy is becoming increasingly integrated into a single economic system, with Europe providing high-margin, high-value finished products and manufactured goods and capital for investment, and other regions provide raw materials and cheap labor and agricultural products for Europe. Sounds pretty awesome if you're Europe, right? The Ottoman Empire was thus brought into the world economy as a provider of raw materials for Europe and as a market for European finished goods. This is basically the center-periphery colonial arrangement against which the American revolutionaries, for example, would rebel toward the end of the 18th century. And so this was one aspect of the changes that are taking place that are affecting life in Palestine in the 19th century. These self-sustaining village economies suddenly found themselves involved in a world economy. Another, another aspect was a series of internal reforms that were being pushed by the Ottoman authorities. The encroachment of Europe and a brief rebellion in Egypt made the Ottomans decide that they needed to reassert control over their territory. This involved many policy changes, many projects, um, for example, forcibly settling Bedouin nomads as peasant villagers and building the famous Hejaz Railway. The Hejaz Railway is the line that ran from Istanbul to the Muslim holy cities of Mecca and Medina. And they built it. It was a huge prestige project. Muslims from all over the world donated to the project. It was a big, important thing for the Ottoman Empire. And so to protect that rail line from sabotage or from people scavenging for materials, the Ottoman army greatly increased the number of garrisons and its presence throughout Palestine, through which most of the railroad ran. The Ottoman Empire had traditionally been a pretty loose governor. Pay your taxes, just remember who the boss is, but other than that, you know, we don't care. Run your own affairs. Just keep sending your tribute and you know, don't rebel. But now the Palestinian Arabs were going to have to get used to a much more present and activist Ottoman government. And so the forced settlement of Arab nomads ensured that virtually all of Palestine has been cultivated by the middle of the 19th century. But the recent nomads, they settled in stages. They didn't just go from being pastoralist nomads and raiders and hunters to completely sedentary peasants just like that. In the middle of the century, for example, the land on the coastal plain of Palestine between Jaffa in the south and Haifa up north was being cultivated by peasants who were living a sort of hybrid lifestyle. They, they would spend most of the year living in tent villages in the hills or up on the plateau overlooking the plain and their crops, and they would come down a few times a year to plant and tend their crops and reap their harvests. And so when European and Jewish visitors in the 19th century got off their ships in Haifa and looked around that coastal plain, they saw thinly inhabited temporary villages kind of just set up for the times, those rare times that the farmers came out of the hills to work. And so they concluded that there was nobody around but a few poor natives living in these jerry-rigged villages. So move up to 1858. In 1858, the Ottoman Empire passed a Land Reform Act privatizing most of the land in Palestine. Now this probably needed to happen. Um, it was a definitely a modernizing, progressive thing that probably needed to happen for the empire. It may have even been well-intentioned enough, but 
it created a huge amount of turmoil and social upheaval in the country. You remember, village land was held collectively, and only the right to use it was reallocated by the village itself from time to time. But the Ottoman land law conferred full, exclusive ownership on whomever happened to be holding it and claim possession of it at the time that the Land Reform Act was passed. And so this led, of course, this led to many unscrupulous people accumulating huge tracts of land and to many other simple peasants who wouldn't have remotely known how to navigate the bureaucracy in any case to lose out. The Ottoman Empire... See, the, the Ottoman Empire used land ownership registration to find and conscript peasants into the army so that it knew where to go when it wanted to tax people and stuff like that. So as bad of a time as it has historically been to be a front rank conscripted cannon fodder soldier, it was worse in the Ottoman Empire because they didn't even have a remote idea yet of, of a citizen soldier. That was as far away as it could be. You know, you're, you're real cannon fodder. And so sometimes wealthy urban speculators in Haifa and Beirut and the other uh, cities in the area, they would go out and spread rumors of looming mass conscriptions and wars that would frighten the peasants into selling their land cheaply just to get off the books. And this is not unique to Palestine. The United States in the 19th century, oil and mining interests would infamously send agents ahead of them to spread rumors in communities of federal seizure of the land or of impending Native American attacks so that a Hearst or a Rockefeller could come along behind and find people who, hey, they're willing to sell for whatever they can get. And so, just as in the United States at that time, in the 19th century, this is something that was happening in a lot of places, uh, this process led to an accumulation of huge tracts of land by urban wealthy notables who had never and would never set foot on it. In Beirut, the Sorsuk family, uh, for example, owned 70 square miles of land in the Jezreel Valley. 70 square miles. And they had never been there. They were living in Lebanon's capital. Their land was in Palestine. And it was nothing to them other than a profit venture. All they cared about was the income being provided by the peasants living there. And if it turned out that they could turn a larger profit by selling to the Zionists, even if they knew the Zionists would evict all those peasants, they didn't hesitate. They, they had no connection to the country or to the peasants. And, and when the time came, they did sell, piece by piece, most of it to the Jewish National Fund. Now, it's important to understand that the standards of living and the rights that were being enjoyed by the enjoyed is definitely the wrong way to put it, but uh, the standards of living and the rights of the typical Palestinian peasant in the 19th century were at least as difficult as those faced by the Jews of the Russian Empire during the same period. I mention this because I frequently encounter a common misunderstanding that the oppressed Jews of Europe made their way to Palestine out of desperation this part is mostly true, and that the Arabs, afraid of losing their privileged place in the land, reacted violently and tried to block the poor Jews from coming. That second part is completely untrue. The, the, the wealthy urban Arab notables, they actually didn't mind Jewish immigration for the most part. They made money off of it. And even into the 1930s, they only slowly began to react to it because they were facing a revolt from their own poor workers and displaced peasants. The vast majority of Palestinian Arabs had lives that were just as difficult and oppressive as anything the Jews faced in the Russian Empire. And these were the people, not the rich urban families. These were the people on whom Zionism landed the hardest. As the European colonial powers began their conquest of the Middle East and North Africa, pressure was turned up all over the Arab world. You remember how the West reintroduced itself with Napoleon? Well, now they're taking over countries and they're chipping away at the periphery of the empire and slowly closing in on the core. Every new acquisition by Britain or France is experienced as another step in that process that began with Napoleon's conquest of Egypt and Palestine. Eventually, the Europeans controlled just about everything except the Ottoman core. 
And it was clear that they were gunning for that too. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, all effectively under European control. When the Zionists began to show up in the late 19th century then, they were not resisted as Jews, they were resisted as Europeans. They were universally thought to be agents of European colonial powers. And in fact, that's how they sold themselves to Britain in the first place. Help us out, help us get established down there, and now you'll have a, a friendly Jewish commonwealth that'll you know, be kind of a, a part of this global British system right there by the Suez Canal. It will help you out. So during the First World War, when that comes along, Britain comes to the Arabs, encourages Sharif Hussein and the, and the Hashemites to rise up against the Ottoman Empire, promising them that they'll have sovereign nation-states in the aftermath, but of course it turned out that Britain and France had other plans. After nipping at the edges of the empire for years, the Europeans finally finished the job and laid waste to the entirety of the 500-year-old Ottoman Empire. The League of Nations comes and institutes a mandate system, and when word of the mandate system reaches the Arabs in the Levant, they convene the Syrian General Congress to make their collective will known to the colonial powers. We spoke about all this. But very quickly again, because I, I, it's important to understand how this culminates in, in their response to the 1929 riots. The Syrian General Congress told the League of Nations, okay, first, look, we are ready and prepared for independent nationhood right now. We don't want a mandatory power controlling our fate. We're ready to just do this ourselves. You say that the mandate is to help shepherd us and prepare us for self-government. We're ready for it now. But they were realists. They said, look, if we're going to be forced to accept a mandatory power, and since the League of Nations itself has said that the desires of the local population will determine who the mandatory power should be, we want the United States to be our mandatory power if we're going to have one. We want the U.S. to be the mandatory power over greater Syria, which, remember, consists of most of modern-day Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, and Jordan. But if we can't have the United States, then fine, let the power over us be Britain. All we ask, and you say that you desire, uh, that you value our desires, all we ask is that France, under no circumstances, be empowered as a mandatory authority over Syria. More, more than a century later, and the Arabs had not forgotten the massacre at Jaffa by Napoleon. And finally they said, the Zionists, the Zionists are coming in here claiming that they want to take away our national rights altogether, insisting that our land is actually their land, and saying openly that they will make their wish a fact. The Jews who have always lived here as our neighbors, they belong here and they will be full and equal members of our new nation. But these Zionists, who openly threaten our national future, must no longer be allowed to immigrate into our country. And so, because the mandatory powers did, in fact, value the desires of the local population so much, what do you think they did? And of course, you know the answer to that. They gave Syria to France, and Britain maintained control of Palestine specifically in order to ensure that Zionist immigration would continue. And when the Arabs decided that they didn't like that arrangement and simply withdrew from the process and declared their independent kingdom on their own, the French army came in, smashed them, exiled their leaders, and imposed a military government over the whole of Syria and Lebanon. And you remember in an earlier episode we mentioned the French general in Syria, and the British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, recalling the Crusades explicitly and rejoicing triumphantly that they had finally returned to the Holy Land and taken it back for, for the Christians. And those people who were watching from afar and wondering at the outbursts of Arab violence, they probably wondered, just like many people today still wonder, why the Arabs, why do they seem so paranoid? They always think everybody's out to get them. But if, if the average European didn't see the colonization and conquest of the Middle East as a new crusade that began with Napoleon's conquest, I think it's pretty easy to see why it was experienced that way by the Arabs. You know, the British, for their part, 
continued to whisper sweet nothings into the ears of the Arabs, even as they appointed committed Zionists to rule over Palestine's mandatory government. And the Arab notables, who had been Palestine's nominal leadership class for quite a while now, but whose relationship with the peasants was always a little less than harmonious, seemed happy to let it all happen. And by the end of the 1920s, thousands and thousands of formerly independent Arab farmers are living in filthy shanty towns on the outskirts of cities like Haifa, walking through beautiful neighborhoods that are now inhabited by Jews and Britons and wealthy Arabs, and they're walking down to the docks or into the factories to beg for a job from their new masters. The rage, the rage of impotence and betrayal had been building underneath the surface, and when right-wing Zionists in 1929 began marching on the Temple Mount, declaring the area to be the rightful property of the Jews and carrying their Zionist flag and mounting it up over the wall, that was all the spark that the powder keg needed to blow up. The peasants had been slowly and then quickly dispossessed and deprived of their rights and brutalized for over a century, and not just by the Zionists, intermittently by the Ottoman powers and the European colonialists. From the Arab perspective, quite reasonably, I would say, every interaction that they had had with the Europeans, from the Balfour Declaration of 1917 to the brutal repression of national uprisings in Iraq and Egypt and Syria, to everything that's still ahead in our story, all of it just confirmed their belief that the Europeans were advancing their conquest of Muslim lands, whatever they said, and that the Zionists were just a weapon in that conquest. The urban, wealthy notables had failed, if they had tried at all, to protect the poor Arabs from any of this. They seemed, what's worse, they seemed complicit in their dispossession a lot of the time. With the exception of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the urban families were becoming objects of scorn among Palestine's poor. Instead, the poor workers and peasants had begun to turn to the only people who seemed unafraid to speak out about what was happening to them, the religious leaders. On the morning that the violence of August 1929 struck Jaffa, a young imam named Ismail Tubasi, he gave a fiery speech to a crowd in front of Jaffa's primary mosque. And there was a British military officer there. Uh, he, was, he, he wrote about it, and he wrote that the older sheikhs tried to cut him off, but Tubasi wouldn't listen. The older sheikhs were among these notables, who increasingly seemed to be either impotent at best or collaborators at worst, to the common people, and the imams were finally beginning to take them on directly. And so that British officer who was present wrote, quote, At about 1,000 hours, Sheikh al-Muzaffar addressed the people. He asked them to refrain from demonstrating and told them to be quiet. Ismail Tubasi rose and said, In the name of God, in the name of Muhammad and religion, we do not want protests. We are 10 years protesting, but without results. This protest will receive the same fate as the others. We must demonstrate. Attack our enemies by ourselves. Lose our lives for the country. He was very excited and made the assembly very excited. End quote. Now, Ismail Tubasi was just 22 years old when he said this in 1929. He just finished his studies at the Islamic College in Jerusalem. And there's something like a dark mirror of that children's revolt against their parents, that rift that had emerged earlier between the younger and older Russian Jews after 1881, with the former, the younger, becoming so disillusioned with the impotence of, of the older generation that they finally took matters into their own hands. As one of the only traditional Arab notables that was still hanging on to a decent amount of influence, the Grand Mufti became more and more important to the British. He was one of the last threads still connecting the British mandatory government to the Arab people on the street. And he was the only one who could credibly exercise any kind of moderating control over them. But this put him, this put him in a really difficult position because that credibility that he was holding on to rested entirely on the people's impression that he was standing up to the British and standing up to the Zionists. And in August of 1929, 
the people had begun to awaken to the fact that they could act without the leadership of the big families, or even in defiance of them. And it was the religious leaders who were beginning to finally wake them up to that. And so when the Zionists begin arriving in Palestine, they're walking into a world where the peasantry had, had been already been thrown into the gears of history by European conquerors and, and by their own Ottoman government for, well, and their own wealthy supposed leadership for, for about a century. The resistance of the Palestinians at first, before the First World War, it was, you couldn't really call it a national struggle. It wasn't nationalist resistance at the time. That, that, that idea hadn't formed yet. They were still part of an Ottoman Empire that they considered legitimate. It was more what the historian Eric Hobsbawm calls primitive rebellion. It was just a, it was a reaction. It was a disunified response to the fact that they were being bullied and dispossessed. It, was, it, it took the f familiar form that you, you see in any other anti-colonial peasant rebellion. The tactics were the same, the purpose was the same, the organization level very similar. Now, over time, the struggle tried to find a footing that would allow the resistance to unite as a national movement. First, as greater Syrian or pan-Arab nationalism, and when those were off the table, a secular-ish Palestinian nationalism led by Muslim Christian associations in the cities and by the wealthy urban elites. But after 10 years of watching the British and the Zionists undermine those associations and of watching the wealthy notables sleepwalk through their dispossession while filling their own pockets in the meantime, that fell off too. But the problem still existed. They were still being dispossessed, still watching their traditional way of life being taken apart in their country, being taken over. And the leaders who stepped up to do something into that vacuum were populist religious leaders who were calling not just for a nationalist struggle, but for a jihad that would allow Muslims to unite to defend their land from the infidels seeking their subjugation. These are the circumstances, then, that would allow one man to emerge and give Islamic resistance to Zionism and colonialism a face. That man's name was Muhammad Izzadin al-Qassam. Izzadin al-Qassam was the man of whom a Palestinian poet a little bit later would write, quote, Who would imitate Qassam as Islam's ideal soldier? Follows, if he wishes, released from the inherited humiliation the best master, for he forsook words and the weakling's idle chatter. Our leaders have stuffed our ears to bursting with talk. We believe true what they wrote, but it was only a delusion. End quote. Is Adin al Qassam was born in Latakia on the northern coast of Syria, right around the time that the pogroms were occurring after Tsar Alexander II's murder in the early 1880s. We don't know the exact year, 1880, 1881, somewhere in there. Two generations of men in his family before him had been leaders of an order of Sufi Muslims called the Qadari Sufis. And most people today hear the word Sufi and they think of whirling dervishes drunk on the divine experience or the mystic love poetry of Rumi. That's not what this was. Sufism had gone, had un undergone changes in the late Ottoman Empire. By the 19th century, many Sufi orders had gotten out of the business of mysticism and they were responding to both their followers who were looking for something that spoke more directly to their daily needs and to the Ottoman government who sent them out and put them to work spreading a standardized Islamic orthodoxy, part of the nationalizing project that the Ottoman Empire was undergoing. Professor James Gelvin from UCLA, by far one of my favorite sources for every stage of this conflict up to the modern day, he wrote, quote, the most prominent Qadari leader in 19th century Syria was Abd al-Qadir al-Jazayiri. Abd al-Qadir had led the resistance against the French occupation of Algeria before he was exiled to Damascus. While in Damascus, he preached the lessons that he had learned during that resistance. Muslims not only had to use Islamic law to guide them in their daily lives, 
but had to apply the principles of reason to make that law compatible with modern conditions. Furthermore, Muslims had to assimilate Western scientific and technological practices. The ideas Abd al-Qadir preached were commonplace in the Middle East during Izz ad-Din al-Qassam's youth. Al-Qassam's association with like-minded members of other Sufi orders in Syria and modernist scholars at the Islamic University of Al-Azhar in Cairo reinforced these ideas. As soon as he returned to Syria from studying in Cairo, Al-Qassam began applying the lessons he had learned, end quote. He very quickly gained a reputation as a man of thoughtful piety and fierce independence. Once he was back in Syria, he soon became a popular and respected imam of a mosque in his hometown, as well as a teacher at a local Sufi school. And now Al-Qassam looked around at the Arab world under the late decadent Ottoman Empire, which was on its last legs, and he did not like what he saw. It disturbed him. He had just returned from Cairo, which was once the largest city in the world west of China, and to him it was a reminder of Islam's glorious history, but also a reminder of how that mighty city and the rest of Egypt had been brought completely under the control of foreigners from some tiny little island north of Europe. When the Committee for Union and Progress, the so-called Young Turks, staged their 1907 revolution in the Ottoman Empire, Qassam must have looked upon that with some ambivalence. I'm not aware of any record of his thoughts at the time, but the Young Turks, they were a modernizing force in Ottoman politics, and his Qadari Sufi order would have supported most of that. But they were also pushing toward Turkish nationalism, specifically Turkish nationalism, and kind of abandoning their role as the leader of the whole Muslim world. And already they had abandoned their responsibility to protect some North African Muslims from European domination. And when Italy moved against Libya in 1911, the Ottoman Empire appeared ready to declare it too much trouble to protect as well. Some people started to wonder if they would let it go that easy if they were Turks and not Arabs. Muslims who had depended on the Ottoman sultan and caliph for protection, they were, they were being exploited, being killed by European colonial powers. And the Turks seemed prepared to watch it happen. Again. Resentment and worry over the fact that the Turks were not any longer interested in protecting their Arab subjects was a big factor in the Hashemites' decision to take the British up on their offer to rebel during the First World War. But if the Turks were prepared to watch Libya fall under the Italian yoke, Izz ad-Din al-Qassam was not. He began gathering up men and making preparations to set sail for Libya himself to go fight the Italian invasion, to join up with whoever was fighting it. He took up collections and donations for supplies and weapons, and he got together his volunteers, and he was at the port, ready to depart when the Turkish government ordered them to stay put and intercepted them all before they could embark. So Libya is taken over, along with the rest of North Africa by the Europeans, and Qassam, frustrated, he went back to work as a teacher. And so 1914, the World War comes along, and Qassam, he's frustrated with the Ottoman Empire, but he's still an Ottoman subject, and he, he still believes in it, to the extent that it's a reality and it exists, and it's the primary vehicle Islam has at that moment to, to defend itself. And so he joined the Ottoman army and serves as a chaplain. He wasn't originally slated to serve in combat, but he demanded to serve in combat, and so he received training on weapons handling and basic tactics and survival, basic stuff. I'm not sure if he ever actually made it into combat. He also made valuable contacts with other trained military veterans. And when the war ended and the Turks were gone and their ostensible enemy, Faisal ibn Hussein al-Hashimi, the Hashemites, who had staged the Arab revolt, he was the only leader who was available at the time that could unite the Arab kingdom of Syria. And so Qassam threw in with him and his supporters. And when the French decided to throw Faisal out, Qassam 
thought that his time had finally come. This is what he'd been waiting for. He was ready to fight. This time he wasn't traveling to some other country in the name of defending an abstract concept. This jihad would be in his home country to defend an Arab ruler from European invaders. Pretty clean. But we already covered how this went. Faisal backed down, surrendered to the French without a fight, and Qassam was disappointed by the passivity and compliance of the elite leadership again. After Faisal surrendered, Qassam was not prepared to give up, so he was one of those who took up to the hills to carry on the fight against the French. These militias were made up of former soldiers from the Ottoman army, from uh, peasant and working class volunteers, and there were some well-equipped fighters from wealthier families who kind of expected their status to guarantee that they would be leaders, that they, they would receive some deference from everybody else in the hills, from all the poorer fighters and militia members. The landowners and the urban notables were necessary to help fund and supply the resistance. And the French, they've been doing this a long time at this point, they knew it was much easier to target these self-interested rich supporters of the resistance instead of chasing a bunch of jihadis who had nothing to lose but their lives. And the French didn't have to do much. They, they didn't pull out toenails or publicly hang any of these wealthier supporters. They just threatened to disrupt their businesses, seize their lands and their assets. Basically, they took aim at their pocketbooks. And the notables, the landowners and the notables, they just showed no heart at all. No heart at all. Not only did they immediately fold and stop funding the rebels, leaving them in the hills without supplies or ammunition as French planes flew by and strafed them. They also called back their own sons and relatives who took all their fancy gear back home with them, and then they even collaborated to help the French target the remaining fighters. This was a formative experience in Kassam's life. It was probably the formative experience in his life. And he made a decision right then and there that he was never going to trust the wealthy to come through again. Not for their country, not for their religion, not for anything. Men who had too many worldly interests were shackled by them. Only the common people had proven reliable when push came to shove in that, in that rebellion. And it would only be the common people from now on with whom Qassam would hold any truck. After the resistance against the French in Syria fizzled out, Qassam was marked for death by the French, and so he fled into British Palestine, taking up residence in the port city of Haifa, and quickly rose to prominence there as a pious and eloquent teacher. 1924-25, I believe, he got a job as an official for the Grand Mufti Supreme Muslim Council, going around administering Islamic marriages in the villages, and this was a big deal for him, because this... It not only provided him an income, it gave him an opportunity, a rare opportunity, in British Mandate Palestine. As a marriage official, he was one of the few people who had license to travel freely anywhere in the country. Because he never really abandoned his primary mission, which was freeing Islamic lands, especially Arab lands, and specifically greater Syria, from European domination. And his gigs as a teacher and a traveling marriage official afforded him the opportunity to make the connections and, and, and to build the beginnings of a resistance network. Now, Izzad Din al-Qassam was not only, uh, he wasn't just a fighter, and he didn't see the problem in Palestine in purely military terms. Living in Haifa, he was at the epicenter of the chaos resulting from British rule and from Zionism. Haifa was Palestine's main port city, and so... When Zionist immigrants arrived, they arrived in Haifa. Many of them stayed there, at least for a while, and Haifa's population doubled during the 1920s. Real estate prices went up beyond what any of the Arabs, for the most part, could afford, and so it became a British and Jewish city, for the most part. And all of the changes that were happening in the rest of Palestine happened first and happened most in Haifa. Haifa was the first city of Palestine as far as the British were concerned because it was the Mediterranean outlet of the oil pipeline they had built from Mosul and Iraq. This, along with the influx of Zionist immigrants and the capital they brought with them, made Haifa the first destination 
of the displaced Arab peasants who were now looking for work. And the degradation of the Arab poor was more evident there than anywhere else. Arabs who had lost their farms, lost their land, lost their sense of agency, who suffered each day the indignity of begging for jobs from the people who had evicted them, and who were doing backbreaking manual labor in exchange for a pittance, especially compared to the Jewish laborers doing the same work, each of whose wages were marked up 30% flat from the Arab wages whenever they worked for the British. It was a, this was a policy. The British paid Arabs one wage. They paid all Jewish workers 30% more flat. And these people, these Arabs, these young Arabs especially, were not doing well, especially the young men. You know, if you were 20 in 1930, then you were 10 in 1920. And so most of your life had consisted of watching your parents stress out over Zionist encroachment, then watching them lose the land you had grown up on to the Zionists. At some point in your early or mid-teenage years, you had moved with your whole family to live in a cramped apartment if you were lucky, and if you weren't, you slept under a tarp in one of the dirty shanty towns outside one of the cities. You watched your father ask Jews or Britons for work. Maybe you saw your mother cleaning their houses just so they could get a few lentils in your belly to feed you. The moment you became old enough, you had to go out and look for work as well. No other choice. Well, this, this generation of young Arab men, as you can imagine, they were not doing well. Many, many of them began to drink a lot. Alcoholism was becoming a major problem. They were spending their time gambling and looking for fights with young Zionists. Uh, the most dangerous animal in the world is a young person with no future. And for the moment, in Palestine, that dangerous animal was being caged in by liquor and gambling and other vices. Kassam was watching all this, and he believed that this loss of morale, not even so much morality in the sense that God will bless us if we do what we're told, but morale, that this is what had caused his people to lose and lose and lose to these Europeans. The people had lost their purpose. And, and a major reason for that was that they had terrible leadership. The elites were forever squabbling amongst themselves, using the people as pawns in their wars with one another. And, and Kassam thought they would eagerly sell the people into slavery if the British or the Jews offered them a few coins. Everything he experienced in those Syrian hills, Palestine was full of that same betrayal every single day, but there were no other leaders stepping forward who could give the poor Arabs and remaining peasants a voice. Well, Muhammad Izzadin al-Qassam was not a man to wait around for someone else to act. He began going into the slums, out into the shanty towns, preaching, doing what he could do to help the poor, but more than anything, he began calling on the young men, calling on young Arab men to remember who they were and stand up for themselves, get their act together. It's tough to convey how rare this kind of leadership was at the time among the Arabs in Palestine, or how necessary it was. But, you know, just think of the fact that the Arab people were amazed because of the simplicity of his lifestyle and because he could often be found in the slums chatting and laughing with the poor or out in a shanty town sharing a meal in his imam's robes with destitute workers. They were amazed at this because it, it was unheard of for any of the notable elites to even visit those places. They would never be seen there. And, and well, these places were Kassam's home. Those were his people. And he wanted nothing to do with the traditional leadership or, or what they had to offer. Kassam began to build a following of young Muslim men, men who were roused by his message, partly because they wanted to resist the British and the Zionists, sure, but also, and, and I would say mainly, because it was an opportunity to do something meaningful. To be something other than a poor Arab kicking around the slums with no future. Instead of being a pawn in someone else's game, Kassam was calling on them to participate directly in their own future and in the future of their country. 
His followers would stop drinking, stop gambling, and all the rest. When he'd hear of one of his people ending up in a brothel or drinking den, he'd go in and get them out and bring them home. He would even go seek out brothels and hashish dens as opportunities to preach, calling on the young men in those places to look at what they were doing and get it together, join his movement. Soon he began to lead groups out of the cities to intercept shipments of liquor and hashish, and he would throw it away in the, in, into the water, break the barrels and bottles, and just leave everything spilled in the sand. Kassam was not involved in the 1929 violence, but when it became clear after those riots that things had changed, that the country had entered a new phase of conflict, Kassam began to focus full-time on his resistance work. He began organizing his followers. And, and we're talking about a small number of people here, 800 maybe a thousand men. He began organizing them into semi-independent cells to begin attacking the British and sometimes the Zionists and sabotaging their activities. He began secretly training Arabs with his limited military experience and some other volunteers taught others to make simple explosives, basic tactics. The groups were not centrally commanded by Qassam and so the level of violence varied from group to group. Some groups would go after symbolic targets by burning down Zionist trees or tearing up British railroad tracks. Others engaged in murder. As the pace of the violence picked up, Qassam tried to convince the Grand Mufti, the Hajj Amin al-Husseini, to join him. He suggested that they issue, this is the time, issue a joint call for a general uprising against the British occupation, but the Hajj Amin didn't want to do it. He refused. His... His relationship to the British had always been complicated, and it will remain complicated. And we'll talk a lot more about that in the next episode, the last episode. And at critical points in this story, the Grand Mufti did what he could to quell Arab violence, even though it was his rhetoric that often inflamed it. But he, he would usually, at the critical moment, try to slow things down. He, 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 want, he was one of those one of those leaders who needed people to be angry because then they would look to him for leadership, but he didn't want them to start breaking things and killing people and burning things down. The Haja means antipathy had migrated for the most part toward the Jews and away from the British. And this wasn't just self-interest because the British were his patrons, it was also due to a change that had been taking place in the way the Arabs perceived the Zionists since the end of the First World War. They had always seen the Zionists, I mentioned a little while ago, they had always seen the Zionists as a Trojan horse for European imperialism, but after a dozen years of listening to bitter British military officers complain that there was nothing that they could do, that, you know, I agree with you guys, but hey, I can't do anything. The Jews are too powerful, and they control the actions of our government back home. The Arabs began to buy into that. They began to learn the language of European anti-Semitism. You know, and there's, there's, there's anti-Jewish bigotry, right? You just don't like some group of people. But anti-Semitism has a specific connotation for most people, right? When most people hear it, they don't just think of people who don't like Jews. They associate it with a particular kind of dislike, the conspiracy theories about the Jews running the world and controlling the banks and governments and bending the planet to their diabolical will. Well, that was something that had never existed in the Arab world. They didn't have any experience with Jews other than the traditional Middle Eastern Jews that they were used to and got along with for the most part. It wasn't until the Europeans showed up with Mark Sykes, if you remember from the first episode, telling... Emir Faisal, that the Jews controlled all the world's financial centers and governments and so forth, and, and so many important leaders, Winston Churchill, so many others were writing and talking about all this, that the Arabs began to pick it up. And if it seemed improbable to them at first, their experiences seemed to confirm it. How else were they supposed to explain the fact that so many of the military police and mandate authorities working for the British government, that they came into contact with, and who seemed to support their cause, uh, that they were saying that they had to take their orders from a British government that was always seeming to come down on the side of the Zionists. Now, there are good cultural and historical reasons why this was the case, of course. It's not a big conspiracy. But you can imagine a Palestinian Arab in the 1920s and 1930s 
just accepting Mark Sykes' word on the matter. The Haj Amin definitely accepted it. And by the 1930s, he's usually a good bet to be found openly quoting from the protocols of the learned elders of Zion during official government proceedings. So it wasn't a good look. But this wasn't universal yet in Palestine. So while the Grand Mufti was directing his ire toward the Jews, Qassam was still aiming at the British. And the Zionists only secondarily as agents of the British. And the Haj Amin wanted nothing to do with that. And finally, in 1933, after a few of his followers burned down a Zionist house and killed a father and son, the British took notice and Qassam was forced into hiding. They still didn't really know who he was, but they were moving now against the violence and, and against the insurgents. But even though he was underground, Qassam never stopped working. Finally, finally, the scattered energies of the anxious Arab masses were beginning to move to something like a common rhythm. They were beginning to find a vocabulary, a vocabulary rooted in both Islam and Palestinian nationalism, a fusion of the two, that might finally allow them to express and organize their resistance and make a stand for their country. But this is happening just as the Zionists were discussing plans to make a stand of their own in the wake of the 1929 violence. And one prominent leader of the labor Zionists, a protege of David Ben-Gurion, Chaim Arlasarov, wrote a long letter to Chaim Weizmann in 1932 sharing his thoughts on the Zionist situation in Palestine. And he writes with an urgency that you're going to hear in a minute. And he wrote this just six months before events in Germany would sweep every other consideration except escape off the table. The Zionists all along, they had hoped to establish themselves so powerfully before the Arabs caught on that they not only could not be dislodged before the Arabs awoke to it, but also to secure a strong enough beachhead that they would be able to guarantee unlimited Jewish immigration into Palestine on their own without the British, whether the Arabs liked it or not. But the riots in 1929 had come too soon. And now, without unconditional British support, the Zionists could not stand up to the Arabs if the Arabs decided to get together and make them leave. And so it's in this environment that Arlasarov wrote to Weizmann, quote, It is evident that if we do not wish to establish diaspora conditions in Palestine once again, we must strive toward the quickest possible settlement of hundreds of thousands of Jews in order to assure at least a rare equilibrium between the two peoples in the country. I am forced to the conclusion that with the present day methods and under the present regime, there exists virtually no opportunity for solving the problem of large scale immigration and colonization. This is so because our policy is based on the assumption that it is necessary and possible to attain our aims gradually, step by step. The present stage, which we have attained by means of gradual development, may be defined approximately as follows. The Arabs are no longer strong enough to destroy our position, but still consider themselves strong enough to establish an Arab state in Palestine without taking into consideration Jewish political demands. Whereas the Jews are strong enough to preserve their present position without poss possessing sufficient strength to assure the constant growth of the Jewish community through immigration, colonization, and the maintenance of peace and order in the country in the course of its development. The next stage will be attained when the relationship of real forces will be such as to preclude any possibility of the establishment of an Arab state in Palestine, i.e., when the Jews will acquire such additional strength that as will automatically block the road for Arab domination. This will be followed by another stage, during which the Arabs will be unable to frustrate the constant growth of the Jewish community through immigration and constructive economic activity. The constantly growing strength of the Jews will influence the Arabs in the direction of seeking a negotiated accord. End quote. And so you can see here, when the two Zionist leaders are speaking frankly and privately, that they've left off any language indicating a desire or hope for a peaceful resolution. Everything is about strength. And Arlasarov is speaking purely in terms of having the power to impose what they wish on the Arabs. Now this was the line of Jabotinsky's revisionists all through the 1920s when they would 
say plainly that questions of right and questions of morality had no place in struggles over identity and statecraft. The strong would do what they wished, the weak would suffer what they must. The social Darwinian militancy of the revisionists after 1929 had finally burst through the membrane and even the left-wing anti-colonialist labor Zionists were using their language. Arlosarov goes on to describe to Weizmann what he sees as the regional situation and, and, and also his anxiety over the fact that the Arabs were beginning to learn how to organize themselves. He says, quote, In addition, we are witnessing a shift in borders in the Middle East which has not yet come to an end. Should Syria and Iraq come under one ruler, the United States could exert upon us a greater pressure than if the states in the north were to remain apart. The question whether the emir of Transjordan will succeed in extending his rule southward and annex parts of Arabia is also more serious than it was six months ago. We must not forget that the Arab movement in Palestine has meanwhile learned all the political practices of Zionism, from congresses and presidents down to banks and campaigns. It has succeeded to some extent in attracting the attention of the Arab and Muslim world to Jerusalem and Palestine. Any policy which aims at isolating the Arabs of Palestine will now encounter greater obstacles than it would have encountered 10 or even 5 years ago. End quote. And we spoke in an earlier episode of the efforts by the British and the Zionists to ensure that the Palestinian Arabs remain divided amongst themselves and isolated from any other Arab states. The Grand Mufti Hajamin had stirred up fears about the Al-Aqsa Mosque partly in an attempt to get the attention of those other states, those other Muslim countries from which Arlasarov would prefer to keep Palestine isolated. He continues, quote, Moreover, it is scarcely necessary for me to remind you that the non-Jewish population of Palestine is increasing at a rapid rate. A decade ago, a Jewish majority or numerical equality in Palestine was a matter of 500,000 additional persons. Today it's a question of 800,000. In another 15 years it'll be a question of a million and a quarter. But since the area of Palestine, even within its widest borders, is fixed, the pressure on the means of subsistence in the country will rapidly increase. I do not mean to say it is impossible to overcome this pressure. It is definitely possible to overcome it. But to do so, great means and a government loyal to its tasks are required. End quote. See, Arlosarov is telling Weizmann, who is not in Palestine, remember, that we are running out of time. Jews have lived in diaspora for thousands of years, moving from place to place. When that's your life, it doesn't really make sense to have 12 kids per family, because a dozen kids are hard to herd together if you have to flee a pogrom or you're run out of town by the local peasants. And so as a result... To this day, Jews tend to opt for a low-output, high-investment reproductive strategy, right? Don't have a lot of kids, put a huge amount of energy into the ones that you do have. The Arabs, on the other hand, had been a tribal people until like yesterday. And even the settled townspeople and peasant villagers still structured their daily lives according to a lot of tribal customs and traditions. And in such a society... Strength in numbers is the operative principle, and so the Palestinian Arabs tended to have lots of children. And throughout the 1920s, the Zionists had failed to convince many Jews to migrate into Palestine, and although their numbers had grown, the number of Arabs had grown even more quickly. And at a certain point, however you slice it, the country would start to run up on its carrying capacity, which would make the question of Jewish immigration or rights to the land moot without considering drastic actions to rectify the situation. And drastic action is exactly what Arlasarov had in mind. First, he reminds Weizmann of another danger limiting their timetable by invoking the prophets with a prophecy of his own. He wrote, quote, This array of circumstances may reach a climax if an international struggle in which Britain is a participant should break out. And can there be any doubt that we are nearing another world war? Five or ten years may pass before it breaks out, and we cannot foretell exactly the form it will assume, but whether it will be in the form of a concentration of forces against Soviet Russia, partly in order to halt the spread of Bolshevism, or the lines will be drawn some other way. Bismarck once said, History does not permit us to look at its cards, but it is clear beyond all doubt whither we are going. End quote. 
He wrote this letter in June 1932. It's not a bad prophecy. And finally, he tells Weizmann, he lays out what he's got on his mind. Quote, I see before me four possible conclusions. One possible way out is to declare that it is an ignorant prejudice to assume that every problem must have a solution, that all calculations must balance in the end. Actually, it is not so. We have no choice but to continue wandering along devious paths without knowing exactly where we will come out. We must carry on, even though we stand before a seemingly unscalable wall. We must gather strength as best we can. We do not know what the future will bring. Perhaps the poets will die, perhaps the dog will die, as the famous Jewish anecdote has it. New opportunities may be in store for us. Meantime, we must hold our positions. That's one option, and it's a characteristically Jewish attitude. It is the typically Jewish manifestation of courage, but it is definitely not a Zionist attitude. Should the Zionist movement adopt such an attitude, it would renounce political action, which implies a calculated policy and a constructive plan, and descend to the level of Jewish fatalism, the consequence of passivity during many generations. In this sense, I have always looked upon Zionism as a rebellion against Jewish tradition. End quote. Now those are the words of a true Zionist. Fifty years after the pogroms following the Tsar's assassination, still carrying the words of the poem in his heart. Remember, quote, Note also, do not fail to note, in that dark corner and behind that cask, crouched husbands, bridegrooms, brothers peering from the cracks, they saw it all. They did not stir or move. They did not pluck their eyes out. They beat not their brains against the wall. This poem was ringing in Chaim Arlasarov's mind as he wrote these words. And so we know what Arlasarov thought of the first of his four conclusions. He writes that the second possible conclusion is to declare simply that given current conditions, the Zionist vision simply cannot be put into practice. It's just not viable. We thought it was one way, it turned out to be another way. Game over. And you can imagine what he thought of that option. The third theoretical possibility, he wrote, is to cling to fundamental Zionist principles, but to contract the geographic limits of their realization. Instead of all of Palestine, only certain parts of the country. And he cites the plan of another prominent labor Zionist as creating a Jewish state in Palestine rather than making Palestine into a Jewish state. He admits that there's some sound thinking in this idea since Jewish life would be able to develop freely in the smaller zone and that nothing would preclude possible future expansion, but he finds four problems that would make settling for a smaller piece unproductive. First, the small area of Palestine in general. Second, the problem of what to do with Jerusalem, because nobody was going to agree on that. Third, the unfavorable geographic situation of the separated and disparate Jewish colonies. And fourth, that even in the areas where Jews are concentrated, there's still a minority in those areas. And so he dismisses the idea of settling for a smaller territory as being just as unworkable as going for the whole country. And if both your careful and your ambitious plans seem unworkable. You might as well go for the moon, right? And so Arlosserov outlines the fourth option as he sees it. I don't think anyone has ever given a list of four options and didn't order them such that the one they preferred was prevented last after the others had all been dismissed. And Arlosserov holds on to this pattern. This is, this is the one that he wants to push. The fourth possible conclusion he wrote to Weizmann in London. Quote, is that under present conditions, Zionism cannot be realized without a transition period in which the Jewish minority would exercise organized revolutionary rule. It is impossible to attain a Jewish majority or numerical equality between the two peoples by means of systematic immigration and colonization without a transition period of minority national rule in which the state apparatus, the administration, and the military establishment would be in the hands of the Zionists in order to eliminate the danger of domination by the non-Jewish majority and to suppress rebellion against us. It would be impossible to suppress such a rebellion unless the state machinery and the military forces were in our hands. During this period, a systematic policy of immigration, 
colonization, and development would be practiced. Such a conception of the problem might shake the foundations of many beliefs which we have cherished for a great many years. It might even resemble dangerously certain political states of mind which we have always rejected. End quote. And when he speaks here of a revolutionary government under minority rule in 1932, in, in, in the middle of Stalin's commission of one of the century's greatest crimes in Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and throughout the Soviet Union, it's impossible that he does not have in mind the Leninist idea of the revolutionary vanguard, taking control of things until the rest of the country catches up. If the world's not ready for our project, goes to thinking, and of course they wouldn't be, we face the choice of either of abandoning the project and accepting defeat, or of making the decision to drag the world kicking and screaming to our vision of it. And he knew that history, that all of history was really a series of successful fates accompli, right? 17 years after it had happened, when he was writing this, who but the Armenians remembered the Armenian genocide? Certainly the Turks hadn't suffered for it. Time loses its meaning as events fall further back into the past. One year ago and ten years ago feel a lot different to us. But do 500 years and a thousand years feel much different to anyone except maybe historians? Eventually it all just smushes together into this thing we call the past. And whatever happened in the past, if it's not excused, at least eventually falls under the category of events which, in the name of maybe intellectual humility, we kind of let pass without judgment because we admit our limited understanding of it. You know, what the Mongols did to Baghdad was terrible, but yeah, I wasn't there. Yeah, who knows? It was a tough place back then. That kind of thing. You know, if I say that America enslaved sub-Saharan Africans, that hits you one way. If I say Pharaoh enslaved sub-Saharan Africans, it hits you another way. One carries a lot more emotion. The world always forgets. The world always forgets. And all you have to do is have the courage to make difficult decisions and see them through to their conclusion. You might be hated for it at the time, but the world forgets. You know, this was the logic that starved the Ukrainian countryside and filled up Stalin's death camps, and it was the logic that informed the man who would take power in Germany six months after Chaim Alasarov wrote his letter to Chaim Weizmann. His letter closes with the words to demonstrate his conviction. He finally says, quote, At first, it might even appear as impractical, visionary, and contrary to the conditions in which we all live under the British mandate. All these questions require discussion which I do not intend to inaugurate here in writing, but there is one thing about which I feel very strongly. I will never become reconciled to the failure of Zionism before an attempt is made whose seriousness corresponds to the seriousness of the struggle for the revival of our national life and for the sanctity of the mission entrusted to us by the Jewish people. Nor should you forget that any change in the world or in the Middle East any emergency situation might compel us to resort to a line of action which we would never choose of our own free will. We must bear this in mind when weighing our political policy, whether we like it or not. End quote. Now, the Zionist movement, which began in earnest as a cry for dignity and for security and national rebirth, had seen its idealism crash into the wall of practical considerations. As we saw in previous episodes, this wasn't exactly new. Any movement with room to operate is going to have elements made up of young men who just like to fight. You're going to have to deal with that. And Zionism had its share of zealots who were calling for military solution before the first Zionists had even unpacked their suitcases in Palestine. But I'll say again, that phrase that seems to be the motto of this episode, or at least one of the two mottos of this episode... The most extreme elements in a conflict zone usually have the power to force everyone else to operate on their level. It started as a reasonable reaction to a demonstrable need that the Eastern European and Russian Jews were experiencing. After the militant Zionist hero Joseph Trumpledor was killed at the Battle of Tel Hai, and after the Nebi Musa riots that followed, 
Many Zionists became convinced of the need for Jewish self-defense in Palestine, and this led to the formation of the Haganah, which we've talked about, the Zionist militia. And this became the main Zionist defense force, nominally affiliated with the socialists that were led by David Ben-Gurion and his circle. But when British futility, or complicity, depending on who you ask, left the Jews defenseless again in Jaffa, and especially after the massacres in 1929, more and more Jews came to agree with Jabotinsky that conflict with the Arabs was inevitable, even natural. You know, there's, a, there's a dark game theoretical logic to social life that was captured brilliantly in this blog called Slate Star Codex by a guy named Scott Alexander. If for some miraculous reason, Scott, this podcast makes it to your ears, I love it and keep it up. And in a post that went around last year in 2015 called Meditations on Moloch. It's really long, but it really deserves to be read in full. And it, Alexander describes how in any system of, and I'm just going to use his language here, in any system of sufficient competitiveness, in any sufficiently competitive system, any positive principle or general good that can be discarded in order to make one party more competitive will eventually be discarded. And this is not because all men are cutthroat or venal creatures, but because those who refuse to discard their principles in order to optimize their competitiveness will be outcompeted by those who do. Eventually, after everyone has either discarded the social good or refused to do so and disappeared, equilibrium is reestablished so that everyone's basically in the same relative position they were before, only the society as a whole is worse off because everybody has discarded one more voluntary principle which served the general good. You know, we can get away with holding on to our principles as suboptimal luxuries in environments where competition is less than fierce, but that does not describe Palestine at the time that Arlosarov is writing that letter. You know, the competition in Palestine had become the definition of zero sum in the, in the eyes of both parties, and much to the frustration of the British. But at least up to this point, zero sum to the Zionists had meant that only one side or the other would win the privilege to exercise their national rights. With the stakes less than total, some Zionists managed to hold on to their illusions, especially Zionists outside of Palestine like Chaim Weizmann. But in January 1933, the stakes the Zionists were fighting for would go parabolic. In that month, Adolf Hitler had been elected Chancellor of Germany. Hitler was one of those veterans of the First World War, of whom it was said that, you know, although they walked around and continued to live their lives after 1918, in truth, whatever they had been died back in those trenches. Hitler never left those trenches. And you can see a few old pictures of Adolf Hitler sporting a normal mustache in the early days of the war. The shortened mustache tucked under his nose, that was a modification made in order to allow a soldier's gas mask to seal against his skin during an attack. And this is one of those little nuggets that gets lost over the years and decades, but when Adolf Hitler gave his fiery speeches to throngs of screaming Germans, every one of them knew what that little mustache meant. Hitler's choice to wear it was not just a nod to the fact that he had been a veteran in the Great War. Nearly every German of his age group had been a veteran. Hitler was putting the entire nation on notice that the war had never ended. Germany had been forced to beat a tactical retreat in order to deal with the traitors and saboteurs at home, but she had never been defeated in battle. I'm giving you Hitler's perspective here. With the help of Germany's enemies, the traitors had taken control of the country, taken control of the government during the 1920s after the revolutions, but German patriots had never forgotten their treachery, and had finally risen up to correct the injustices of the past. This was Adolf Hitler's religion, it was his philosophy, it was his life. During the war, the German army had been a force of nature, but they were finally overcome in the end, partially by a lack of material and an eventual collapse of morale, first on the home front and then out in the trenches. Many veterans, not just Hitler, many, many veterans of the war 
blame socialists and communists for instigating strikes and undermining support for the war. And they weren't wrong about that part. Leftist groups were working against the war effort, and strikes at munitions factories and and the spread of leftist ideology among the soldiers did undermine the ability of the German army to sustain its momentum in that final push in 1918. It's, I mean, it's highly questionable, at best, whether Germany ever could have won the war once the United States threw its full weight behind the Allies, behind the Entente. But it's not hard to imagine how an individual soldier might have felt betrayed or stabbed in the back, as General Erich Ludendorff and many other German veterans took to saying. After four years of abject horror, in the spring of 1918, the Germans had launched a massive assault on the dug-in, impenetrable Allied defenses of the Western Front. And against all odds, they break through and force the Allies back, taking hundreds of thousands of casualties in the process, but they eventually grind down for a lack of ammunition and material. There are reports of soldiers literally starving to death. When they get to the Allied trenches after they push through, they find more food and better supplies than they've seen in two years. And so imagine eventually being halted, in large part because you're delirious with hunger and undersupplied, and then finding out that many of the workers back home who were supposed to be making the stuff that you were missing had been on strike. Imagine hearing, after you've been bleeding out in the trenches for years, that people back home were complaining about the conditions that they were having to endure, and they were calling for a revolution. And imagine hearing that part of the reason your advance had been halted was that up and down the line, many soldier, soldiers were refusing to do their duty, or at least to do it to their fullest. You know, we know today that it's much more complicated than, than that. We've got access to millions of pages of contemporary records and diaries and supply invoices, and we can sort of spread it out on a table and look at it from a historian's perspective. But if you were a German soldier who had given everything to your country for years, and you're there on the Western Front in 1918 in an attack that is stalled out, you're not a historian. You're not poring over the records. You're there in the mud hearing what people are saying. And it's not hard to see how you could feel betrayed. And Adolf Hitler was one of those soldiers. When Hitler took a shrapnel wound at the Battle of the Somme in 1916, he was sent back home to recover, and then he was assigned to light duty for a while. And he had an experience that a lot of soldiers in France and Britain talked about having as well. You know, he had spent years under such extreme conditions, watching people he loved be torn apart fighting off insanity during artillery barrages. But when he was on light duty recovering from his injuries, he looked around Berlin and he saw people complaining about their lives, about how the war was affecting them. And he just could not handle it. He, he was so appalled by the apathy that he immediately requested to just return to the front. I don't know how often any soldier in the First World War demanded that their leave be cut short or their light duty be cut short so they could go back to the front, but that's what he did. And then in October 1918, Hitler was wounded again, temporarily blinded by a British chlorine gas attack, and as he lay in his hospital bed a few weeks later, an elderly pastor came to him in his bed. He's still blinded, and the pastor's speaking to him, and he tells him that there'd been a revolution in Germany, that the German Empire he'd been fighting for didn't exist any longer. The Hohenzollern dynasty was over, and the government of the fatherland had been taken over by socialists and communists. In his book Mein Kampf, Hitler would later write, quote, There followed terrible days and even worse nights. I knew that all was lost. In these nights, hatred grew in me. Hatred for those responsible for this deed. End quote. And those Hitler held most responsible for this deed were the Jews. He shared the view of many people in Europe and the United States that leftist revolutionary politics was dominated by Jews. And just a month before Hitler was discharged from the German army in March 1920, Winston Churchill had published that editorial, some of which I quoted earlier, called Zionism versus Bolshevism. He said that international Jews, this is Winston Churchill speaking, <clears throat> 
I know I've probably read this part in an earlier episode, but it's worth reading again. He said that the international Jews were engaged in, quote, a worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization. There is no need to exaggerate the part played in the creation of Bolshevism and in the actual bringing about of the Russian Revolution by these international and, for the most part, atheistical Jews. It is certainly a very great one. It probably outweighs all others. With the notable exception of Lenin, the majority of the leading figures are Jews. Moreover, the principal inspiration and driving power comes from Jewish leaders. In the Soviet institutions, the predominance of Jews is even more astonishing, and the prominent, if not indeed principal, part in the system of terrorism applied by the Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution has been taken by Jews, and in some notable cases by Jewesses. The same evil prominence was obtained by Jews in the brief period of terror during which Bela Kuhn ruled Hungary. The same phenomenon has been present in Germany, especially in Bavaria, so far as this madness has been allowed to prey upon the temporary prostration of the G German people. Although in all these countries there are many non-Jews every whit as bad as the worst of the Jewish revolutionaries, the part played by the latter in proportion to their numbers in the population is astonishing." End quote. Now Hitler could have written those words. But Jews had had to fight off conspiracy theories for hundreds of years. During plague years, they were often accused, I'm talking the Black Plague of the 14th century and so forth, they were, they were accused of poisoning water supplies and causing the plague. And then paranoid Christians would spread rumors about secret Jewish societies engaging in grotesque rituals and child sacrifice. Jews had been persecuted for centuries as well poisoners and drinkers of Christian blood. But deep in the mind of Adolf Hitler, a mind which was, you know, let's be honest, probably damaged from the start and then profoundly traumatized from years in combat on the Western Front, something new and terrible was being born. His nationalist resent resentment and his, his sense of betrayal was combining with conspiracy theories like the one that Churchill was writing about and ideas that well, ideas that, as crazy as it sounds today, for their time can only be described as modern. The bourgeois population of Europe like to think of themselves as high-minded, rational people who embraced reason and human progress and rejected superstition. But if the Jews thought that meant that things were going to get any easier for them, they were terribly mistaken. Even hard-headed atheists and practical politicians found a way to hold on to their old anti-Semitism. The real horror of 20th century anti-Semitism was that it was not a throwback to some fading age. One last resurgence of superstitious, reactionary nonsense among peasants still going on about how the Jews killed Christ. That's not what it was. When the Jews were persecuted in the 20th century... It was not in spite of the Enlightenment, not in spite of reason, in spite of science and the ideas of modern government. In the 20th century, anti-Semitism was driven by all of those things. You know, the Nazis are often framed today as reactionary conservatives trying to recover some supposed lost age, but in the 1930s, the, the Nazis were considered by themselves and by most other people to be on the cutting edge of modernity. Progressive people at the time believed that science and technology had granted man vast powers over nature, and that power demanded that man be a responsible steward of nature. Eugenics is a dirty word today, thanks in part to the Nazis, but again, in the 1930s, there were people all over the world, mainstream, serious, progressive people, who believed that bringing human intention to bear on human evolution was the next obvious step in applied biology. I mean, we're all eugenicists to a degree, unless you pair up with the first available mating partner who agrees to hook up with you, unless you don't use any criteria at all to select among possible mates, you're a eugenicist. The rest is just a matter of where you draw the line. And the place that the Nazis drew the line was, you know, problematic. The Nazis and the scientists and thinkers that they followed believe that if we now have the knowledge that would allow us to rid humanity of physical and mental handicaps, inherited diseases, and other degenerate traits, that's one of their favorite words, degenerate, progress demands that we do that. 
Okay. Um, all right, Nazis, I'm with you so far. We all like vaccines, right? Well, as you may have heard, there was a bit of a problem with their implementation. Things didn't go... Well, I mean, Hitler never won the Nobel Prize for medicine. Let's just put it that way. They believed in ideas like racial hygiene. And if the term itself sends a shiver up your spine, that's good. You need to hold on to that. Hitler's beliefs were not original. Um, Ironically, there were some strange affinities between the way the Nazis and the Zionists saw the world and saw themselves. The Nazis, for example, would end up adopting the same racial definition of a Jew as the Zionists, and which the state of Israel still uses today to determine someone's right to immigrate. The German Jews, they called themselves Germans who were culturally Jewish, but the Nazis were able to say, no, 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 you can't be culturally Jewish or culturally German or culturally anything. Jewishness is in your DNA. No matter how much you pretend to wear the clothes and speak the language of a German, a Jew Jew is who you are. It's, It's your race. It's who you are. And the Zionists agreed with that whole cloth. You probably remember me mentioning Chaim Weizmann's line from an earlier episode, a line which, again, could have been spoken by Hitler's propaganda minister. There are no German, British, Russian, or American Jews, only Jews who happen to be living in Germany, Britain, Russia, or America. On a deeper level, the Zionists and the Nazis agreed about some of the fundamental attributes and shortcomings of the Jewish community. The Nazis would complain incessantly that the Jews were rootless cosmopolitans, unattached drifters. They were all cleverness and and, and greed, not a true nation, but one which lives as a parasite on the underside of true nations. According to one German racial scientist, Zionism was, quote, a laudable effort to rehabilitate the Jewish race by curing it of its parasitic tendencies, end quote. Well, a guiding principle of all Zionists was the overcoming of exile. The very first Zionists who showed up in the late 19th century, they had tried to establish a plantation system in which Jews would live a comfortable life on the back of cheap native labor. It was more straightforward colonialism. Theodore Herzl said he was inclined, actually, toward that kind of an aristocratic republic. But, of course, this fell apart because you can't have a whole nation of privileged aristocrats. That's not a nation. A nation needs its own farmers, its own industries, its own miners, builders, teachers, public servants. It needs its own writers and poets. A nation needs to position itself such that, in theory at least, it could continue to exist if every other person in the world ceased to exist. A nation needs to be a world unto itself in order to be truly independent. That doesn't mean that you don't interact with others or that being cut off wouldn't be disruptive for you. It just means that your existence does not depend upon the contingent support of others. Throughout the whole history of the Jewish diaspora, they had been in a position where they had a lot to offer. But if the local population just decided, yeah, we're not going to feed you anymore, we grow the food and you're not getting any, then there was nothing they could do about that. They just had to pack up and leave and hope they could find someone else. This was something that the second generation of Zionists, after the plantation generation, and especially the labor Zionists, were really concerned about. And they never wanted to allow the Jewish communities in the world to be in that position again. And so all their policies and plans were designed to escape the type of life that they had learned to live in exile. Where they were all bankers and lawyers and doctors and traders and shopkeepers, and not a farmer or a miner in sight. And these policies sometimes look bad, but again, there are always multiple layers to things that are often presented in a, as polemical weapons by people who are ideologically motivated to wield them that way. The, the fact that the Zionists refused to hire Arabs, the labor Zionists refused to hire Arabs, sounds like nothing but rank discrimination if you think of it like one group refusing to hire another group in a modern developed country today. But when the labor Zionists made that decision they had a lot more on their minds than just discrimination. That first migration had failed because the plantation owners were employing cheap Arab labor, and there just wasn't anything for a working-class Jew to do in Palestine. 
the labor Zionists had this concept of the conquest of labor, and it was a very self-conscious attempt to reform the Jewish people, to purge them of the habits of life that they had picked up over the centuries in their urban diasporas. Jews as a group hadn't planted a seed or hoed a garden in thousands of years, and the labor Zionists were completely committed to changing that. And that was a change that Hitler would have wholeheartedly endorsed. It got to the heart and source of his distrust for the Jewish people and why he thought that they were dangerous elements in his own and in other nations. I mean, don't get me wrong. His, his racism was so fixed in place and his hatred for the Jews was so rooted that he probably would have said that that attempt was doomed to fail or, or that if it succeeded, he probably would have just made up some new excuse to hate them. Don't get me wrong. But it is interesting because it shows that there's an underlying internal logic to nationalism. The Nazis and the Zionists were both nationalists, and in a way, they both valued many of the same things and criticized and distrusted many of the same things. And again, it's unlikely that anything would have changed Hitler's mind. Don't get me wrong. And don't think that I'm trying to say that Hitler only hated the Jews because of some real deficiency in the Jewish community. I'm not. I'm just pointing out that there are almost inevitable conclusions that confront you once you adopt the perspective of a nationalist. Part of Hitler's inflexibility had to do with the way he adapted the ideas of social Darwinism to shape an ideology around the idea that every people or race, the Nazis use words like race and people and nation interchangeably, that they all had certain essential traits. Not only physical traits like darker skin or blonde hair or bridge noses, but internal characteristics having to do with psychological makeup and creative abilities, things like that. And again, the Nazis were definitely not alone in thinking this way. This was a very modern, progressive way to be thinking back then. But the Nazis believed that many of these traits, many of these internal traits, were a drag on the human race the same way that a genetic disease was. Today, again, from our broader perspective, we don't need a conspiracy theory to account for the over overrepresentation of Jews in the early 20th century revolutionary movements. I mentioned it, I think, in the first episode. When you've got any group that is disproportionately educated, literate, urban, you get that group of people and, and force them to face endemic discrimination and persecution for years and years. What do you think is going to happen? Of course they're going to be first in line for any movement that's going to overturn that order. But the Nazis didn't see it that way. They took these modern, scientific, quote-unquote, principles and applied it to this problem. Like, maybe there was just something about these Jews. And I shouldn't even say that the Nazis believed this, because, again, that gives a false impression of what things were like at this time. And I don't say this to lighten the load of responsibility carried by the Nazis, but it's important. It's very important, in my opinion, from the standpoint of historical accuracy and, and moral honesty, to understand that the Nazis were just following through on a line of thinking that was absolutely mainstream everywhere in Britain, the U.S., and Europe. When Belgium divided up Rwandan society along lines that would later fracture into the 1994 genocide, they did it in the name of race science. When the Belgians had taken control of Rwanda as a spoil of the First World War, they adopted the ideas of this English explorer, John Henning speaks in his so-called Hamitic hypothesis. The taller Tutsi minority with their delicate features and somewhat lighter skin, if you asked a 19th or early 20th century race scientist, you can see my little finger quotes there, they were actually supposed to be a Caucasoid race from Christian Ethiopia. And they were in fact descendants of the biblical King David. That was the theory. The Hutu, on the other hand, they represented further proof of the accuracy of Scripture, since they're mentioned in Genesis 9, right there. In that chapter, Noah, having successfully stayed above water long enough to outlast the flood, gets drunk and passes out naked in his tent. Upon waking up, Noah's outraged to learn that his son Ham had seen him naked, which is probably a euphemism for taking advantage of his father's drunkenness to perform you know, acts that the rest of the Bible spends a disproportionate amount of time condemning. And so Noah responds to his son's violation by cursing Ham's descendants with the words, a slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. And 
this is who the Hutu were supposed to be. And so this is what people were thinking like back then. This was mainstream. This same myth was frequently used to scripturally justify slavery in the antebellum American South. I mean, actually, i got a quote here. Listen to this. Speak writes about the Hutu in a section of his book called Fauna. <laughs> the section of his book called Fauna is where he writes about the Hutu tribe of people. And he describes them like this. He says, quote, How the Negro has lived so many ages without advancing seems marvelous when all the countries surrounding Africa are so forward in comparison. And judging from the progressive state of the world, one is led to suppose that the African must soon either step out from his darkness or be superseded by a being superior to himself. End quote. This was boilerplate, normal, Victorian racist blabber, not exceptional among the intelligentsia anywhere in Europe or the United States. It informed the colonial policies of every imperial power, including the ones in this story. And so every nation that becomes so horrified by the devastation that's about to be wrought by the Third Reich, every single one of our nations was intellectually complicit in the Nazi crimes. This ideology held that whole ethnicities were the equivalent of genetic degenerate strains corrupting the social bodies of superior races. This is the way the Nazis thought about it. And so instead of only naming the physically deformed, the handicapped, and so forth, the Nazis targeted groups like the Romani, gypsies, as they're often called by the rest of us, I guess. They targeted the Slavs, and they targeted the Jews, and several other groups. But most of all, the Jews. These pseudo-scientific ideas of social Darwinism and racial hygiene changed the language of anti-Semitism. The Jews weren't just morally evil as the murderers of Jesus as they had been in the Middle Ages. They weren't just treacherous foreign agents as they were viewed by the nationalists. Instead of just evil or treacherous, the Nazi anti-Semite is using words like pollution, contamination, filth. Jews are compared to plague rats and spoken of as vermin. Think of the way people react in the presence of an infectious disease. Imagine standing near a pool of blood containing the Ebola virus, the way your skin crawls, the way societies tear themselves apart with panic during a plague. Under the Nazis, the Jewish problem becomes not so much a religious or even a national problem, but a medical problem, a public health problem, something to be quarantined and eventually cut out. Back when Adolf Hitler was 18 years old, he watched his mother slowly break down and die after a long, painful bout with breast cancer. The doctors at the time believed it was some kind of blood poisoning. The historian and journalist Dr. Joachim Riker, he, he wrote about this. He said, quote, in his madness, Hitler was convinced that the Jewish poison had done the same thing to his beloved Germany in 1918 that the cancer poison had done to his beloved mother in 1907, end quote. Now, Hitler would give a voice to the frustration that so many Germans felt after the war. They had not been defeated and overrun by an external enemy. In Hitler's fevered mind, Germany's energy had been sapped from inside as its life was eaten away from the inside by a corrosive disease like the cancer that had killed his mother, and he vowed never to let it happen again. This was the voice that rose up in 1933 and captivated the nation of Germany. The rapidity of the change in German society, it, it caught Germany's Jews flat-footed. When the First World War broke out, over 100,000 Jews enlisted to fight for Germany. The German army officer who recommended Hitler for his medal was Jewish. And yet in 1935, Nazi minister of propaganda Joseph Goebbels would make an announcement regarding the Jews who had given their lives fighting for Germany in that war. He said, quote, it is forbidden to list the names of fallen Jews on memorials and memorial plaques for the fallen of the World War, end quote. 12,000 Jews had died fighting for Germany. 
The rest of those hundred thousand had suffered along with all the German boys out in those trenches. Many more were gravely wounded. The names of these Jews were chiseled out of existing war memorials, sometimes replaced with the names of battles or crudely covered over with some kind of embellishment. Now try to forget for the moment that you already know where this is headed. Go back into 1935 and forget that you know what's about, to, what's about to start. Try to put yourself in the mind of one of those 100,000 German Jewish war veterans who had suffered in those trenches during those horrible years, who considered yourself as one Jew who was shocked by this sudden reversal had said, more German than the Germans. It happened quickly, and they, they didn't know what to make of it. Once Hitler was in power... Jews around the world very quickly saw that something was happening. Jews around the world rallied and beseeched their governments wherever they were to act against Germany in whatever way they could. Tens of thousands of American Jews rallied in Madison Square Garden to denounce the Nazis, and Jews around the world organized a massive boycott of the German economy. Keeping in mind the economic power of the Jewish community, at the time, which was substantial, this boycott stung a little bit, and it confirmed in Hitler the certainty that the Jews did in fact have it out for Germany. And they had set out to crush her as soon as someone who was on to their game had taken power. And again, Hitler's plans did not depend on a boycott from world Jewry, and I don't mean to say that anyone provoked Nazi persecution of the Jews, but the boycott gave Hitler the pretext he needed to get started with the persecutions. The first concentration camps were opened right after that in 1933. And at this point, we're not talking about death camps, but basically open-air prison networks, like the gulag system in Russia before Stalin took them over. Open-air prison networks that, that were there to isolate political dissidents from the general population, to keep them from spreading their ideas and re-educate them and reform them or whatever. Jewish businesses were boycotted and often smashed up, and the daily hostility that Jews faced in the street, it ramped up, again, it ramped up so quickly, and it seemed to reverse so fast that even despite the Nazis' rhetoric, Jews were caught off guard. Because the Nazis can say what they want, but they, they won the election with a major, or rather without a majority of the vote, and these people who were now avoiding them in the street or insulting them, these were their neighbors. Germany had always had strains of anti-Semitic thought, but Jews were not accustomed to the kind of daily treatment that their cousins in Romania and Ukraine were used to dealing with. Now, at this time, it the record seems to indicate that extermination as a policy had not yet emerged in Hitler's mind as an answer to Germany's Jewish question. At this point, his goal seems to have been to make life in Germany Miserable enough for the Jews that they would leave on their own. Self-deport, I think, is the term being thrown around in this 2016 U.S. election. And, and he wanted them to leave and leave their assets and their property behind. And so, to that end, they began to pass laws restricting Jewish land ownership and pushing them out of certain professions. Improvements in their lot that they had made since the end of the 1918 war. They were banned from the civil service, and most Germans began to avoid Jewish businesses and refused to serve Jews. You had many German Jews who were trained doctors and lawyers. Many of them were professors and scientists, and these people were in many cases being forced to find work essentially cleaning toilets and scraping out gutters. It was a repetition of what happened to many people after the Russian Revolution, when you could go to Berlin or Vienna and find your chauffeur had been a general in the Russian Empire, or that the lady selling you clothes at the department store had been a grand duchess. Many Germans were voluntarily beginning to dissociate themselves from Jews. Signs were posted outside public buildings and in public spaces to indicate whether or not Jews were allowed to enter there or linger there. Park benches would be marked specifically as being designated for Jews. And to the people on the ground who were trying to get through their day, trying to buy groceries or looking for, for somewhere to sit down in a park, all this feels like discrimination. 
to people looking back, to us looking back, who know what's coming, it looks like something else. It looks like quarantine. Now, to the Jews who were caught up in the events, this was disorienting, but discrimination was not so new to them, and so very few of them had any real idea of what processes had been set in motion. I mean, who could have possibly understood? In all the history of the world, there was no precedent for what was about to happen. There were signs, though. It didn't happen all at once. In one ominous move, Jews are banned from obtaining health insurance through the national health system. That's a little bit like a weatherman who also happens to run an insurance company coming to tell me that my flood insurance has been canceled. In 1935, at the annual Nazi rally in Nuremberg, two laws were proposed which put to bed any remaining hope that this was going to stop a discrimination. The first was called the law for the protection of German blood and German honor. Jews were forbidden from marrying or having sexual intercourse with Germans, or even having German women under 45 years old work in their homes. And the second law would strip all Jews of German citizenship, including all rights and all legal protections. They hadn't just lost certain privileges or legal rights. Their basic status had changed. The Jews had been removed from the social body and marked off as an intruder, like an invasive species that the German immune system, or the Nazi autoimmune disorder, was about to attack. This was happening fast, and it made the urgency of getting Jews out of Germany and into Palestine immediate and desperate just as Arab resistance was beginning to stiffen. Many Zionists were willing to grit their teeth and try almost anything to find a way to get them out. The man we spoke of earlier, Chaim Arlasarov, he'd had a premonition even before Hitler had been elected that the world was headed for a cliff, and so already in 1933 he began to take action. As the political head of the Jewish agency, and someone who had Ben-Gurion's ear directly, Arlosarov opened negotiations with the Nazi government to facilitate the transfer of Jews out of Germany and into Palestine. The Germans had been playing around with ideas like this. They thought about perhaps deporting the Jews to Madagascar, and they were receptive to Arlosarov's plan. The Nazis had been confiscating the property of any Jew who immigrated, but Arlosarov was able to put over a scheme that would allow emigrating Jews to retain most of the value of their assets. And basically, simply put, he had convinced the Germans to go along with a scheme whereby Jews would be permitted to leave for Palestine and their assets would be placed in a trust when they departed. They couldn't take the assets with them, but instead the assets were used to buy equipment and supplies from German companies that they would need for their lives in Palestine. In this way, Arlasarov was able to get 60,000 Jews out of Germany and into Palestine, almost certainly saving their lives. But the scheme also provided a major boost to the Nazi German economy, as you can imagine. And so not everybody was happy about this, especially the revisionists. Now, the British had banned Zev Jabotinsky from entering Palestine once he'd left in 1930, And they were beginning to find out that, despite his tough rhetoric, he may have actually been a moderating force on the Zionist right wing. The younger ones coming up behind him were more ferociously anti-liberal, and they felt none of the opponent's respect, that kind of respect for the enemy as as a fellow, you know, as a worthy opponent that Jabotinsky kind of exhibited for his enemies, they didn't feel any of that. And now when Arlosarov made this deal, he saved 60,000 Jews from almost certain death, but the revisionists were furious. Furious at Arlosarov, furious at Ben-Gurion and the whole Zionist left. What did they think they were doing? You don't sit down at a table and legitimize the Nazis by negotiating with Heinrich Himmler. It doesn't matter if you can save a million Jews. And so when Arlosarov returned to Tel Aviv, He was threatened and insulted in the streets, and the rift between the fascist revisionists and the socialist labor Zionists began to tear open. 
One night on a beach near Tel Aviv, two men approached Chaim Arlosarov as he sat on the beach with his wife. One asked him for the time, and as he reached for his watch, the man pulled out a gun and murdered him. His wife was left alive, and she identified two members of a hardcore revisionist group, but a trial that was threatening to break apart the Jewish community in Palestine decided that there wasn't enough evidence to convict them, but nobody in Palestine doubted what had happened. Ben Gurion and the labor Zionists were outraged, blamed the revisionists completely, and even the revisionist party dissolved the particular subgroup of which those two men were a part. And that year, 1935, massive numbers of new Jewish immigrants are flooding into Palestine as Hitler continues to ramp up his reign of terror. And as anti-Jewish violence spreads in places like Romania and Ukraine, it's getting worse and worse all over the place. In 1931, Zionists still only made up about 17% of the population. And that's a little bit deceiving because the Zionist immigrants are, are heavily weighted toward young, single, military-aged males, which in a conflict like this is really the operative demographic. But still, they were only 17% of the population in 1931. Four years later, by the end of 1935, they would be a third of the population. Now, try to step back for a moment from those abstract numbers and put that in a perspective that you can relate to. I'll use the United States, but use whatever country you're comfortable with. In the United States today, 2016, immigration is one of the hot-button controversial issues. It gets a lot of people riled up over the impact that it has on Native workers, on the ability of our economy and social institutions to absorb so many new people. So think about that. And then think about this. Hispanics, which is the main part of the immigration question in the United States, Hispanics make up about 17% of the population of the United States today, right around the same proportion as the Zionist population in Palestine in 1931. And about half a million new immigrants come in from Latin America every year into the United States. Maybe another few hundred thousand or so come in illegally. So let's say a million or so new arrivals each year, is enough to cause one of the most bitter, acrimonious debates in U.S. politics. Now imagine that over the next four years, 75 million new immigrants from Latin America come into the United States. Because that's what it would take to create a demographic change in the U.S. population equivalent to the one that Palestine went through from 1931 to 1935. 75 million in four years. Now imagine that those new immigrants aren't even making a show of trying to assimilate. Imagine that the presence of so many new people was driving up rents and real estate prices to levels way beyond what anyone who, who lives here can afford. Anybody except for the immigrants can afford. And the immigrants are being funded by a massive international infrastructure and wealthy financial interests from all over the world. And imagine that the new arrivals who are displacing huge chunks of the native population are refusing to hire Americans, who are piling up in shanty towns outside of our major cities. And imagine that the immigrants are importing weapons and forming up their own police and military units and holding parades and rallies openly talking about their intention to take over the country for themselves. And now imagine that the entire operation is sponsored by some overwhelmingly powerful international institution. That we have no choice in the matter. This is being imposed on us. It was the British Empire in Palestine. There's nobody really who could impose this on the U.S., but let's say it was a huge coalition under the U.N. Imagine that the U.N. had been completely co-opted by the movement behind this immigration and takeover to the point that when the Americans sent a group of people to express their concerns to the UN, they were sent to talk to the leader of the takeover movement. And I think I mentioned in an earlier episode that this actually happened at one point when the Palestinian Arabs decided to go around the high commissioner directly to the British government to make their case. After careful planning and months of debate over exactly how to craft their message to present it to present the Palestinian Arab position to the British government when they finally arrived in London, 
to make that presentation to the prime minister or at least to the cabinet or at least to the foreign office. Instead, they were sent to see Chaim Weizmann to plead their case to him. So just imagine that and ask yourself how long you think this would go before any country turned itself into a Hieronymus Bosch painting. The British governors in Palestine have an idea that tensions are rising, but even now, they only really interact with the Grand Mufti, Haj Amin al Husseini, and some of the other notables. Even Qassam and his followers were really below the radar horizon for the British leadership. And so they have no idea how close to the edge the people on the street are. But they're about to find out. Because in October 1935, a month before the Nazis held that Nuremberg rally and passed those Nuremberg laws, a Belgian flag cargo ship was being unloaded in the Palestinian port city of Jaffa when a barrel of cement headed with most of its cargo to Tel Aviv fell and cracked open on the deck. A group of Arab longshoremen and stevedores gathered around the spilled cement, pointing and talking among themselves, getting more and more excited, and then they started to take hammers and axes and break open all the other barrels and spill their contents out on the deck. And British supervisors start to see what's going on, and they immediately intervene, get control of the Arab workers, but as soon as they saw what had gotten them so worked up, they immediately closed off the area and called in the British police. When the British police got there, spread out across the deck were weapons, rifles, machine guns, ammunition, explosives. Now it had long been suspected, at least, by the British and the Arabs, that the Zionists were smuggling in some weapons. A few rifles here, a box of grenades there, that kind of thing, but the British had more or less maintained a monopoly on violence in the region, and they didn't allow the Jews or the Arabs to organize militias or to really seriously arm up. Even the Haganah, the labor Zionist militia organization, that was still an underground organization. It wasn't legal. And when these cement barrels were all broken open, British investigators found 800 rifles, dozens of machine guns, 400,000 rounds of ammunition. The Arabs, again, had, had imagined that the Zionists were bringing in a few weapons here and there for self-defense. They couldn't process this. This was something on a scale so far beyond anything they had imagined was going on, or that they had access to themselves, that they were really excited about this, to say the least. There had already been rumors from some of the more radical Arab leaders that the Zionists had been plotting to launch a preemptive attack against the Arabs to drive them out of Palestine, but the British had generally been able to convince most of the others that, that they had things under control. Some other Arab leaders were demanding the right to arm, arm themselves in order to protect themselves from whatever this was, but the British wouldn't allow it. Reassuring most of the locals that the Jews were not plotting violence, and if they were, were the British Empire. We'll find out about it and we'll deal with it. Don't worry. But when the cargo of, of, of weapons here is discovered and they see that something is going on on a scale that they had not imagined possible, the news was not received by the Arabs merely as a thwarted shipment of arms, as, as some contraband that didn't get in, but as proof that the Zionists had been violating the British instructions this whole time and that they were arming themselves and training fighters while the Arabs had been asleep at the wheel, mindlessly obeying the British. Were they supposed to believe that this was the first shipment, and the first shipment just happened to be intercepted? How many, how many others had gotten through undetected? And many Arabs are thinking, hey, if, if the Zionists do have a secret army, and they've been training and, and building up arms without our knowledge, we don't have anything like that right now. If they are plotting an attack, we're defenseless. We start to hear Arabs, e even peaceful Arabs, like Khalil al-Sakakini. We, we quoted him in the second episode. He was the Arab Christian we quoted who, whose heart was sick and who was so shaken after the violence of the Nebi Musa riots of 1920. And after this, he's writing, quote, If this immigration continues, 
Palestine's future is very black. There is no choice but to rouse ourselves. There is no choice but to shake ourselves. There is no choice but to act. You know, one thing about the dynamic of paranoia, paranoia in the clinical sense, is that it causes the paranoid to sort of lose the ability to create psychological distance between himself and other people and the rest of the world. Does that make sense? In, in a world inhabited by a paranoid person, nothing just happens to him. Everything is done to him. And the paranoid creates a world in which his persecution is the driving engine and sole purpose of that universe, where, where there are no others just friends and enemies. Nobody is just out there living their lives. Everybody has a relationship to you that is either antagonistic or, or friendly. The idea that most things that happen have nothing whatsoever to do with him is increasingly lost on the paranoid. And the opposite idea, that the whole world is, is, is conspiring against him and that everything that happens is more evidence of it, seems completely self-evident. You know, this is the paranoia of the anti-Semite who, who just can't imagine anything in the world happening that the Jews don't control. Or it's the paranoia of the, the Zionist who imagines that Palestinian fighters are purposely putting their own children in the line of fire just to make Israel look bad when they accidentally kill them. When people lack a grounded sense of their own identity, a strong sense that their identity is rooted and unshakable. Anything can be experienced as a grave threat to, to break that identity up or, or to break up their mind or body even. And it becomes difficult for the paranoid to even conceive of a truly independent, indifferent other. Now, this obviously becomes less precise when we apply these psychological ideas to groups, but Individual paranoids are, for example, as a rule, very concerned with what goes in and out of the body. They're obsessed with purity. Paranoid buzzwords throughout history have been things like borders, membranes, pollution, cleanses, purges. And as this way of thinking sets in, it's only a matter of time before paranoia turns into panic. By the mid-1930s, we've got Germans, Arabs, and Zionists all on the verge of panic, on three different train tracks headed right at each other, and the rest of the world is just watching this with their fingers on buttons waiting for the fire to start. After the discovery of those smuggled weapons, Arab leaders called together a meeting to discuss their future and to try to figure out what the Zionists were planning and, and what to do about it? What were they planning to do with all those weapons? The British didn't help matters when they just confiscated the weapons and didn't even investigate who they were supposed to go to, didn't make a single arrest. And, you know, at this point, it didn't even matter what was actually true. The momentum of the rumors were taking on a life of their own. And it wasn't long before many Palestinians were completely convinced it wasn't a belief, it wasn't a thought, it was just reality to them that the Zionists were planning widespread, organized violence against them at any moment. The Palestinian notables and tribal leaders huddled in meetings to talk about the possibility of calling a strike, maybe, or of drafting a petition to call on the British to act. And as they're huddled together, haggling over things, at this point, Izzad Din al qassam who had been in hiding for the last two years, he decides he's seen enough. Once again, he approaches the Grand Mufti, hoping to persuade him to issue another joint call for jihad against these invaders and to lead a mass rebellion. But again, the Haj Amin refused, saying that he was working for a political solution to the crisis. And maybe that was the right thing to do, but to Izzad Din al qassam who at this point felt that there was no reason to continue talking, he just left once again disappointed by these elites, these collaborators who, who would never risk endangering themselves or their positions at all for any reason. 
They would talk and talk and talk until there was no Palestine left to talk about. And then when that was done, they'd eventually sell the Arabs of Palestine to the British or the Zionists, just as his Syrian backers had sold their people out to the French. Now, al qassam was renowned by this point among the poor people and the people of the countryside for his refusal to compromise with the Palestinian Arab leadership. And he knew that the Palestinian people were not prepared for armed resistance, but he just decided that there's no more time left. And so he put out the call to activate the cells of peasant fighters he'd been training over the last two years. And this is a small number of people, maybe 800 to 1,000 members organized into five-man cells, but they had a lot of support throughout the countryside. And he called on them to rise up against the British and to push the Zionists out. After two years of keeping a low profile, he gathered up a few dozen followers and headed up into the mountains with what few weapons and supplies they could scrape together. Now, Qassam knew that open war with the British or the Zionists was useless. His few hundred ill-trained peasant fighters didn't have half the arsenal that had been uncovered in that one Belgian smuggling shipment. Never, ne never mind the shipments that hadn't even been discovered, that they didn't know about. This has become the modus operandi of Islamic Jihad and anti-colonial resistance ever since. There's no way a bunch of guys with limited supplies and rickety weapons are going to stand in front of the British Army or a U.S. Ranger Battalion or the Israeli Defense Force and expect to survive. That's not noble, it's just suicidal and crazy. And it means that you'd rather die symbolically than have any hope of actually achieving the goals you say you set out to achieve for your people. The largest part of the Syrian resistance that actually hung in there and fought against the French in 1921, they tried that. You might remember from the second episode at the Battle of Maisalan, and their tiny force of civilian militia was torn to pieces by French tanks and artillery and aircraft. Now, new tactics were going to be needed. Qassam knew that the only way for a civilian militia to beat a world empire was through guerrilla warfare. And not only against military targets, but against any target that would make staying in your country more painful. And the strategy of jihadis ever since has essentially been to say, look, we are going to make this place unlivable for us and you until you either get out or come to the table and negotiate a settlement that we can live with. And so his people focused their attacks on things they knew would be important to the British and that were vital to life for the Zionists. They would attack railways. They would try to attack pipelines and other infrastructure. They tried to disrupt cargo traffic around the country, block roads, destroy roads, things like that, burn down orchards. al Qassam's group lived in caves up in the mountains, ducking around, trying to avoid British aircraft, studying the Quran for hours and hours and hours every day. This was a man who was completely committed. This wasn't a game to him. It wasn't a way to achieve power for himself. He had to know there was almost no way he was coming out of this. And so despite the tiny size of his forces, and despite the fact that the actual damage they were doing was negligible, to both the Zionists and the British, his message and his, his persona, his way of life, resonated with a people who had, for so long, felt completely unrepresented. And more than that, it resonated with a society who needed something. They needed to find an identity that they could all get behind when there were no legitimate political entities or other secular alternatives. The Arabs in Palestine had been a thousand little groups trying to form up a defense against the unified British and the unified Zionists. You know, the British were the British. The Zionists were the Zionists. They both knew what they wanted and acted with a single will to accomplish their goals. If they had differences, they handled them in-house and then they worked toward their common goal. The British were the British, the Zionists were the Zionists, the Palestinian Arabs were the Husseinis, the Nashashibis, the Khalidis, and so on. Occasionally cooperating, but never offering the people an identity that would bring them together as Palestinians. 
to allow them to meet the British and the Zionists with a united front. This is the need that Kassam was speaking to, and it was turning him into a folk hero. Now, Kassam had learned from his campaign against the French. He wanted to avoid the mistakes of the resistance campaign in Syria. This time, there were no landowners among his group. No dependency on rich benefactors who could betray him and his people when things got a little bit dangerous. You know, everybody wants to be a revolutionary until it costs something. Kassam had already given up everything he had. And he chose only the most committed men to follow him up into the hills. He didn't want any weekend warriors, no war tourists. British intelligence described his group as being, quote, from the poor, the ignorant, and the more violently disposed of the pious, end quote. But Kassam put it a different way. He said, quote, Look, my hair has turned white, and I have much experience, which has made me hope for something good from peasants and workers. They put their trust in God. They believe in heaven and the day of judgment, and whoever has these qualities is more likely to sacrifice and has the daring to push forward. Besides, they're able to endure difficulties and are stronger, end quote. And so about a month after Kassam took to the mountains with his small group, a few of his men were spotted taking grapefruits from an orchard. A Jewish policeman and two others went after him and a firefight erupted. The Jewish officer was shot twice, once in the body and once in the head, killing him instantly. The plan had been... Kassam's plan had been to conduct small-scale raids and sabotage while recruiting Arabs to the cause over time, but this gunfight in the orchard ruined their timeline. The alarm was raised, and the police chased Kassam's men into the hills until the entire group was eventually surrounded and discovered. A manhunt was organized, and the chase turned into a running firefight as Al-Kassam and his men avoided the British army and the Palestine police forces that were after them. There were close calls and escapes, and stories began to leak out that Kassam was being hunted by the British and the Zionists. And so this Geronimo-like manhunt went on, and on the tenth day, one of Kassam's men was shot and killed, and his group decided to split up. One group headed north, and Al-Kassam headed west toward the coast, eventually taking refuge for two days with a local sympathizer before slipping out of town on November 20th. Running out of supplies, running out of ammunition, running out of options, Kassam and his dozen men were herded toward an olive grove by the British. And a lengthy gunfight erupted, and al Kassam's group were pushed back and finally cornered in a cave. Now they're in the cave, and everybody's kind of waiting to see what happens, and the British call out that they would be allowed to surrender to this large British force that had assembled outside. And Kassam thought about it, he looked at his men, and he addressed them, and called on them all to die with honor. And they went out in a hail of bullets. When Kassam's body was searched, folded into his headdress, were his handwritten last words, a prayer to God asking for strength in his struggle. The outpouring of grief and outrage from lower class Palestinian Arabs was immediate and visceral, and the British were completely unprepared for it. One labor Zionist leader, Bert Katznelson, said a little bit later that, that the killing of al Qassam was a huge mistake, that they shouldn't have done it. He wrote, quote, What could he have done? At most he would have killed ten Jews, end quote. Katznelson, he knew the value of a hero myth, he had written the memorial prayer for the first Zionist martyr, the one-armed hero Joseph Trumpledor. Tom Segev writes about it in his book One Palestine Complete. He says, quote, This event was the Arab Tel Hai, David Ben-Gurion said, and it portrayed al Qassam as a fanatic warrior willing to face martyrdom. Indeed, al Qassam was the Arab Joseph Trumpledor. Like Trumpledor, al Qassam had come from another country and had brought military experience with him. The Zionist nationalism of the dentist from Russia was mixed with Marxism. The Arab nationalism of the teacher from Syria was interlaced with Islam. 
Each of them had built his support among the working people. Trumpledore's followers were urban Russian students who had left their homes to work in the land of Palestine. al Qassams were farmers who had left their villages to work in the city. The veneration in which both men were held in life intensified after their deaths in battle. They each gave their national movements a heroic myth, a far more useful contribution than anything they had done in life. End quote. And I would take that statement even further and add that giving their people a heroic myth was far more useful than anything that anyone could have done in any life. The British and the Zionists are about to find out why. Because the outpouring of grief and outrage after al Qassam's death was immediate and visceral. And caught off guard, the British called up the Grand Mufti and the other Arab notables, demanding to know what all this was about. But the Arab leaders distanced themselves from al Qassam. All along, they'd been afraid that his populist message was just going to encourage the Palestinian people to stop looking to them, the traditional leadership. Their positions were derived from simply being a member of an important family. It wasn't based on ideology, and that's what Al-Qassam was pushing. They agreed to do their best to do what they could to defuse the people's rage and to avoid Al-Qassam's funeral. They promised not to go. Muslim funerals are they're held almost immediately after a person's death, usually within a day, two at most. So there's no time for elaborate arrangements. There's no time for much spreading of the word. This is happening the next day after Qassam is dead. And the British are shocked when thousands and thousands of people turned out for his funeral. British intelligence officers were watching in consternation as the crowd grew and grew and people would step forward and start delivering speeches and sermons denouncing the British and Zionist occupation and even denouncing their tribal leaders as collaborators and calling for a populist jihad to drive out the colonialists. A long funeral train proceeded toward al Qassam's hometown of Haifa, growing and gaining energy as it made its way. It would pass villages and people would join it like tributaries into a river. Professor Abdallah Schlieffer of American University in Cairo wrote, quote, al Qassam's defiance and the manner of his death, which stunned the traditional leadership, electrified the Palestinian people. Thousands forced their way past police lines at the funeral in Haifa, and the secular Arab nationalist parties invoked his memory as a symbol of resistance. It was the largest political gathering ever to assemble in mandatory Palestine, end quote. Most of al Qassam's disciples had escaped into the mountains, and they were making their way through villages and shanty towns, calling on the people to rise up. And the air was beginning to crackle with violent energy throughout the country. The Grand Mufti and the other Arab notables were trying to contain the spread of violence, but they were losing control. A few weeks after al Qassam's funeral, they went to the British High Commissioner, Arthur Watchope, and they begged him, you got to give us something. you got to give us anything to take back to these people as a show of good faith. Because they're on the edge and we can't control them much longer. Now, Arthur Watchope had a good, even a friendly relationship with the Mufti, and so he was responsive to it. He understood their predicament. He wrote back to the British colonial office that at least one-fifth of Arab villagers had been reduced to wandering migrant work. And he warned the British government that without some kind of a change their friendly Arab leaders were not going to be of any use to them anymore. He said, quote, I think that they are right in saying that with an unsatisfactory response to their demands from the mandate, the possibility of alleviating the present situation will disappear, end quote. He asked the Arab leaders to consider a revamped proposal for a legislative council that he had been trying to push through for two years. His proposal would create a new representative council that would govern the daily affairs of the country. It would consist of 11 Muslims, 7 Jews, 3 Christians, and of course the British mandatory government would retain final authority and veto power on all decisions, but, but they promised not to micromanage. Now, Up until now, the Arabs had resisted the terms of this proposal because it based Jewish representation on the council on the numbers that they had now, after the doubling of their population, which had occurred against the Arabs' will in just the last few years. They didn't want that to count. And they'd also resisted it because it really didn't change their situation. The British would still retain ultimate power. 
And so while the Arabs may be able to govern on marginal issues in the country, no fundamental alterations to the government or the international status of Palestine would be permitted. But something had to be done. And so finally the Grand Mufti and the others relented. They accepted a power-sharing arrangement with the Zionists, including all the recent new arrivals in a Palestinian representative government. They brought the message back to the people that, look, it's not perfect, but at long last, the transition to a Palestinian self-government has begun. And they prevailed upon the people to halt and condemn any violent activities. But it wasn't going to be that simple. The Zionists had always been focused on establishing a majority in the entire country of Palestine, but as late as the early 1930s, this was something that most of them were seeing happen maybe a hundred years down the road. You know, one more acre, one more goat, right? Well, they had just doubled their population in Palestine in the last four years. Many of them began thinking about a majority not by the end of the century, but by the end of the decade. And so the Zionists just rejected the plan outright. If they could keep up this rate of immigration just a little longer, they might have a majority soon, and then they would consider talking about a representative government. Until then, the Zionists didn't want to do anything that might legitimize any Arab claim to Palestine. Now this annoyed the High Commissioner Arthur Wachope to no end, and he pushed the proposal up to London anyway which received it with a stamp of approval from both the High Commissioner and the Arab leaders. So this proposal arrives back in Whitehall. The Palestinian High Commissioner that they have down there in charge wants it. The Arab leadership wants it. But by the time the proposal was brought before the British Parliament in March 1936, Chaim Weizmann had you know, tickled enough ears and maybe greased enough palms to make sure that the measure was defeated. The mandate authorities want it, the Arabs want it, the Zionists don't want it, eh, too bad. The Arabs thought, by accepting this, they were making huge compromises. They knew that the High Commissioner fully supported this legislative council. And so when it went down in Parliament, two things were completely confirmed as far as the Arabs were concerned. First, the Zionists owned the British government. How could a proposal go down in flames when the high commissioner, the highest authority, the highest British authority in the country, and the whole Arab leadership representing two-thirds of the country's population were in favor of it. How was that possible? And second, it confirmed to them that the Zionists were not negotiating in good faith. They were getting a good deal here. The Arabs were compromising by agreeing to a power-sharing arrangement that legitimized and accepted the gigantic number of immigrants that had arrived in the last four years. But the Zionists wouldn't even accept that. And so to the Arabs, this seemed like proof that the Zionists were not interested in any proposal that involved sharing any power in any way. High Commissioner Wachop and the Arabs had tried to find a compromise that might allow the notables to maintain enough credibility to defuse this simmering rage. To go back to the people and say, look, we're making progress, but the Zionists torpedoed it. And Wachope was insane after this. He, he was so furious. He said, quote, The thing is, I have never met the Prime Minister, and I don't suppose I ever shall. Weizmann can go in there whenever he wants to, end quote. So with this latest failed attempt at compromise by the Arab leadership, sporadic violence resumes around the country, led by those disaffected young men, who were not connected to the big families or to their political parties or to anything else. They're just pissed off. Some of the big families gave them a bit of tepid or rhetorical support because they were struggling to keep them under control, but their credibility and their control was slipping away very quickly now. Young men from the slums and the shanty towns, following Kassam's example, had taken up to the hills to resist. They were not interested in lobbying the British to approve alterations to the mandate. They, they, they weren't interested in lobbying the British to listen to the Arabs' pleas. Why were they begging the British to stop giving away their country? Without the British, 
they were saying, none of this would have been possible. This is not immigration. It's never been immigration. And, and thinking of it that way it led to a, our crippled and confused response to it. When an army occupies a territory, making way for other people to move in, dispossessing the population and trying to impose a new governmental regime that the people there don't want, that's not immigration, that is an invasion. It doesn't matter if the people moving in are using someone else's army to do it. It's an invasion, and it's always been an invasion. Now, Ben-Gurion, Shertok, Jabotinsky, and, and many of the rest of the Zionists could have told them that a long time ago. But their public relations teams had convinced the Arabs that British occupation and Zionist colonization were two separate issues to be dealt with on their own terms, as the Grand Mufti had been doing being friendly toward the British, but opposed to the Zionists. All this time, he'd been wasting his time asking the British to stop the Zionists, but they were never separate issues. The British were the invading army for the Jewish conquerors. On a April 15th, 1936, a convoy of trucks was ambushed by Arab shooters, and two Jewish drivers were killed in the firefight. The next day, Revisionist paramilitaries executed a coordinated reprisal and murdered two Arabs while they were sleeping in their beds. Now, the swiftness and sophistication of this attack, being organized, launched, and, and executed within 24 hours, it just shocked the Arabs. Two days later, the funerals for the two murdered Jews mushroomed into a giant anti-Arab demonstration. An armed Zionist raided an Arab neighborhood, smashing up several houses and shops and assaulting several people, including a couple children, reportedly. The Arabs responded with anti-Zionist demonstrations in several cities. Several of these turned into riots and led to several killings. All over the country, spontaneous councils were formed up in, in, in several Arab towns, and they were all calling for a general strike. The Haj Amin, the Grand Mufti, called together the heads of the Arab families. They were on the edge of losing the last shred of ability that they had to manage this thing. But it was going to be useless to try and stop it. He knew that. There was too much momentum. If they tried to stop it, they would lose that last shred of control. They needed to try and play catch up at this point. Their only hope was to own it, to co-opt this growing movement in the hope that they might regain some legitimacy and be able to steer the situation back onto the road. The Grand Mufti's chief rival, I mean, hated rival, hated on, each of them hated each other, Rahib al-Nashashibi, he was loath to submit to the Grand Mufti's leadership, but the Grand Mufti had the upper hand here. On April 25th, 1936, they formed the Arab Higher Committee under the leadership of the Grand Mufti, Haj Amin al-Husseini, and called for a general strike throughout the country. Now, the British are practical people. They care about money and public relations and the flow of oil from Iraq to the port in Haifa. Similar strikes had helped Egypt, Iraq, and other Arab nations extract concessions that moved them toward independence. The Grand Mufti hoped that a coordinated workers' and taxpayers' strike would compel the British to respond while channeling the anger in, of the people into a form of at least peaceful resistance that wouldn't necessarily provoke a British military response. But as in 1929, the older, cooler heads were not going to prevail. Author and journalist John B. Judas, in his book Truman and American Zionism, writes, quote, The committee included the different factions, including the Husseinis and Nashashibis, with the Mufti as head. The committee issued a manifesto calling for a complete halt to Jewish immigration, a prohibition of the transfer of Arab lands, and a national government responsible to a proportionately representative legislative council. The Husseinis and Nashashibis were still hoping that the pressure of the strike would persuade the British to grant Palestine's Arabs the same self-government neighboring Arabs had won, but younger militants, dismissive of peaceful protests, took the initiative in pressing the case for an Arab Palestine. Over the next six months, Arab groups attacked the Jews and the British. The oil pipeline from Iraq to Haifa, which had opened in 1935, was sabotaged. 
British police stations and railways were targeted. Forests planted by the Jewish National Fund were burned down. About 80 Jews were killed, end quote. The revisionists on the Zionist side are watching this and they are chomping at the bit to fight. They wanted a war. But Ben-Gurion knew better. If, if Arabs and Jews start fighting each other in the streets, the British would come out in force and suppress both of them to keep the peace. No, 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 no. This was a time for restraint. Sit back, let the Arabs rise up, and enjoy the view as they learn what the British Empire is all about. And this drove the revisionists crazy because that British response didn't happen right away. Wachope was angry with the Zionists, refusing to accept anything less than total control, and so he was still friendly with the Mufti. And for the most part, he was treating the sporadic violence as a police problem, not a military problem. But he was under pressure from the British government back home to get this situation under control. And in June 1936, the Palestinian Arabs get a lesson in what India and Sri Lanka and South Africa and, hell, even Ireland already knew about what happens when the slow thighs of the British beast begin to move. The Arabs had heard, but they had never seen what the greatest empire since Rome could do, and they were about to find out. In late June, after receiving reports of snipers marauding outside the ancient city of Jaffa, this is a city just south of the Jewish city of Tel Aviv, the British army entered the town in force, suppressing a minor attempt at resistance with armored vehicles and machine gun fire. The residents of the town were rounded up and forced to watch as British soldiers moved down boulevards and streets, demolishing buildings and houses one by one. You, you remember that line in the, that, that Batman movie, The Dark Knight with the Joker, that one where, where Alfred is describing to Batman how a mysterious bandit had been robbing supply trains making their way through the forest and giving away all the loot. And Alfred says that his military unit that he was in at the time searched in vain for months for this bandit. And when Batman finally asks how they finally caught him, Alfred says, we burned down the forest. That's supposed to be a shocking line in that movie, but Alfred is just describing counterinsurgent warfare. You burn down the forest. Asymmetric warfare is always horrific. And... I mean, you have an organized and identifiable force fighting people who are indistinguishable from the general population and who set traps and melt away. A favorite strategy of the colonial British Empire was just habitat destruction. A lot of the violence at the time was thought to be emanating from the southern city of Jaffa, but it was impossible to know exactly who was an enemy, so the British burned down the forest. They destroyed almost the entire Arab section of Jaffa, making 6,000 people homeless. The only warning the residents received came in the form of leaflets hours before the demolition, warning them to evacuate right now. Most of them had no idea what was going on, and they escaped with nothing more than the clothes on their backs. And this is in a country and at a time where people don't have bank accounts. They don't have insurance. They don't have stock options. For most of these people, every single thing they owned, generations of accumulated wealth in the form of a home and their furniture and their clothing and other articles were burned up and buried in rubble and 6,000 more people made their way into the already crowded shantytown outside the city. And so the Grand Mufti realized that this strike was not working. The British and Jewish economies were largely decoupled from the Arab economy. They had created a British Zionist society within a society, and they weren't nearly as affected by the Arab strike as the Arabs themselves were. Jaffa had been one of the most important ports along with Haifa on the Palestinian coast, but when Arab Jaffa was destroyed, its port functions moved up to the Jewish Tel Aviv. The Arabs were becoming more and more desperate, while the British and the Zionists had access to outside funding that insulated them from the strikes. The gangs of young people were getting harder and harder to control, and some began to denounce the big families again as collaborators and even as enemies of Islam. The Arab Higher Committee reached out to the High Commissioner again to try to negotiate an end to the strike, and with the help of the surrounding Arab countries and some of their ambassadors, 
some, some of who had contacts with the gangs fighting in the hills. You know, the gangs in the West Bank area, the Jordanian government had some contacts with them. In, the, in, in Galilee and up in no, the northern parts, the Lebanese and, and the Syrians had some contacts with them. And so with their help, Wachope was able to convince the Arabs to end the strike while the British government would send a commission to investigate the crisis and, and figure out how to mediate the dispute. Well, the Grand Mufti was suspicious of this. Of course, he's heard it all before. But outside pressure from Transjordan and Egypt, as well as internal pressure from the Nashashibis, forced the Haj Amin to agree. Both the High Commissioner and the Arab leadership used that last bit of capital that they had to hold their people at bay just to, uh, long enough to let this process work its way through. British generals had been sent from outside the area, and they didn't like the idea that they were being held back from fixing this problem by the High Commissioner, who clearly favored the Arabs and wanted to give this an opportunity to be resolved peacefully. These generals were soldiers sent to do a job, and their solutions to the problem were soldier solutions. The Haj Amin and the Arab leadership managed to convince most of the people to stand down and end the strike in September 1936. They were saying, look, everybody, we made our point. Don't worry, the British are sending a delegation to address our concerns. And so the British sent a commission under Sir William Peel, which sent the next several months conducting an investigation into what was going on. And this commission came in carrying a big stick. Historian Tom Segev describes in his book, again, One Palestine Complete, he describes the commission. He says, quote, The commission was most respectable, royal by definition, headed by a distinguished peer, Lord Peel, former Secretary of State for India. Four of the commission's five members bore the title Sir. They included a former governor and a high court judge, a former ambassador, and a professor of history from Oxford. All of them were highly experienced people, equipped with the necessary background for such a weighty inquiry. They arrived in Palestine wearing top hats and tails. The commission's hearings were treated with the utmost seriousness. Weizmann, Ben-Gurion, Jabotinsky, the Mufti, Winston Churchill, and the elderly Lloyd George all testified, as did many others. Some testified in closed-door sessions. Ben-Gurion told the commission that the Bible was the Jewish people's mandate. According to accepted Zionist practice, Ben-Gurion was careful not to use the term state, end quote. Now two decades after the American King Crane Commission had tried to draw attention to the contradictions built into the Balfour Declaration, the Peel Commission finally brought the British government around to the same understanding. The causes of the recent disturbances, it said, were not anti-Semitism but the desire of the Palestinian Arabs for national independence and their hostility and fear regarding the Zionist project in their country. Lord Peel wrote to the colonial secretary, quote, the social, moral, and political gaps between the Arab and Jewish communities are already unbridgeable, end quote. Zev Jabotinsky testified before the commission detailing the Zionist complaints about everything that had happened since the issuance of the Balfour Declaration. Before the commission, he testified, quote, The Arabs were never told what the Balfour Declaration was meant by Lord Balfour and all the others to mean. They were never told. Here again, my lord, I'm going to limit myself as being perhaps a sufficient illustration of that attitude to truth to recall a little story which has been told to this commission in Palestine, that instead of writing on coins it's and so forth, Eretz Israel, that means the land of Israel, they just write the two letters E-I. Why? What is the meaning of it? If the country is to be called Eretz Israel, land of Israel, if that is the name avowed, then print it in full. If it is something which cannot be allowed, remove it. But the way out adopted in this case illustrates the whole system, which is to hint that there is a Balfour Declaration, and perhaps there is something in it, and then again perhaps there is nothing in it. That has been the system from beginning to end." End quote. You can almost hear David Ben-Gurion and Chaim Weizmann in the background grinding their teeth. For every bit of work they put in trying to put the British to sleep, there was always a revisionist like Jabotinsky shouting from the rooftops of Zionist true intentions. Even at this late date, 
the British did not intend, had never officially intended, to support the making of Palestine into a Jewish state. And Ben-Gurion, Weizmann, and others wanted to keep them believing that that's not what they were doing. But the right-wingers, for the, the right-wing for all its ruggedness and potential for savagery, has been, and in my opinion remains to this day in Israel, more honest than the left has ever been about their demands and their intentions. Jabotinsky continued his testimony, quote, You have, of course, heard of compromises and halfway houses which are being suggested, including cantonization or the parody scheme or the cultural rapprochement, or the Jews giving in and so on. Believe my sincerity, and it is the sincerity of the whole movement, the sincerity of every Jew I am now trying to voice. We wish a halfway house could be possible, but it is perfectly impossible. We cannot accept cantonization because it will be suggested by many, even among you, that even the whole of Palestine may prove too small for that humanitarian purpose we need. A corner of Palestine, a canton, how can we promise to be satisfied with it? We cannot. We never can. Should we swear to you we would be satisfied, it would be a lie. End quote. Around the same time, and probably in reaction to testimonies like Jabotinsky's, that arch-colonialist and, and Zionist supporter Winston Churchill wrote very presciently that, quote, The wealthy, crowded, progressive Jewish state lies in the plains and on the sea coasts. Around it, in the hills and the uplands, stretching far and wide into the illimitable deserts, the warlike Arabs of Syria, of Transjordania, of Arabia, backed by the armed forces of Iraq, offer the ceaseless menace of war. To maintain itself... The Jewish state must be armed to the teeth and must bring in every able-bodied man to strengthen its army. But how long would this process be allowed to continue by the great Arab populations in Iraq and Palestine? Can it be expected that the Arabs would stand by impassively and watch the building up with Jewish world capital and resources of a Jewish army equipped with the most deadly weapons of war until it was strong enough not to be afraid of them? And if ever the Jewish army reached that point, who can be sure that, cramped within their narrow limits, they would not plunge out into the new, undeveloped lands that lie around them? End quote. And when Churchill concluded, quote, I find it difficult to resist the conclusion that the partition scheme would lead inevitably to the complete evacuation of Palestine by Great Britain. Jabotinsky indirectly replied to that statement in his testimony, quote, We utterly deny that it means bringing Great Britain into conflict with world Islam. It has been exaggerated beyond any recognition. It is not true. Given a firm resolve, made clearly known to both Jews and Arabs, all this would be performed with the normal smoothness of any other equally big colonization enterprise. End quote. Now the report produced by this commission is one of the best documents on the period that you can find. It's over 400 pages very clearly written, insightful. I, I had read so much about it in so many books that I didn't actually get around to reading the full report itself until I was almost wrapping up this episode, and it really impressed me. The guys on this commission knew what was going on. And in the end, the Peel Commission shared Churchill's skepticism about the future, but they accepted Jabotinsky's optimism about bold action. The commission concluded that the mandatory government in Palestine was being asked to manage an impossible situation. The claims of the Arabs and the claims of the Jews in Palestine were irreconcilable. The Balfour Declaration had always rested on the assumption, they said, that Arab nationalism was not that strongly felt or that it could be dampened by building a few roads and schools. But on the contrary, the increase in literacy and quality of education among the Arabs had only supercharged the desire for national independence. The Commission's report implicitly acknowledged that imposing the Balfour Declaration on Palestine had been a mistake. And yet, having made the mistake, it didn't exactly know what to do. Relations between the Jews and the Arabs had degenerated so badly that the Peel Commission worried about what could happen if Britain acquiesced to the Arabs' demands for a representative government. Any government that represented the population of Palestine would contain a large Arab majority. Britain had helped create the conditions for this current animosity, and the commission said that, quote, 
belief in British good faith would not be strengthened anywhere in the world if now, after helping create this problem, the British threw their hands in the air and just left the Zionists to fend for themselves under an Arab-majority government. The recommendation of the commission was to break the country up, partition, divide Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. And as you can imagine, the Arabs went berserk. At this point, they just, they just couldn't believe what they were hearing. Ever since Chaim Weizmann had met with Amir Faisal in 1919, they had been promised over and over and over that any idea of splitting off their territory and giving it away was impossible, out of the question. That whatever else happened, they definitely don't have to worry about that. Even accepting the basic idea, there were practical reasons that the Arabs rejected this partition having to do with the demographics and geography of the proposed division. The Zionist portion was to be granted independence. Full independence. It would be a state. While the Arab portion was going to be absorbed into Jordan. Transjordan still. It was going to be absorbed into Transjordan and ruled by Faisal's brother Abdullah and still firmly under the stewardship of the British, who basically controlled Transjordan still at this point. Now, Abdullah loved the idea of partition and had always wanted to absorb the Arab lands west of the Jordan River. He had Rahim Nashashibi working on his behalf, trying to push this in Palestine. Twice during the 1920s, the Arabs had put forth plans that actually would have done this, but again, those were the days just after the destruction of the Arab kingdom of Syria had left the Arabs in Palestine with a very confused national identity. By 1937, after everything that had happened, nationalism in Palestine had become firmly and permanently fixed as Palestinian nationalism. They didn't want to be a part of Jordan. In addition to land partition, the commission reported that large transfers of populations would also have to be necessary in order to promote lasting peace a few Jews and lots of Arabs would have to be forcibly moved from one another's areas in order to avoid discrimination by the authorities in each. This would affect the Arab population far more than it would the Jews. Some areas set aside for the Zionists were still 90% Arab in population. The Arab partition only contained about 1,200 Jews, but the Jewish portion was home to 225,000 Arabs who would have to be moved. And so to say the least, the Arabs were not pleased with this idea. The Peel Commission's report had anticipated that neither party would like its recommendations. It didn't expect that. Obviously, the Arabs hated it, but the Commission might have hoped to bring the Zionists around. But that wasn't to be. The Haganah had been planting spies and listening devices around the hotel where the Peel Commission was holding its interviews and deliberations, so it had moment-by-moment -moment updates of how things were going. When it became clear that the Commission was contemplating a partition plan, the Zionists scrambled to expand their presence as quickly as possible in the country in order to make a case for a larger partition. The establishment of new settlements was regulated by the mandatory government, the, the, man, the British mandatory government decided if you could create another Jewish settlement somewhere, but there was a loophole in the law that the Jews rushed to exploit while the Peel deliberations were going on. The law resisted new construction. You couldn't build any new settlements unless the British say it's okay. But the loophole was that there was another law stating that a building could not be demolished if it was completed. Once the roof was completed, that's actually how the law was written. You couldn't tear it down. Then it becomes a whole other thing. And so Zionist work teams were sent out at night with prefabricated construction materials to throw up tiny outposts all over the country to establish a Jewish presence in an area. They were called tower and stockade settlements, and they were basically four walls, a few shacks, and a, a watchtower, just something to put a mark on the map presented to the Peel negotiators. In all, 57 of these settlements were established, and they did what they were supposed to do. The partition gave the Zionists a lot more land than they otherwise would have received based on their population, but even that wasn't enough for everyone. According to the partition plan, the Jews would receive almost the entire coastline, 
and most of the fertile land in Galilee and the rest of the north, while the Arabs would receive the hill territories bordering Jordan and then the empty Negev desert to the south. And then you'd have a, the city of Jerusalem and a corridor to Jaffa would remain under British control. But it wasn't enough. Now that the Zionists had gotten the British talking about partition and talking about forced population transfers, many Zionists wanted to use these recommendations as just a basis for further negotiations, hoping to extract even more concessions. Now David Ben-Gurion thought this was madness, and he pleaded with the rest of the Zionists to accept this partition. He told the doubters that it didn't matter how much land the partition granted to the Jews because it would just be a jumping off point for future acquisitions anyway. Let them give us somebody's backyard and then we'll import a couple million Jews and then we'll take what we want. Writing to his son in a letter, Ben-Gurion said, quote, A Jewish state in part of Palestine is not an end, but a beginning. Our possession is important not only for itself, though this would increase our power and in and every increase in power facilitates getting hold of the country in its entirety. Establishing a small state will serve as a very potent lever in our historical efforts to redeem the whole country, end quote. And he also wrote, quote, The compulsory transfer of the Arabs from the valleys of the proposed Jewish state could give us something which we have never had, even when we stood on our own during the days of the first and second temples, a Galilee almost free of non-Jews. We are being given an opportunity which we never dared to dream of in our wildest imaginations. This is more than a state, government, and sovereignty. This is a national consolidation in a free homeland. If because of our weakness, neglect, or negligence, the thing is not done, then we will have lost a chance which we had never had before and may never have again. End quote. Chaim Weizmann, after reading the recommendations of the Peel Commission, spoke to the British official overseeing the partition plan and he wrote about their conversation afterward. Regarding the transfers of the Arab population, he said that, quote, the whole success of the scheme depended on whether the government genuinely did or did not wish to carry out this recommendation. The forced transfer could be carried out only by the British government and not by the Jews. I explained the reasons why we considered this proposal of such importance. Mr. Ormsby Gore said that he was proposing to set up a committee for the twofold purpose of A., finding land for the transferees, they hoped to find land in Jordan and possibly in the Negev Desert, and B, arranging the actual terms of the transfer. He mentioned the name of Sir John Campbell, who had much experience in connection with the transfers of population between Greece and Turkey, and who knew all about the matter, end quote. So now, in 1937, 20 years after the issuance of the Balfour Declaration, the British government and the Zionist leadership from Weizmann to Ben-Gurion to Jabotinsky are speaking plainly and openly about forcibly removing the Arab population from large parts of Palestine. The Arab leadership had been hoping that this commission would give them something to take back to their people, and they just couldn't believe this. Were the British seriously talking to them about forcibly transferring over 200,000 Arabs from their homes and their land to some other place? Why were they trying to give areas that are 90% Arab to the Jews anyway? And for that matter, why is anybody talking about giving any of our country over to a group of European Jews, most of whom got here in the last five years? What is happening? We welcome the Jews at first. When they started flooding in and our attempts to create representative governments kept getting blocked, you said, don't worry, don't worry. They're only looking for a place to live. When they started isolating themselves and proclaiming their intentions to take away our land, you told us that you would never allow that to happen. When they were discovered stockpiling weapons, you suggested we form a government that gave them half the power when they were only a third of the population. And we agreed. And now, after all your assurances and all our compromises, you're telling us that we have to give up a part of our country altogether? And the best parts? What are you talking about? And no, we don't care if the Germans or any other Europeans are being cruel to the Jews. We cared in 1918. We don't care anymore. This is not our problem. Why don't you go give up Scotland or Wales if it's so important to you? 
with the Arabs finding the Peel partition so repugnant, you might think that every Zionist would be rushing to sign on the dotted line of the commission's recommendations. If the Arabs hate it that much, the Zionists must love it, but that wasn't even true. Despite passionate pleas from Weizmann and Ben-Gurion, they were begging the Zionists to take this on. The Jewish agency, who now was being influenced by an increasingly assertive and militant Zionist organization of America, refused to accept the plan. But they did agree to consider future proposals if maybe the pot were sweetened. But there would be no time for future proposals. The plan had proposed to give the Jews most of the important land in the country and to transfer the Arabs to Jordan, and the Zionists had still refused. If there were any Arabs left that needed proof that the Zionists would settle for anything less than owning the entire country, there weren't any more. Within weeks, Arab fighters had taken back to the hills, erupting with more fury than ever. Ben-Gurion fumed over the interference from American Zionists who were tucked away safely in the United States and who never had any intention, under any circumstances, of settling in Palestine. He would later lament how many Jewish lives might have been saved if the Peel Partition had been accepted in 1937. After the failure of the Peel Commission, there was no way to mistake for criminal violence what had clearly evolved into a rebellion, sporadic and disorganized as it was. These young Arabs lacked a leadership structure, and the rebels, well, the British called them rebels, rebellion indicates that somebody is defying a legitimate authority, I guess, and the Palestinian fighters would have said that they were fighting against a colonial overlord and that you can't be a rebel in your own country. The great Palestinian historian George Antonius, writing a year after the Peel Commission, described how ineffective the Arabs' public relations efforts had been compared to those of the Zionists. And this deficiency led again and again to Britain and then later to the United States to, for them to pursue policies that could only lead the Arabs to conclude that the West was only ever in league with the Zionists to displace them. And if that was the case, then what use could further talk be? Antonius, writing about the way history and journalism that was appearing about the conflict in 1938, writing about that, he remarked, quote, It has to be used with care, partly because of the high percentage of open or veiled propaganda, and partly because the remoteness of the indispensable Arabic sources has militated against real fairness, even in the works of neutral and fair-minded historians, end quote. This is something I have encountered again and again, by the way. Excellent books by very diligent and honest historians often rely entirely on Hebrew and English sources, with a few sections pulling from moderate Christian Arabs like Khalil al-Sakakini or a few others, but that's it. The experience of the Arab peasant is almost entirely excluded, or else viewed from the perspective of one of these other groups. The way it typically manifests is that the British and the Zionists will be presented as having individual motivations that collect up until they form into a historical picture. So, David Lloyd George and Winston Churchill and Arthur Balfour may have had the following intentions and these incentives and those biases and so forth, and therefore the British acted in a certain way. And David Ben-Gurion might have thought this, and Chaim Weizmann may have been prejudiced in the following manner, and Zev Jabotinsky believed this other thing, and therefore the Zionists moved in some given direction. The Arabs, on the other hand, are spoken of almost entirely as a collective. Individual personalities are almost entirely excluded in favor of talking about the seething countryside, the inflamed mob, the disenfranchised peasants. It's always just masses of people. And it's not that these other accounts don't exist. They do exist, although mostly in Arabic and nobody bothers to translate them. I had a conversation with a professor here in Los Angeles who specializes in this conflict, and I asked why such valuable first-hand sources of any historical period or event could be ignored when historians are perfectly aware that they exist. And he told me, he told me that many historians know from experience that just taking Arabic sources seriously at all 
will undermine their credibility with the English and Hebrew-speaking public. And I've had dozens of conversations and debates with people that tell me he's right about this. I can't count the times that I'm talking to someone and they'll cite a politically crafted public statement from the Zionist leadership as hard evidence of how an event went down in real life. And when I pull out a letter from one Arab to another describing what he saw with his own eyes, the response I get was, well, they would say that, come on. And that sounds bad, but the majority of people carry that same prejudice around, at least in the English-speaking world, and especially in the United States. Israeli spokesmen insisted that the victims of the drone strike were active militants, and that, to most people, means they were active militants, full stop. The protests of the family and community of the dead, that they had nothing to do with militia activity, is usually met with a healthy eye roll, and yeah, well, of course they would say that. I mean, even close reading can leave huge holes in our understanding, and I'm, I'm constantly reminding myself that no matter how many books or articles or papers I've read, or even how many people I speak to, my own understanding of an issue like this can only ever be an open-ended narrative. And my job is just to make sure that that narrative remains open-ended, instead of deciding that I know how it is, that I know whose fault it is and why it happened, and to avoid taking some ideological stand based on that closed, incomplete book. I was quoting Antonius. Let me go back to that. Quote, regarding sources on this conflict, he says, quote, It has to be used with care, partly because of the high percentage of open or veiled propaganda, and partly because of the remoteness of the indispensable Arabic sources, has militated against real fairness, even in the works of neutral and fair-minded historians. A similar inequality vitiates the stream of day-to-day -day information. Zionist propaganda is active, highly organized, and widespread. The world press, or at any rate the democracies of the West, is largely amenable to it. It commands many of the available channels for the dissemination of news, and more particularly those of the English-speaking world. Arab propaganda is, in comparison, primitive and infinitely less successful. The Arabs have little of the skill, polyglottic ubiquity, or financial resources which make Jewish propaganda so effective. The result is that for a score of years or so, the world has been looking at Palestine mainly through Zionist spectacles and has unconsciously acquired the habit of reasoning on Zionist premises." End quote. Now, that could have been written in 2016, but it was written in 1938, a year after many young Arabs had finally decided to stop trying to make their case because there was nobody to make their case to. Their parents had believed that perhaps the British were basically well-intentioned, but that they were hamstrung by a Byzantine bureaucracy and by Zionist propaganda and influence and so forth, and that if they could just punch through all that and get their own message across to the British, that maybe things would change. But this new generation... And remember, in 1937, an Arab who was born when the Balfour Declaration was issued, he was 20 years old now. That's who we're talking about. People who have lived their entire lives with the tension and hostility we've been talking about in this story. Their first memories were the Nebi Musa and Jaffa riots, and they were 12 years old during the 1929 riots. These are young people who were born in the dirty shanty towns, and whose lot in life when they came of age was to hope that a Zionist or British official would give them a job somewhere. All they've ever known from the time they were children is that there are foreigners here trying to take away our country. And just as the younger generation of Jews resented the feudal appeasement and and endless negotiations that had already cost their parents so much, these younger Arabs were finished with trying to talk to their conquerors, trying to talk their conquerors out of their conquest. The Arab fighters were organized along the lines that Qassam had left behind, in small, independent cells without an organized, centralized command structure. In September 1937, a British district commissioner was killed by a cell in Galilee. Now High Commissioner Wachope, who was under tremendous pressure to get this situation under control, ordered the Arab Higher Committee disbanded and issued mass arrest orders to the rest of the Palestinian leadership. Having given up on working with the British, the Grand Mufti escaped to Lebanon and began to help conduct the rebellion from there. 
The heads of all the other notable families on the committee were exiled to an internment camp on the tiny island of Seychelles in the Indian Ocean. And this turned out to be terribly counterproductive. The notable leadership, and especially the Mufti, had been the only force holding back the younger generation and keeping them in check at all. All the British had accomplished by taking out the leadership was to remove the lid on the rage that had been boiling under the surface for so many years. And again, these younger militants, the ones left behind, they're cut from a different cloth. Dispossession, eviction, poverty, violence, hopelessness and desperation. These were not deviations from normalcy for them. These were the fundamental conditions of the only world that they'd ever known. And they harbored a kind of rage that only a person born in such a world can understand. John B. Judas writes, quote, With the older leaders exiled, younger local militants, many of them radical Islamists, stepped forward. In their own villages, they imposed Islamic customs, including forcing women to wear veils. They targeted Christian Arabs and Druze. When they raided Jewish villages, they killed indiscriminately. In Tiberias, rebels killed 19 Jews, including 11 children who appear to have been burned alive. By early 1938, these rebels had forced the British to evacuate Jericho and other towns. The British military commander in Palestine wrote that, quote, the situation was such that civil administration of the country was to all practical purposes non-existent, end quote. Now as 1937 turns over into 1938, David Ben-Gurion is still calling for restraint, mostly keeping the left under control. He doesn't want to distract the British because now they're really gearing up to pacify the Arab revolt. But the revisionists, the revisionists are not listening anymore. Just as there was a younger generation of Arab firebrands who showed none of the flex that their parents did, a new generation of Zionists had grown up from the beginning, from the cradle, hearing about this conflict. Zev Jabotinsky had been banned from the country by the British back in 1931. He's been organizing activities in Europe and the United States. And just as when they had exiled the Arab leadership during this revolt that was going on now, the British found that a seemingly extremist leader was really the only thing keeping the even more extreme elements on a leash. A new generation of violent, more openly fascist men. Jabotinsky, when you really look at his politics, was more liberal than he gets credit for. This younger generation coming up behind him is not afraid of the fascist label. This is the late 1930s. And, and these men had risen to prominence in the revisionist party in recent years. Zev Jabotinsky had been traveling around Europe organizing cells of would-be Jewish immigrants and training and preparing them for a move to Palestine. He spoke ten languages, and he was very effective at spreading revisionist Zionism on the continent. Betar, the, the paramilitary youth organization that Jabotinsky had modeled on Mussolini's black shirts, had become a worldwide movement. I've seen one academic source that said Betar had 100,000 members in Poland alone, but I, I don't know where they got that, and I find it a little bit hard to believe. But either way, Jabotinsky was making a lot of progress. But was he making it fast enough? Betar members trained in their home countries as they prepared to immigrate to Palestine, ready to fight the moment they stepped off the boat. A small group of fighters had split off from the Haganah proper in 1931, but had nevertheless obeyed the policy of restraint up until now. They were called the Irgun, and they were a paramilitary organization mostly made up of this new breed of Betar fighters. New breed men like the future Israeli Prime Ministers Yitzhak Shamir and Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin was an archetype of this uncompromising new breed. He was born to a well-off merchant family and he grew up in Poland. But his father, his father was an early Zionist who, when Theodor Herzl died in 1904, he took an axe and broke into a local synagogue to hold a secret memorial service with some friends in the middle of the night. Now, his father was a Marxist Zionist in the mold of Joseph Trumpledor, but Menachem Begin himself took up with Betar after hearing Jabotinsky deliver one of his, one of his trademark speeches. 
Begin was only 16 when he joined the movement, and he very quickly rose to prominence. When he was 23, he was put in charge of the Beitar in Czechoslovakia, and when he moved back to Poland, he was given a job organizing the movement there and delivering lectures and speeches around the country. He would travel all around the country, recruiting members and giving speeches in gymnasiums and synagogues and even on street corners, anywhere he could get a few Jews with a little bit of fire in their bellies to listen to him. As he traveled around organizing and giving speeches, he would sleep on park benches and eat whatever people gave him. Begin idolized Zev Jabotinsky, but at a Beitar conference in 1938, he openly defied him regarding the policy of restraint. They argued in front of the audience, and Jabotinsky was using practical arguments about the effectiveness of it and, and, and the pointlessness of engaging directly with the Arabs or the British in large-scale military operations. But Begin was more a man of the times, and he ignored Jabotinsky's practical arguments to make romantic, emotional pleas to the assembled Zionists. In the end, Begin won out. And the Beitar Oath was altered to change a line from I will raise my arm only in defense to I will raise my arm only in defense and in the conquest of my homeland. Menachem Begin explicitly laid out a strategy that's common to all non-state rebels everywhere. The Zionists should attack and humiliate the British through methods of terror and ambush. Force them to respond violently, and then stand back as more Zionists are alienated and they come rushing into the arms of the revisionists. And we would say, sure, the Haganah might be able to protect you as you sit behind your walls in your settlements and wait for the storm to come, but who's going to get your revenge? Not Ben-Gurion, not the Haganah, not the labor Zionists. You need someone who isn't afraid to go out beyond our walls and hit back. You need us. Begin also calculated that forcing the British to overreact would attract worldwide media attention, and that then the, the Zionists would be able to work their magic on that front to bring international pressure to bear on the British to get the hell out. In the meantime, they were not going to wait for the Arabs to attack. No, no, no. They were going to go out and they were going to attack the Arabs. They would attack them in their homes and in their markets. They would attack the British in their barracks and on the roads. And those outside the country would pour all of their energies into overwhelming British immigration checks and infrastructure in Palestine, smuggling in as many Jewish fighters as they possibly could. Begin was one of those revisionists who were still out of the country organizing immigration efforts and training people. And he began working with other revisionist leaders around the continent, as well as with the Polish government, which is actually a very interesting story. They were very happy to see their Jews off somewhere out of their own country, and so they were actually facilitating illegal immigration into Palestine, helping the revisionists do it. And so the Irgun renounces Ben Gurion's policy of restraint and begins to attack Arab civilians. Their goal was not just to retaliate, but to instill such fear in the Arab population that they would just wish for peace and quiet. The Irgun and other revisionists began a campaign of terror against the Arabs, executing dozens of attacks against civilian targets after the Peel Commission had failed. Irgun gunmen fired into the windows of houses and into crowds on the streets. They threw hand grenades and, and, and firebombs into windows. Improvised explosives and hand grenades were thrown into markets and buses. In just a few weeks, in July 1938, the Irgun murdered dozens of Arab civilians. On July 5th alone, seven Arabs were killed in a coordinated attack by gunmen in Tel Aviv. Three more were killed by a bomb planted on a bus in Jerusalem, and another Arab was ambushed and beaten to death. The very next day, an Irgun bomb placed in Haifa in a, in a produce market killed 18 Jews and five Arabs and wounded another 60, mostly shopping women and children. On July 8th, Four more Arabs were killed in a Jerusalem bombing. July 16th, the bomb was thrown into another Jerusalem marketplace, killing 10. July 25th, a massive bomb was planted in the Haifa market, a big landmine. 43 more Arabs were killed. Ben-Gurion and the labor Zionists had long used the revisionists kind of as their pit bulls where they could kind of stand back and denounce their violence, but then call on them when they needed somebody to get dirty. But now the pit bulls were off the leash. In 
Jabotinsky's still back in Poland trying to organize defense units to protect Jews from the multiplying pogroms and persecutions that are taking place in Eastern Europe. You know, he's saying, he's screaming at the top of his lungs that the Jews in Europe are living on the edge of a volcano. And he's screaming to the Zionist leadership in Palestine, there's no more time. we got to do something now. Something is happening in Europe and you're not here, but it's different. It's not like the other times. We've got to get everyone the fuck out of here. In March 1938, Hitler had annexed Austria. And Austrian Jews came under attack by their former neighbors the next day. Pogroms were raging in Poland and Romania and most of the rest of Eastern Europe. And so at the urging of the United States... A conference was held in France to discuss possible options regarding what to do with Jewish people who wanted to flee. Remember, all the Western countries after the First World War, for the most part, had shut down their immigration. Even the United States locked it down in 1924. So all this has been going on, and the Jews have nowhere to go. Okay, The, the British are limiting the number of people who can come into Palestine, and they've got nowhere to go. And so, this conference, called the Evian Conference, held in 1938, led by the United States and Great Britain and and France and a lot of these other countries are going to get together, 30-something countries, and decide what to do with these Jews. How are we going to, look, if we all get together, you take a few, we take a few, we can get the Jews of Germany out of here. There's not that many of them. It's only a few hundred thousand. And so, Hitler hears about it. He sends word to the conference that... If these other nations wanted to take his Jews off his hands, he was fine with that. He would even help facilitate their immigration. He said, quote, I can only hope and expect that the other world, which has such deep sympathy for these criminals, will at least be generous enough to convert this sympathy into practical aid. We, on our part, are ready to put all these criminals at the disposal of these countries, for all I care, even on luxury ships, end quote but not Britain, not the United States, not anybody was willing to expand their meager quota for Jewish refugees. The association of the Jews with communism was not confined to the fevered mind of Adolf Hitler, and the U.S. and Britain were wary of letting radical Jewish revolutionaries slip in among the refugees. And so, relieved of any pressure from the two great powers, none of the other nations was willing to help either. And Hitler just... He mocked the pretensions of these participating nations. He said, he mocked them for, quote, oozing sympathy for the poor, tormented people, but remaining hard and obdurate when it comes to helping them, end quote. You know, he's saying, oh, sure, yeah, yeah, you're so appalled by what I'm doing, but you obviously don't want these people either. In September 1938, the European powers signed the Munich Agreement allowing Germany to annex the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia, and anti-Jewish legislation immediately went into effect there. Nazi authorities began to expel foreign Jews, so French Jews and British Jews, American Jews, often rounding them up in the middle of the night and shipping them out without warning. In late October, over 12,000 Polish Jews were rounded up and deported in a single night, and when they arrived in train cars at the Polish border... These are Polish Jews. They they live in Poland. Polish border guards refused to take them, forced them to march back to the German border. And of course, the Germans don't want them, and they were sent back and forth for days. And finally, you have thousands of homeless Jews living in this nameless no-man's land between the German and Polish border control stations in a makeshift refugee camp. They weren't in Germany. They weren't in Poland. Neither country wanted them, and no other country would take them. There were thousands of people here, but this is the situation now for all Jews in Nazi Europe. After a relative of one of the Polish Jewish refugees, in revenge, shot a German diplomat at the French embassy, Nazi officials used that opportunity to officially strip Jews in Germany of their remaining rights and organized a nationwide pogrom against them. On November 9, 1938, at the urging of the Nazi government, riots erupted throughout Germany. Homes were ransacked and looted. 
Over 7,000 Jewish shops and businesses were vandalized, and virtually every synagogue in Germany was damaged or destroyed. Same story in Austria. Jewish cemeteries were vandalized, gravestones were kicked over and broken, and, and even graves were dug up so that the bodies could be desecrated. Everywhere in Germany, Jewish neighborhoods were covered with graffiti saying, Get out, Jews, or Jews are bloodsuckers. And scrawled on the walls of many Jewish buildings was, Go to Palestine, Jews. Dozens were killed in two days of brutal violence. Tens of thousands of German and Austrian Jews were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Many of them never came back out. November 9th, 1938 is remembered today as Kristallnacht, the crystal night or the night of the broken glass for the streets that were covered in glass when the Jews finally ventured out into the streets to assess the damage. Now a large portion of the German public didn't like this. They, they were outraged by the violence, especially in the bigger cities. Kristallnacht was a first major test of how the German people would react to this kind of violence. And Hitler's government discovered that many were not prepared to accept this. Many SS and SA units openly defied their orders and refused to participate. And, and many Nazis, Nazi party members, helped hide or defend Jews during the pogrom. The U.S. ambassador to Germany actually reported back to Washington, quote, In view of this being a totalitarian state, a surprising characteristic of the situation here is the intensity and scope among German citizens of condemnation of the recent happenings against Jews, end quote. And again, this is in Berlin and some of, the, some of the bigger cities. The Nazis had overstepped their bounds. They moved too quickly. And so Hitler told his lieutenants that a permanent solution to this problem was necessary. In a meeting with other members of the Nazi leadership on November 12th, one of Hitler's men, Hermann Göring, informed the rest, quote, I have received a letter written on the Fuhrer's orders requesting that the Jewish question be now, once and for all, coordinated and solved one way or another. I should not want to leave any doubt, gentlemen, as to the aim of today's meeting. We have not come together merely to talk again, but to make decisions. And I implore competent agencies to take all measures for the elimination of of the Jew from the German economy and to submit them to me, end quote. Now, many Palestinian leaders, they, they, it, it, they, it's not that they were insensitive to the plight of the Jews in Germany, but given that much larger and richer countries, even the countries who were, the country who was imposing this on them had refused to take in a single refugee at the Evian conference, they rejected the idea that this should just be their problem alone to deal with. George Antonius, the Palestinian Arab historian we quoted earlier, he wrote in 1938, quote, The treatment meted out to Jews in Germany and other European countries is a disgrace to its authors and to modern civilization. But posterity will not exonerate any country that fails to bear its proper share of the sacrifices needed to alleviate Jewish suffering and distress. To place the brunt of the burden upon Arab Palestine is a miserable evasion of the duty that lies upon the whole of the civilized world. It is also morally outrageous. No code of morals can justify the persecution of one people in an attempt to relieve the persecution of another. The cure for the eviction of Jews from Germany is not to be sought in the eviction of Arabs from their homeland. And the relief of Jewish distress may not be accomplished at the cost of inflicting a corresponding distress upon an innocent and peaceful population. End quote. Following on Antonius' comments are these remarks by John Bagot Glubb, a British commander of the Transjordanian Armed Forces in 1939. Quote, the Jewish tragedy owed its origin to the Christian nations of Europe and America. At last, the conscience of Christendom was awake. The age-long Jewish tragedy must cease. But when it came to the payment of compensation and expiation of their past shortcomings, the Christian nations of Europe and America decided that the bill should be paid by a Muslim nation in Asia. End quote. The desperate Jewish refugees who were now flowing into Palestine from Germany, they often lacked any conviction regarding the Zionist project. They were fleeing to Palestine because there was nowhere else to go. 
They had had opportunities to become Zionists and move here before 1933 and, and even earlier before the persecutions ramped up, and they hadn't done it. They were coming in now because they had no other options, but when they arrived and found themselves dropped in the middle of a, of a battle in progress, they were forced into alliance and affiliation with the most hardened Zionist groups. You know, they say when you go to prison in the United States, you're, you, you're forced to link up with a gang, whether you sympathize with what they're doing or not, because... You can't survive on your own. And this is kind of like that. And it was becoming increasingly like that on the Arab side as well. The savagery of the Ergun and some of the other Jewish terrorist groups that were, that were ramping up it was being matched by the Arab militias. And both sides, more and more people, are being drawn to the extremists. The High Commissioner, Arthur Wachope, is still attempting to de-escalate the situation politically. London ordered Wachope to institute martial law in the country, but he refused to do it. He said it was unnecessary and it would just make the situation worse. So he's, he's trying not to escalate this. But Wachope didn't realize that the British government was no longer interested in whether the situation got worse. They wanted it over. And so Wachope was replaced with somebody who was a bit more passive as a high commissioner, who was going to let the generals run things. And Palestine was placed under the control of generals who specialized in counterinsurgency and colonial pacification. Since the mandate had begun, the British and the Zionists had worked with one goal in mind. Do anything you can to prevent the Arabs of Palestine from coming together and uniting. They worked to keep the leadership at each other's throats, and that wasn't hard. The leadership made that pretty simple. They funded Islamic fundamentalist groups to marginalize the Arab Christians and the secular nationalists. They used carrots and sticks at the right times and humiliated the local elite sometimes and, and, and flattered them at other times to undermine their credibility. The goal, as always, had been to slide into the spaces between the disparate identities in this colonized society, co-opt the various subgroups, deflect the animosity from coming towards you, and play them off against each other. It was all right for the people to feel paranoid, to feel rage, and to fear that they were surrounded by enemies. Everything was all right as long as they didn't wake up and realize that there was just one real enemy. You know, this is how a tiny island had ruled nearly a quarter of the world's landmass as a colonial empire. The British refined this divide and rule strategy over the years, and it worked brilliantly. But inevitably, there came a time when the strategy ran its course. And for those times, the British Empire always had a plan B. Even when you've done everything possible to undermine the attempts of a local population to unite under a common identity, when you've diverted their attention and exploited the rifts and funded opposition parties and employed collaborators and outlawed national institutions, even when you've done all these things, there comes a time when the awakening of the local population can no longer be avoided. Some powerful leader captures their imagination or one clumsy colonial governor presses too hard or an executed criminal becomes a martyr and a symbol for the people to rally around. You do everything you can to avoid it. You put it off as long as you can. But when the jig is up, and finally the people recognize themselves and rise against you, you do not hesitate. You crush them. You either crush them, or you pack your shit and go home. Any response on your part is going to further galvanize the new identity. So if you're going to do anything at all, you do it all the way. Now for a time, the British had actually lost control of the northwestern hills and some of the other areas of Palestine, and up to 25,000 troops and four Royal Air Force bomber squadrons were brought in to put down the rebellion. This was the largest concentration of troops that the British had anywhere in the world at this point, and this right on the eve of World War II. They were taking this very seriously. It's always a little bit strange to me when you're about to do something completely awful and yet because you're such sticklers for procedure and decorum, you find it necessary to legally justify what you're about to do. Now, although there were international agreements pertaining to treatment of the enemy, the British placed the Arabs outside the purview of those agreements by classifying their resistance as an internal insurrection. 
An internal insurrection is not an international concern, but a matter for internal British law. And so that logical leap having been taken, the next leap was as simple as using British law to declare an emergency situation and enact several martial law type statutes that would give the military authorities the power to basically do whatever they wanted. According to the law, quote, the existence of an armed insurrection would justify the use of any degree of force necessary to effectively meet and cope with the insurrection, end quote. That's pretty open-ended. He went on to say that collective punishments and reprisals that would, quote, inflict suffering on innocent individuals were indispensable as a last resort, end quote. That's what the law said. But as, as in too many counterinsurgency campaigns throughout history, it wasn't long before the last resort became the first resort. Now, collective punishment may not be moral, but it's a natural strategy and an effective one in counterinsurgency. Often, a contumacious opponent who might risk his own safety to resist you is more sensitive about bringing pain upon others. Lacking the flexibility or local intelligence to track the small Arab cells through the hills and countryside, terror and intimidation against the remaining civilian population continue to be a primary strategy for flushing out the insurgents. The ultimate goal of, of, of any occupier is to deprive the insurgent of the popular support that allows them to resupply and hide and move. It's another way of burning down the forest, destroying the habitat. There are two approaches to achieve this goal. You either win hearts and minds by building schools and giving jobs, whatever it is, or you convince the population that they should fear you more than they fear or sympathize with the insurgents. If insurgents attack a British convoy and the British respond not by chasing the attackers up into the hills, but by making a left turn to level the nearest village, how many times does this have to happen before the villages that are left standing start to give up the insurgents? How long does it take before the villagers actually begin to blame the insurgents as much as they blame the British? This is the real goal of an occupying force. When a captive population begins to blame the elements of internal resistance for bringing the occupier's wrath down upon them. You see it in the modern day conflict between Israel and Palestine. When the Israeli military levels whole neighborhoods after Hamas fires off a few Qassam II rockets into the southern desert, hardline Israeli asks, why are you making us hurt you? And there are significant elements on the Palestinian side who look at the militants their own militants, as the real cause of their suffering. When that's the way you're thinking, that is what defeat looks like. Now, heading into 1939, the British haven't reduced Palestine to defeat just yet, but they're working on it. Psychological dominance and initiative are the keys to gaining compliance from a population that outnumbers your soldiers. In the German concentration camps, Prisoners would often be forced to do things that were designed less to break the body than to break the will. They would be required to perform pointless, repetitive tasks, like digging a hole all day only to be told to fill it up in the evening. And they would be forced to do this over and over. And the camps had a thousand meaningless little rules, like being mustered each morning so that their uniforms could be inspected for good order or missing, missing pieces. You know, this isn't a Nazi concentration camp that this is happening. And violation of these rules was unavoidable over time because it's not like the prisoners are being allowed to take care of themselves. And so each violation would result in individual or collective punishments. Now, the Nazis didn't care whether their prisoners' uniforms were missing buttons. Even if the rules were followed, punishments would often come randomly. The point was to establish your dominance, to slowly but surely force the prisoner to dehumanize himself and recognize the utter futility of resistance. And if somebody did resist, you wanted the prisoner to hate that person for bringing you down on him. And so when there were reports of rebel activities in a region of Palestine, the British would very rarely waste their time chasing the militants up into the hills. Instead, as one British soldier reported, they would take a turn to a nearby village, whatever was closest, to, quote, knock the place about, and it's very alien to a chap like you or me to go in and break the chair and kick cupboards in, what with all the oil in it, 
and then to mix the oil in with the bedclothes and break all the windows and everything, you don't feel like doing it. And I remember the adjutant coming in and saying, You are not doing your stuff. They're perfectly intact, all those houses you've just searched. This is what you've got to do. And then he picked up a helve and sort of burst everything. I said, right, okay. So I got a hold of the other soldiers and said, this is what you got to do. And I don't think they liked it much, but once they'd started on it, you couldn't stop them. You've never seen such devastation, end quote. Often, houses would be chosen at random for demolition. Sometimes they were blown up, with villagers often made to set the explosives to destroy their own homes. Other times they were forced to tear down their own homes manually, board by board, brick by brick. Any villagers who resisted or tried to escape were shot or beaten. When the destruction was complete, the British would present the village with a bill, charging them for the soldiers' time and equipment. And even they would even charge them for the explosives used to destroy their own homes. Now, the British don't need the money. It's not about that. It's about power. It's about dominance. Of course, the villagers couldn't pay the bill, and their homes and goods had all been destroyed right down to their last change of clothes. And the majority of their livestock and crops had been carried off. So when they couldn't pay, they were often thrown into prison, or else the villagers were pressed into forced labor to pay off their quote-unquote debt. Rahib al-Nashashibi, long accused of collaborating with the British and the Zionists, he pledged his family to their cause when the British turned up the heat, wanted nothing to do with what was going on in Palestine. He had allied himself, as I mentioned before, with King Abdullah of Transjordan, who supported the partition because he wanted to annex the West Bank of the Jordan River. Nashashibi reached out to the Jewish agency, offering his services and promising to agree to whatever they proposed. And they worked with the British and the Zionists to inform on the Arab militias. The Grand Mufti, Haj Amin al-Husseini, he was still a dominant voice in Palestine despite being in Lebanon. He denounced the Nashashibis and the Hashemite regime in Transjordan as traitors. Very often, when the British had selected a village to receive the treatment, once the place had been smashed up and the people separated out into wire cages, the men would be marched in front of an informant an Arab informant of the Nashashibis who would be hidden under a hood or behind a screen so that the informant could indicate who should be imprisoned and who should be executed. Sometimes the British took the strategy of making the Palestinians do their dirty work very literally. Historian Matthew Hughes, in a paper on British counterinsurgency tactics during the Palestinian uprising, mentions a creative, I guess a creative mind countermeasure system that the British employed. And before I read this quote, um, for any other Britannically challenged Americans out there, when he refers to the bonnet of a lorry, he's talking about the top of a vehicle. He writes, quote, It was common British army practice to make the local Arabs ride with military convoys to prevent mine attacks. Often soldiers carried them or tied them to the bonnets of lorries or put the hostages on small flatbeds on the front of our trains, all to pre prevent mining attacks. The naughty boys who we had in the cages in these camps were put in vehicles in front of the convoy for the deterrent effect, as one British officer put it. The army told the Arabs that they would shoot any of them who tried to run away. On the lorries, some soldiers would break hard at the end of a journey and then casually drive over the Arab who had tumbled from the bonnet, killing or maiming him. As Arthur Lane, a Manchester regiment private, candidly recalled, and now he's quoting Lane, Sometimes when you finished your duty... You would come away and nothing had happened, no bombs or anything, and the driver would switch his wheel back to make the truck waver, and the poor wog on the front would roll off onto the deck. Well, if he's lucky, he'd get away with a broken leg, but if he was unlucky, the truck up behind would hit him. But nobody bothered to pick up the bits where they were left. You know, we were there. We were the masters. We were the bosses. And whatever we did was right. Well, you know, you don't want him anymore. He's fulfilled his job. And that's when Bill Usher, the commanding officer, said that it had to stop because before long they'd be running out of bloody rebels to sit on the bonnet, end quote. There were several instances when, after a British officer or soldier was injured or killed by a mine, British soldiers would load up Arab prisoners or villagers onto buses and force them to drive over landmines themselves. Anybody that survived, they would just leave to bleed out on the road. And while the 
casual tone of Private Lane's description of events is chilling, it's important to note that not all British observers or soldiers were as lacking in ambivalence over what was going on. There were many, many people in the British military and the civilian command structures who were not comfortable with everything, and the majority were not involved in some of the worst stuff. Several objected until they were fired or transferred, and many resigned in protest. One British policeman wrote, quote, What I dislike about this war is that, more often than not, it is the innocent who suffer. Our hospitals here are filled with women and children maimed and blinded for life. Life for the police is now all work and no play. Even at the best times, Palestine is as dull as ditch water. But what with the curfews and people walking about with fear of death in them, it's like living in a cemetery, end quote. But many of the British soldiers and policemen in Palestine during the latter half of the Arab Rebellion, they saw things very clearly. Many of the senior officers were veterans of the infamous black and tan units from the Irish Rebellion during the First World War, and they openly compared the two situations. In another part of his interview, Private Lane tells us what happened when several Arabs were taken prisoner after a fight in which several British soldiers had been wounded. The prisoners were taken back to camp and tied to posts. Quote, They were in a state, and they were really knocked about. Whoever had done it when they got them on the wagons to bring them to camp, the lads had beaten them up, set about them. And then the interviewer asks what the prisoners had been beaten with. Anything. Anything they could find. Rifle butts, bayonets, bayonet scabbards, fists, boots, whatever. There was one poor sod there. He was, I imagine, my age, actually. And I'd heard people say in the past that you could take your eye out and have it cleaned up and put back. I always believed it, but it's not so, because this lad's eye was hanging out on his lip, on his cheek. The whole eye had been knocked out, and it was hanging down, and there was blood dripping from his face. And asked why the soldiers had done this, Lane replied simply, Same as any soldier. I don't care whether he's English, German, Japanese, or what. Lane's giving this interview a little bit later after having experienced the other side as a Japanese POW during the Second World War, so he's been on the other end of this. He continues, quote, But it's even today. There's a beast in every man. I don't care who he is. You can say the biggest queen or queer that you come across, but there's a beast in him somewhere. And in a situation like that, it comes out. End quote. You take men like Private Lane and send them around the world with orders to snuff out and put down a rebellion by people who, by and large, have the support of the local population, you get what you get. Every country that ever thinks about invading another country needs to keep that in mind. Because somehow, we always pretend to be shocked, whether we're talking about the Philippine insurrection after the Spanish-American War, all the way up through Vietnam and Abu Ghraib. When when counterinsurgencies veer off into Mad Max territory, we always act shocked. Soldiers who lose friends to booby traps and sneak attacks inevitably end up hating the enemy more than they would a uniformed opponent on the other side of a battlefield. Paranoia sets in, and soldiers start to wonder if the villager eyeing you as you move through his village was the one who set the landmine that killed your buddy the night before, or if the woman smiling at you from her fruit stand will inform on your movements as soon as you pass through. I don't think I'm aware of a single asymmetric guerrilla war that didn't run off the rails. You just have to look at the conduct of the American Civil War between the Union and the Confederate armies in Virginia compared to how it was fought by the guerrillas out in Missouri. The civilian population inevitably suffers terribly in this kind of fighting. Those who refuse to support the insurgents are often seen as collaborators and treated accordingly. Those who do help the insurgents are treated by the conventional force as rebels and treated accordingly. The conventional force, through a combination of sticks and carrots, tries to convince the civilian populations that their lives would be a lot simpler if they just sided with the ruling power rather than with the insurgents. One part of that is hearts and minds, right? Providing bribes and other inducements to people who are willing to work with you. And the other part is making sure that they're more afraid of you than they are the rebels. Arthur Lane describes an incident when a group of Arabs were about to be released from a British concentration camp, having been interrogated and found to be uninvolved in the fighting. 
these Arab prisoners, these uninvolved Arab prisoners, were taken to the gate where they were supposed to be released, and then they were lined up. Outside the gate were two big paddy wagons, open at the back, onto which the prisoners were supposed to load up for transport back to their villages. Lane describes what happened, quote, The soldiers took them around back, and any lads who were doing nothing at the time, we all gathered round and stood and two, formed two lines of men facing each other, with pickaxes, pickaxe helves, some with bayonets, scabbards, you know, with the bayonets inside, some with rifles, whatever was there, tent mallets, tent pegs. And the rebels were sent one at a time through this, what do you call it? Gauntlet. And they were belted and bashed until they got to the other end. Now any that could run, when they got to the other end, went straight to the police meat wagon, and they were sent to Acre. Any that died, well, they went into the other meat wagon, and they were dumped at one of the villages on the outside. End quote. Those were innocent prisoners. Very often, angry soldiers don't even bother taking prisoners. In a letter to his parents back home, British policeman Sidney Burr wrote, quote, At one time, the Ulster and West Kent units caught about 60 of them in a valley, and as they walked out with their arms up, mowed them down with machine guns. I inspected them afterwards, and most of them were boys between 16 and 20. No news, of course, is given to the newspapers, so what you read in the papers is just to en enough to allay public uneasiness in England, end quote. Euphemistically named... Arab investigation centers were set up all around the country. These were facilities set up for what we today euphemistically call enhanced interrogation, although, again, it was often just about terror and establishing psychological dominance. It was about those things more than it was about gaining any useful information. Many British military and civilian officials complain that the torture centers were useless for interrogation, and that they were counterproductive overall. The majority of the brutality came during the village operations and street patrols committed by British soldiers in a not necessarily sanctioned, but not necessarily discouraged kind of way. But terror and torture was also official policy, sanctioned by certain circumstances by the British colonial office. Historian Matthew Hughes describes another incident again after a landmine inflicted casualties on a British unit. Impossible to know who had planted the mine, British soldiers made their way to the nearest village. Quote, on the morning of 7 September, soldiers came up to El Basa. They shot four people in the streets, in cafes, and in the homes of the village, after which the soldiers searched and looted the village, before gathering and beating the inhabitants with sticks and rifle butts. The British then took 100 villagers to a nearby military base, Camp No. 1, where the British commander selected four men, who were tortured in front of the rest of the group. The four men were undressed and made to kneel barefoot on cacti and thorns, specially prepared for the occasion. Eight soldiers then told off the four men, and two per Arab detainee set about beating them without pity in front of the group. Pieces of flesh flew from their bodies, and the victims fainted, after which an army doctor came and checked their pulses. The army then took the group of villagers to another base, Camp No. 2, while soldiers destroyed the village of Albasa. There are many accounts of Arabs being beaten into paralysis or death, of being left in cages in the sun without food or water to die of dehydration or, or at exposure of prisoners being beaten with chains and wet ropes, of men being held down so that their teeth could be smashed out with hammers, of prisoners having their feet dipped in boiling oil. Arab complaints to the British authorities were dismissed out of hand, but the list of complaints that they filed include countless beatings, claims of prisoners having needles used on them, although I haven't been able to find anything that tells me exactly what that means. I'm not sure I want to know. Prisoners were thrown to dogs. Dobermans were actually imported from South Africa for use in Palestine. And to remind us again of the psychological aspect to all of this, there are accounts of Arabs being forced to hold heavy stones and being beaten if they dropped them. You want to get the people to blame themselves for what you're doing to them. Guards would use bayonets to enforce sleep deprivation. And there are accounts of prisoners having bells tied around their necks and forced to dance. And now if in your mind you're seeing images of the American guards at Abu Ghraib putting leashes and dog collars on Iraqi prisoners and forcing them to crawl around, you're probably onto something. 
And don't think that the people in Iraq did not remember what the British did when they heard about Abu Ghraib. It's all disconnected to us. It's not to them. The Anglican Church actually had a mission in Palestine, and they were a constant thorn in the side of the British Army and the police during this insurgency. They filed various petitions, and in them they spoke of prisoners jumping to their deaths from high windows to avoid further torture. The Anglican Church wrote about testicles being tied off with cords until they came off, beatings being delivered with boards which had nails protruding, wire being tied and tightened around the toes, hair being torn from faces and beards, fingernails and toenails being torn out using special instruments, brands and hot skewers being used on prisoners, boiling oil being poured over them, electric shocks, water being forced by funnel into prisoners' stomachs, and various types of sodomy. A British doctor, Elliot Forster, was assigned to Palestine, and he was horrified at what he was witnessing. He wrote in his diary, quote, the British could probably teach Hitler something he didn't know about running concentration camps, end quote. Arabs who were loyal to or paid by the Nashashibis were sent out into the towns and countryside to identify and report on possible militants. Nashashibi peace bands, as they were called by the people employing them, were partially funded by the Jewish agency. Remember, the leadership of the Palestinians is gone. The entire leadership class has been picked up and exiled. These are the peasants. These are, these are young, destitute peasants who are facing the full wrath of the British Empire, the Jewish agency, and even certain families of their own people who were funded by the Jordanian government. The primary purpose of the Nashashibi peace bands was to target and eliminate other Arabs hostile to the Nashashibi clan, especially those who were loyal to the Grand Mufti, Haj Amin. And the Grand Mufti seems almost to have gone mad by this point, witnessing all this from exile. He declared the Nashashibis and anyone who collaborated with the British or the Zionists enemies of Islam, and he called for holy war against the British and the Jews. But day by day, the British, the Zionists, and the Nashashibi collaborators were sapping the remaining ability of the Palestinian Arabs to resist. Although the Zionist Irgun and other militias were blowing up markets and buses in Arab neighborhoods, the majority of the Zionists in Palestine were still under Ben-Gurion's control and obeyed his command to be patient, to sit back and let the British do their work without complicating things. And his patience was rewarded. In 1938, a British intelligence officer, Ord Wingate, prevailed upon the military leadership to let him set up joint British-Jewish special operations units to hit the Palestinians where they lived. Unlike many of the other counterinsurgency experts Britain had imported to handle the Palestinian uprising, Wingate considered the assignment to be much more than a job. He was a Christian with a fanatical devotion to Zionism. He considered it a religious duty to empower the Jews to take control of Palestine, destroy their enemies. He, he would often make explicit references to biblical legends of the Hebrew conquests, of their ethnic cleansings and genocides when speaking of his own mission. Wingate was distrusted by many in the British administration. General Bernard Montgomery, who was in Palestine fighting the insurgency, called him mentally unbalanced. He was a member of a devout, some would say radical, Christian sect which interpreted the prophecies of the Book of Revelation to mean that the reconquest of the Holy Land by the Jews would inaugurate the end of the world. The enemies of God were anybody who tried to stand in the Jews' way, and he saw himself as leading an apocalyptic Jewish army toward the final Armageddon. Even many Zionists thought he was a bit too much of a wild card, but some others saw an opportunity to finally get the British to authorize, officially authorize, training and arming Jewish military units. The Haganah at this time was, again, still officially a banned organization, and the importation of weapons and military equipment was still officially forbidden, although the British had largely looked the other way ever since the Arab revolt started. Wingate communicated regularly with Chaim Weizmann, 
and with David Ben-Gurion and other Zionist leaders as the revolt went on, and he served as one of their men on the ground in Palestine. He considered himself a part of the Zionist movement, more a part of the Zionist movement than a part of the British military. Moshe Shertok, whom we quoted in an earlier episode, one of Ben-Gurion's right-hand men, described him as, quote, a man devoured by a kind of inner fire, addicted to a single idea that had captured his imagination, end quote. Wingate's special night squads, as they were called, pulled most of its British soldiers from the Royal Ulster and Royal West Kent regiments, the same units Private Lane was talking about gunning down 60 people a moment ago. The Jewish soldiers in the units were drawn from the Haganah, and most of these would go on to become the leadership of the Zionist and later Israeli military forces. The Zionist leadership considered the special night squads to be an extension of the Haganah, calling it Plutog Hayesh, unit of fire, and the Jewish agency fronted the majority of the costs for the special night squads. So these are officially British military units, but they're operating basically on orders from Ben-Gurion, and they're being funded by the Jewish agency. The agency supplemented the soldiers' salaries, they funded a training course for them, they gave bonuses to the company commanders when they did certain things. It paid for provisions, vehicles, and horses. It constructed barracks and stables. The Jewish agency is doing all this. And they spoke freely of the units as being in their service. The special night squads were organized into 10-man teams and given zones of responsibility and an absolutely free hand to suppress and deter hostile activities. The teams used Arab collaborators in long-distance patrols to launch surprise attacks on suspected insurgents. Subunits would surprise Arab villages in the night, paying what the team would call friendly visits to impress upon them the idea that aiding the insurgents would be a bad idea. Even in the context of the ongoing nightmare in Palestine at this time, the special night squads got a reputation for such outrageous cruelty. Remember everything I just listed off that the British were doing. Well, the British finally decided to pull Wingate from his position and send him back to Britain and his British passport was stamped to indicate that he was forbidden from ever entering Palestine again. Okay, boiling oil, pulling out toenails, smashing out teeth, all those things, and Wingate and these special night squads are too much for the British. In the meantime, the situation in Europe is going critical. Jabotinsky looks around and believes that he sees clearly what is happening, and he's in Poland screaming, that the Zionists have got to find a way to get millions of Jews to Palestine right now. Menachem Begin's busy cooperating with the Polish government, trying to organize thousands of Beitar fighters to come ashore in Palestine en masse. He's got a plan to take over British government buildings, take British officials hostage, officially declare a Jewish state in Palestine. In early 1939, Jabotinsky wrote from Poland, quote, The catastrophe is coming closer. My hair has turned white and I have aged in these three years because my heart is bleeding. For you, my dear brothers and sisters, do not see the volcano that will soon begin to spit out the fire of destruction. And he also said, quote, To be frank, I fear that the time is already past 11 o'clock. Perhaps 12 o'clock is already run. That means midnight. That means the end. However, It is best that we shake off this fear. Let it be only eleven. This is, therefore, the last hour. As the summer of 1939 approached, the Arab revolt in Palestine had begun to fizzle out. The Arabs were starving and destitute as the fighting had ruined all of their farms, all of their herds, and they were out of supplies. The British... And the Zionists had no such problems, and the Nashashibis used money and food from the Jewish agency to buy off more and more Arab villagers who had no other way to feed their families. But with the help of German and Italian propaganda services, who wanted to make the British look bad, reports of the British army's brutality were leaking out into the rest of the Arab world and causing outrage. With the possibility of war seeming more and more likely, Britain could not afford to lose its allies in the Middle East and India. The British needed to wrap this up, and they needed to wrap it up right now. The British convened a conference to hold settlement talks, and to the Zionist horror, 
The British invited officials from Iraq and Syria and Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Yemen, and some other Arab countries to participate and give their opinions. The British did bar from participation any Palestinian Arab who had participated in or fought in the revolt, so effectively everyone basically eliminated the voice of the entire Palestinian resistance in the hope that maybe the Zionist leaders would be able to talk to these other Arab leaders who weren't involved with the fighting. The British told the Zionists, this is the last opportunity to come to an agreement with the Arabs. If it doesn't work, the British would arbitrate the situation however we see fit. Well, they failed. The Arab delegation made several overtures, several revisions, but every one of them involved an end to any further Zionist immigration and the establishment of a national government with an elected representative legislative body. David Ben-Gurion, speaking for the Zionists, refused to accept any plan involving independence or a representative government until the Jews had displaced enough Arabs to become a majority. The British negotiators eventually became frustrated with the Zionists' all-or-nothing refusal to participate in any arrangement that gave them anything less than full control. The clock was ticking. The British needed to end this. As the cabinet met to decide what to do, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain famously or infamously, depending on your perspective, said, quote, We are now compelled to consider the Palestine situation primarily from the standpoint of the international situation. If we must offend one side, let us offend the Jews rather than the Arabs, end quote. And so the Zionists are starting to figure out that their spell over the British is finally breaking. The Zionist militias increase their terror operations against Arab civilians in an effort to derail the negotiations. On February 27th, after Palestinian Arabs in several cities held rallies celebrating rumors that the British were going to give Palestine its independence, similar in form to the independence granted to the Iraqis, Jewish terrorists launched a coordinated bombing campaign, killing 38 civilians and wounding 44. Well, this didn't provoke the response that they had hoped. And in May 1939, the British issued a white paper announcing their intention to finally set up a national government in Palestine and to end the mandate. Since the Balfour Declaration had been issued, Chaim Weizmann had tried to hide the final goals of the Zionists from the majority of the British government. 22 years after the Balfour Declaration was published, the impatient and belligerent Zionists who were in Palestine had finally made it impossible to keep up appearances any longer. And the white paper started out by addressing the misunderstanding, or maybe the deception directly. Quote, this is the white paper. It has been urged that the expression, a national home for the Jewish people, offered a prospect that Palestine might in due course become a Jewish state or commonwealth. His Majesty's government do not wish to contest the view that the Zionist leaders at the time of the issue of the Balfour Declaration recognized that an ultimate Jewish state was not precluded by the terms of the Declaration, but His Majesty's government believed that the framers of the mandate in which the Balfour Declaration was embodied could not have intended that Palestine should be converted into a Jewish state against the will of the Arab population of the country. That Palestine was not to be converted into a Jewish state might be held to be implied in the passage from the command paper of 1922, which reads as follows, and now quoting from the earlier white paper, which had been issued by Winston Churchill in 1922, quote, Unauthorized statements have been made to the effect that the purpose in view is to create a holy Jewish Palestine. Phrases have been used such as that Palestine is to become as Jewish as England is English. His Majesty's government regard any such expectation as impracticable and have no such aim in view nor have they at any time contemplated the disappearance or the subordination of the Arabic population, language, or culture in Palestine. They would draw attention to the fact that the terms of the Balfour Declaration referred to do not contemplate that Palestine as a whole should be converted into a Jewish national home, but only that a national home should be founded in Palestine, end quote. That was the earlier 1922 paper, and now I'm back to the 1939 white paper, quote, but this statement has not removed doubts, and His Majesty's government therefore now declare unequivocally that it is not part of their policy that Palestine should become a Jewish state. 
they would indeed regard it as contrary to their obligations to the Arabs under the mandate, as well as to the assurances which have been given to the Arab people in the past, that the Arab population of Palestine should be made the subjects of a Jewish state against their will. End quote. So this was it. The jig is officially up. Until now, the plan had been to not talk about a Jewish state, just keep bringing in Jews and preparing for a Jewish state. Don't ask about it. Don't even bring it up. Just keep moving forward. And don't give the British an opportunity to say no to anything. The majority of the British government had never supported setting up a Jewish state. But the project moved forward as long as the Palestine question remained a marginal issue handled by a few well-compensated interest parties while the rest of the government was off worrying about Germany or the Soviet Union and other bigger fish. Well, the international situation had finally made the rest of the British government take notice of Palestine because they couldn't lose the rest of the Arab world. And the British were saying no. The white paper stated that the government considered the terms of the Balfour Declaration fulfilled. We did our job. Half a million Jews have immigrated to Palestine under the British supervision, but the British have never offered and never intended to give the whole country over to Jewish rule or to import every single Jewish person on the planet to displace the native Arabs. That was not the agreement. All plans for partition were dropped in the 1939 white paper, and an independent binational state would be established in which both Jews and Arabs would participate in a representative government. Jewish immigration would be restricted to just 15,000 per year for five years and 75,000 more total under special permission. Further transfers of land to the Jewish agency or the Jewish National Fund would be restricted in most of the country. The British administration would now operate with orders to establish an independent Palestine within 10 years, at which point the mandate would officially end. And so, when the Zionists get their hands on the white paper, they go insane. They denounce it as illegal, claiming that it violates the commitments made in the Balfour Declaration, but this goes nowhere. The Balfour Declaration was never a legal document. It was just a letter from one British diplomat expressing the general intentions of the government. Almost any Zionist history you actually read, even today, still describes the decision by the British to create a representative government in ethnic terms, which, given the state of the conflict at the time, I understand, but well, the way historian Martin Gilbert writes it in his history of the state of Israel is typical of the way it's presented. Quote, Majority rule would be instituted after the 1939 white paper. That is to say, the Arab majority would be given legislative powers, end quote. Well, yeah, Marty, that's what democracy is. This is why democracy only works after a shared national identity has been established at every level of society. If groups within the nation do not identify with one another, at least more than they identify with anyone outside the country, then loyal opposition becomes impossible. Instead of politics being a process where you seek a consensus that is legitimate to everybody, even if they happen to disagree, the process is considered legitimate, politics instead becomes a game of just pure majority rule. And since the First World War, the Jews had been welcomed to participate in a representative government, but they had used their influence over the British to block the formation of any government that didn't place them in complete control. But now their time was up. David Ben-Gurion called the 1939 white paper, quote, the greatest betrayal perpetrated by the government of a civilized people in our generation, end quote. And several Zionist leaders began calling for outright war against the British government. A special unit within the Haganah was commissioned to commence sabotage and terrorist attacks against the British. Ben-Gurion's rage was primarily directed at the British, not the Arabs. Regarding the Arabs, Ben-Gurion told a friend, quote, Were I an Arab, I would rise up against an immigration policy likely in the future to hand the country and all its Arab inhabitants over to Jewish rule. What Arab cannot do is mass and understand that immigration at the rate of 60,000 per year means a Jewish state in all of Palestine, end quote. So he's angry at the British for thwarting their plans. He understands where the Arabs are coming from, at least to a degree. 
Now, it's easy almost eight decades later to look back and think that the Zionists are being a little bit ungrateful toward the British. None of this would have been remotely possible if the British had not made it possible. The British had had earned the hatred of a large part of the Arab world to help the Zionists get this project off the ground. Everything the Zionists had, the British had given to them. The British didn't see the white paper as a betrayal at all. The British had always, from the beginning, maintained that they never intended to deliver the whole country to the Zionists. They'd been perfectly clear about it, except perhaps behind the scenes. And now the Zionists were just outraged to learn that they had meant what they had been saying all along. But again, I try to put myself in their position. They are desperate and trapped, and they have nowhere else to go. Okay, remember, I said this a couple times, but the Jews are not going to Palestine as one out of their many options in 1939. All of the major powers have strict limitation on Jewish immigration. The Jews in Europe are literally trapped. They're trapped even though Hitler is offering to pay their way if somebody else will take them, but no one will take them. An escape to Palestine was their only hope to flee the persecution that was intensifying every day. The British might have thought they were clear about their intentions, but the Zionists are looking at them now and saying, wait, 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 now? You're doing this now? When Hitler's thugs are rounding us up like animals for God knows what? You know, I mean, the truth is, if you press me for a, for, to take a position on this, and I, I want to say that I'm not, I'm not big on blame. Um, I began this episode talking about Uday Hussein because I think that all of us and each of our societies is, we're all caught up in a storm from the moment we open our eyes. And every nightmarish thing we do to one another, it makes some kind of sense from inside the head of the person doing it. But but if you press me about it, I I, I have to say that the Arabs have a right to resist the colonization of their country. Okay, Even when the Nazi persecution ramped up, Arabs had a right to defend their homes. But it's much harder for me to forgive my own country and all the other oh-so-enlightened nations of the West who could have, if they wanted to, saved every single Jew in Germany with relatively little trouble to themselves, but who made the decision not to do it. You know, the victor of every war gets to write the history of it, and so rarely do we hear that the Nazis were parroting ideas popular in America and Britain and the rest of Europe. Rarely do we hear that Hitler offered to pay the way of any Jews that our own wonderful, enlightened nations were willing to take on as refugees, but that we refused to take any of them at all. We rarely hear that. We get to pretend that what's about to happen was just this unaccountable historical anomaly came out of nowhere, the result of one crazy guy with a stupid mustache and a good public speaking voice getting his country all whipped up. And we get to pretend that the rest of our nations watched in horror at what was happening, with maybe denial being the worst thing that we did. We, we just didn't see it coming. We were lying to ourselves, but that's the worst we did. And then we get to pretend that we finally swooped in to save the day. You know, what, what bullshit. What bullshit. Germany pulled the trigger, but every nation in Europe painted the bullseye around the Jews. After the 19th and early 20th century pogroms, the Zionists had left Europe in disgust over the way their people had allowed themselves to be dishonored and abused. And they were often chastised by assimilationist Jews, Jews who wanted to assimilate into their countries for stirring things up. But the the Zionists just kept doing their work, confident that the Jewish people would eventually understand what they were doing. At the beginning of the 1930s, Chaim Arlosarov believed that the chances of their project succeeding were looking dim, but after a decade of massive immigration and preparation for war, that was no longer the case. They were ready. The Arab population had been decimated by the British pacification of the rebellion. 
10% of all Arab males in Palestine were dead, wounded, or exiled. 10% of all Arab males in Palestine were dead, wounded, or exiled. And that 10% was not chosen at random. The British had lopped the head off the Arab population, eliminating every person who exhibited any leadership qualities at all or any tendency or ability to resist at all. The Grand Mufti and his supporters were exiled. Any prominent Arab who wasn't willing to be an open collaborator was gone. Anyone who knew how to hold a weapon or give a speech or organize a demonstration was gone. The Zionists, on the other hand, were now well-trained, well-organized, and armed to the teeth. Between 1937 and 1940, Menachem Begin and the rest of the Beitar revisionists in Europe would import 18,000 Zionists, almost all young men trained and ready to fight. After the Arab revolt was over, David Ben-Gurion remarked to a friend that there was now nothing the Arabs could do to interrupt the Zionist plans. All that remained was to get the British to drop the white paper or else drive them out so that the rest of the Jews in Europe could migrate to build their majority in the future Jewish state. But just as the Zionists came into the fullness of their strength, the clock ticked midnight. Three months after the issuance of the white paper, Adolf Hitler moved against Poland, bringing almost three million Jews under his power. Instead of using their new strength to create a majority in Palestine out of Europe's Jews, in six years the Zionists would pick through the rubble and find that there weren't enough European Jews left. The news of Hitler's invasion broke while the 21st Zionist Congress was in session in Geneva. Arthur Rippon was there and he said that the announcement exploded like a bomb over those assembled. In his final words to the Congress, on the last night, the evening of August 24th, 1939, Chaim Weizmann told the delegates, quote, If, as I hope, we are spared in life and our work continues, who knows? Perhaps a new light will shine upon us from the thick black gloom. The remnant shall work on, live on, until the dawn of better days. Towards that dawn I greet you. May we meet again in peace. End quote. With tears in his eyes, weeping, Chaim Weizmann embraced his colleagues on the platform, and as he descended from the dais and made his way through the crowds out of the hall, Every eye was full of tears. Every heart was already full of mourning. And hundreds and hundreds of hands reached out for Dr. Weitzman as he went out into the darkness. <laughs> <laughs>